Pictures later on? Yes. Okay. Can you take a, when we are all seated, straight and um, picture with this? Yeah. I, I would appreciate it. Good morning. Is the mic on? Can I be heard? Um, first of all, thank you for making the effort for the early Saturday morning panel. We know it's not easy. My name is Richard Gisbert. I uh, host a program on Al Jazeera English called The Listening Post. Uh, we cover media uh, in all its forms. Um, we've been doing the program since 2006, so we're 10 years into it now. And um, the Trump story, as uh, a political story goes with a media angle. It doesn't get any better than that. Uh, the um, uh, title of this morning's session is American Journalism in the Trump Era. We have three uh, very interesting and well-placed panelists today to help us through this. I'm going to get each of them to introduce themselves, starting with Cameron on my far left. Good morning. I'm Cameron Barr. I'm managing editor at the Washington Post. Um, been at the Post. Push for the about, button. It's, it's on. Yeah, I've been at the Post for about 13 years. Uh, before that, I was a foreign correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor um, in Jerusalem and Tokyo. Good morning, early birds. Uh, I'm Madalika Sika. Currently, uh, I'm a Media con independent media consultant. Uh, I've had a career across television, radio, and digital first. I was at ABC News television for a long time. Then I was at National Public Radio, and most recently at a digital first millennial focused site, completely different, uh, called Mike. And thanks for being here this early hour. By the way, that's ABC US, not ABC Australia. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Yavuz Baydar. Uh, I entered journalism uh, through public broadcasting in Sweden 40 years ago and uh, via BBC I went more into print and I worked as news ombudsman, public editor for, for 15 years in Turkish domain which was not an easy experience, quite, quite nightmarish actually. 
And um, after the coup, uh, immediately after the coup, I was forced to leave Turkey, and I'm in exile at the moment somewhere in southern Europe. And uh, I am a founding member also of an independent um, watchdog in Turkey, P24 Platform for Independent Journalism. Uh, Yavuz Baydar uh, is an interesting story. Obviously, journalism in Turkey is in a critical state. Uh, and one of the reasons we wanted him on this panel is Turkey has been dealing with uh, a political leader for the last decade and a half uh, who shows some of the same populist uh, demagogic tendencies as we're starting to see come out of Washington these days. So we thought that was a perspective that could be a value for us this morning. I want to start with Cameron, um, because what we have seen uh, in the post-election era in the U.S., has been a re-engagement, a quantifiable one, uh, of Americans with their news media. The New York Times uh, is talking about record-breaking subscription rate increases. We're seeing uh, a lot of that. And I guess, given that so many media organizations, particularly on the television side, Cameron, have been... Um, somewhat contrite about their performances and some of their failings in their coverage of Trump. Is this re-engagement, uh, this revaluing of American journalism, something that American journalists deserve? It's a good, it's a good question, Richard. Um, you know, I think, I, I'm, I'm not sure the frame is exact there. The, the you know, I think people, to some extent, are galvanized by what happened in the campaign because it was unexpected. There were so many surprising outcomes, and people struggled to find explanations for that, for what, why they couldn't really understand what was happening, in, for instance, in Republican politics or in Trump's showings in primaries. And that drove people to the sources of information that would help them understand what was going on. So, you know, on the one hand, it, it, it's true that um, people are re-engaging with media. Organizations like mine are seeing surges in subscriptions. But even more interestingly, from my point of view, uh, just a lot of public acclaim and, 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 and even also private expressions of support and recognition, which is not something we're used to in the American media in recent decades. Um, so... That's positive, and I think it's also true that we failed to really scrutinize what was happening in the American economy and what was happening for working class and lower middle class Americans in the years sort of leading up to the, the political campaign. Uh, I think criticism of that is justifiable. We recognize that. Um, I, I would just challenge you on one point, which is that I actually don't see a lot of contrition um, from certain media organizations, particularly in, in broadcast and cable television. Um, I see some soul-searching that's happened. The New York Times publisher famously wrote something that sounded a lot like contrition. Um, I think he was really also trying to um, uh, promote the idea that the Times uh, would be a valuable resource in the years ahead. So there was a marketing aspect to that that I think was more forward-looking than backward-looking. Um, but uh, so I think it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, I think, uh, do we deserve it? I, 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 I think I would respond by saying we will do our best to deserve it in the future and going forward. Madalika, what do you see there? Because you're ex-mainstream media. You've spent time in new media. Uh, you're now consulting across presumably more than one platform. And you, you also spent time with, was it with NPR? Or NPR. National yeah. Public Radio, which is also under threat. What do you see in the way of re-engagement and whether that's something that uh, American media will carry forward responsibly? Um, well, I think the first thing that we should talk about is the American media. Um, and I think that we tend to sort of lump everybody together. And I think that what this election campaign highlighted was the diversity of the media and the particular powerful roles that particular institutions have. If you only engaged in the campaign by watching cable TV, you would have had a very different perspective of what was happening in the campaign or your knowledge about the candidates 
um, than if you had been reading the New York Times or the Washington Post or ProPublica. So I think that, or a whole host of other uh, organizations. So I think that that's what we have to think about going forward. Um, I think um, it's funny, you know, people talked about television being so of the past, and we now have a president who is the TV president who we know watches a lot of TV. The power of television is going to be even more important than it used to be before. So I think it's going to be an interesting challenge for all across the media. Um, I agree with uh, Cameron, uh, you know, the idea that we should think about, well, how horribly wrong did we, we um, get things? I think there was actually a lot of really good reporting that was happening. I think that, you know, the ability for the media to look at sort of long-term trends like what the economy was doing to a lot of groups of people is really important. And I think the other thing is in a lot of mainstream media, um, there's a tendency to go with what you know and the rules that what, you know, this is how it happened, so it used to happen and this is how it's going to happen. Having been at a new media site uh, that was focused on young people where there was so much coverage of Bernie Sanders and very early on. And sorry, sorry, you said there's so much coverage? So much coverage of Bernie Sanders. On of, CNN? No, no, on uh, new media where I was at Mike. And... That was sort of a revelation to me early on, and they saw something amongst their audience who really were responding to Bernie Sanders, which a lot of other news organizations didn't. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity in the richness of the variety of media that we have. Um, I think that a lot of people think many things have changed for American journalism as a result of the ascendancy of Donald Trump, but I'd like to pull us back to the things that have stayed the same. It's always been our job to hold an administration accountable, um, and that's not going to change for most of us, um, and I think that that's what we hang on to, and I think we should take pride in how much the Trump presidency has galvanized the American public one way or the other, whether it's supporting a subscription for the New York Times or the Washington Post, or for them to understand, oh, we have a judiciary, and they can actually have an influence in what is happening in our country, um, as we've seen with the travel bans. You know, the fact that the arguments against the tr first travel ban were on audio, a crackly phone line that was broadcast live, um, that's pretty remarkable, and that gives me some hope that we're going to get some more civic engagement. Madalika, you, you drew the distinction, uh, which is very difficult to argue with, between print and television, and the, the influence of both. Uh, Yavuz has you know, been covering a story for the last decade and a half in Turkey, and there you have uh, a leader who has demonized the mainstream media, and when it comes to shutting down media, and um, essentially forms of state censorship, uh, he doesn't really care that much about print, uh, does Erdogan. And I'm wondering whether you see a pattern there, a template, that I'm not suggesting that Donald Trump is um, a student of contemporary Turkish politics, <laughs> but we've seen this elsewhere. We've seen it with uh, Sisi in Egypt, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, that Print journalists um, can do as much good work as they can, but when you're up against the power of broadcast media, is this a model for leaders like this going forward? If it is, what do we do about it? Well, uh, certainly the, the main inspirational source is, is uh, Vladimir Putin for most of the names that you mentioned. Um, they do their calculations and copy-paste each other, uh, watching and being raising their awareness about the habits of the of the public. And in in, in the domain of Russia, Turkey, uh, there are very many similarities, as much as in Ukraine or or Egypt, um, where according to UNESCO, the almost the entire population, up to 90%, uh, get their news and opinion uh, only solely from TV um, for free, uh, and uh, this has to do also with the um, rural population, the literacy levels, etc. So uh, when, we, when we look at the pattern of uh, 
uh, assault to the media in general in Turkish story in the past seven, eight years, which has clear, you know, crystallized in, in our, before our eyes, you see the highest priority given to the TV uh, other than um, print or, or social media. Uh, I would say TV, social media, and, and print in that order. And uh, no matter what, um, uh, the, 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 the main uh, target was to silence, the to black out the screens. Uh, and we see it uh, also in the case of Periscope now uh, being uh, targeted in social media, other, other than other social media tools lately, has to do with that as well. The vision uh, is important, and Periscope was important because it was being used in the referendum campaign now intensely by the Kurdish segment of the Turkish society. Uh, they are rather tech-savvy and you know, pretty tough activists as well. So uh, this is the pattern of, of, uh, that, that continued, and uh, you know, in, if you look at the numbers, um, in the private sphere we have about 245, 250 national, local, and regional TV channels privately owned. And uh, this pattern ended up with, as we speak today, with only one TV channel, and that is a partisan TV channel, mainly financed by the main opposition. Very tiny, half of this room, uh, broadcasting somewhere from Istanbul, from an apartment uh, flat. And uh, also, a little surprisingly, uh, Murdoch-owned Fox TV in Turkish is trying to do something under attack, but uh, surviving, uh, limping, but continuing. So out of 250, we have only one and a half uh, TV channels left in that domain. Something I neg neglected to mention, I just like the panelists, don't wait for me to get in between you, jump in on each other's stuff. We're gonna get to questions in the audience soon. So if we could have some hands up now, if anyone has a question, we'll get a microphone to you. We're gonna ask you to wait for a while before you actually ask it, but I'd wanna get the mic in place so we're not waiting and we can maintain some kind of pace here. Cameron, want to get back to you. Was that for us? Yeah. Probably not. It's the pre-applause. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to get to you. Uh, being with The Post, uh, an organization that, that has had such an important place in the American journalistic landscape, uh, if you look at the levels of trust that Americans have in their media today, I think it was Pew Research, I'm not sure, that came up with this figure, but somewhere in the low 30s, so fewer than 35% of Americans say that they trust their media today, which is uh, a free fall from the heady days of 1976 when that number maxed out somewhere in the high 70s, two years after some remarkable journalism occurred in your offices on the Watergate story. Um, you, you have a president who knows this number, and you have uh, you have um, a narrative around fake news. So people who want to do uh, critical journalism of American politics and this administration are up against that. And they know that when they produce a story, however valid, that this administration has got a tendency to dismiss it as fake news. If it was 1950 and you wanted to raise your trust levels your trust score with the American people, it would be difficult. In 2017, with the fake news narrative to fight, in addition to everything else, is it even possible? I think the only thing that's possible is to do the work. Uh, you know, I think we have an obligation to, uh, to report as aggressively as we can. Uh, we see time and again that um, good reporting makes a difference. It has an impact. I mean, I, I spoke yesterday about uh, some of the work we did uh, on General Flynn, that resulted in his resignation, or really his firing. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like in a, this very complex media environment, is it, should we not do the work? I mean, that's not an option, right? So we have to uh, devote ourselves to the task at hand. We see a lot of support from readers, from subscribers, from others. Um, we know that the work makes a difference, so we stay with it. 
Um, you know, that 30% number is lousy. I, I, I would venture to guess that it's going up, uh, that people are putting more trust in their media sources. Uh, I think that one of the things, paradoxically, that's happened as a result of Trump and others referring to news as fake news is that people, readers, are realizing that they need to make their own decisions about what's fake and what's real. Uh, and I think that redounds to the benefit of some established institutions um, who have a record of producing, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, real news. Um, so, and I, and I think that, you know, there's some wide cognizance also uh, among the platforms that uh, some labeling is, is in order, some way f to help news consumers decide between what's opinion, what's fact, um, what is well sourced and what isn't well sourced uh, would, would, would serve a role, would be a benefit to people. So, you know, is it difficult? Yes. Um, can we do it? I think we can. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening this week in Syria. Um, we saw first with the State of the Union address, uh, this president who had been, who'd faced such intense criticism, even from some of the news organizations that gave him all that airtime during the election campaign and took all those phone calls. CNN comes to mind. Um, the State of the Union occurs, he refers in his speech to a fallen soldier, I believe his wife was in the audience at Congress. And CNN immediately starts saying that this was his first presidential moment. Uh, he evokes images of conflicts overseas and the institution that is the U.S. military. Uh, this week we had the missile strike on Syria. Uh, I can't remember who it was who said last night that this was Donald Trump's first presidential moment. American media have shown a weakness, a tendency in the past, post 9-11, uh, to when the, when the tanks start rolling or the missiles start flying, to be a little overly reverential um, for, for their administrations, uh, either in the run-up to the war, uh, New York Times was quite contrite over their failings on the intel, anonymous sourcing. Um, and what I see here, and I don't know, Madalika, maybe you can help us on this, is... Uh, a, a, a slow, uh, the first signs of perhaps a slide in that same direction, that tendency resurfacing. Do you see it the same way? Do you think uh, that the U.S. media have learned a thing or two from post 9-11? Do you think that the fact that it's Trump will guard, will have the media guarding against that tendency within themselves? Um. I think that, yet again, we're talking about television and its sort of outsized influence. Um, I think that they will be on their guard because something else is going to happen the next day. I mean, the, uh, the night of the president's address to Congress, uh, I think that honeymoon lasted maybe less than a day. Um, some big Flynn news happened I, that week. You know, I, I would uh, suggest that... President Trump has a lot of first presidential moments yes. because he tends to do something and then he tends to follow that up with a lot of really unpresidential moments. So uh, I, I think there's, there isn't a, a huge uh, kind of swell of reverence building. Right, and days. I think also with television, you know, they are, lit they are responding literally in the moment and they have 24 hours a day to fill and I'm not saying that that should excuse them and we're not here to discuss the merits of cable television versus other forms of journalism. Well, we kind of are, <laughs> actually. All right. Well, we I will say are. then, I think the person you, I think it was Fareed, maybe, who talked about yeah, Fareed, him being yeah, presidential uh, this week. Um, I, I think that that's what we've got to guard against, and the work that everyone else is doing will um, collectively make this something different. I mean, what's interesting to me about the coverage, and I've been here, so I haven't watched much of what's happening back home, but whenever a president takes a military action, people fall into um, their particular places. Many people feel, you know, the part partisan, bi you know, we have to be bipartisan, beyond the water's edge, and there are others who fall into line with their pre political stances, and then people question motives, and some people don't. And I was struck, I was trying to remember a similar circumstance 
of a military action being taken at a time of domestic challenge, um, which is how a lot of people are interpreting this week's actions. Uh, and I did I had to dig in a little bit, but I did find something that made me think about this. Here's a quote. Um, while there is clearly much more we need to learn about this attack and why it was ordered today, given the president's personal difficulties, it is legitimate to question the timing of this action. That's probably something you could have heard this week. That is actually from August 1998, after President Clinton did confess that he did, in fact, have a relationship with Monica Lewinsky. It was after the bombings of the uh, embassies in Africa, and the U.S. launched strikes against Sudan and Afghanistan in response. And that quote came from Senator Dan Coats, who is currently Donald Trump's Director of National Intelligence. Um, so a lot of stuff is new right now, but a lot of stuff is old. Um, the thing that's new is the pace, the pace at which we have to respond now. In Cameron and I were just talking about this last week. Usually election campaign cycle, it's crazy, and then you kind of get back into a rhythm of something different. This is worse in spades. You have four or five legitimate news stories a day. And I think that that is one of the biggest challenges for American journalism right now in covering politics. It is nuts. It's really, you come in in the morning and the story that is the biggest story at 9 a.m. has been completely eclipsed by something else at noon. And then you've got to worry about what's happening in the evening when the president is at home and picking up the phone. And then, oh my God, it's Saturday morning. Well, it's still early in America. He hasn't tweeted yet this morning. And that kind of pace, you have to really guard against what it's going to do to how you conduct yourself and the work that you do in the newsrooms. And I think that's one of the real challenges that we're going to face um, in adapting to that kind of pace to do what it is we've always done, which is to cover administrations effectively and um, critically using the real sense of the word critically. With smaller um, newsrooms too. Yes, with smaller newsrooms and with a lot more self-publishers talking direct to audience, and that includes the President of the United States. My, my quick insertion would be that I kept saying this, that we are now in the midst of a house of cards uh, as a reality show, as juxtaposed and in, in multiplication uh, all over the world. And uh, this is something that we should be we should be aware of and, and the in house of card at its most intense, not only taking place in, in only one country, but in several countries at the same time, and juxtaposed and, and sort of convergent. Well, but, but also the idea of finding a, a conflict beyond your borders to distract from what's happening within. We're seeing that model in Turkey uh, today. Um, Erdogan going to diplomatic war with the Dutch, the Germans, when he's got his own uh, electoral challenge to face. Same formula, different place, basically. Right. Uh, the, the, you know, um, uh, as the domestic factors play, the, the, I think, main role here, I, as, as with Trump, with whose popularity figures are falling dramatically, and uh, the Flynn case, etc., cetera, um, the Congress, uh, he feels the pressure. And for, him, for Erdogan, uh, the same thing, but the, his nightmare is... Uh, and more than anything else, uh, the not disappearing corruption case, uh, which has to do with, uh, at the end of the line, uh, Iranian breaking of the Iranian embargo at one side, and also the other file being something to do, having something to do with Al-Qaeda-related uh, businessmen uh, dating back to 2014. He managed to evaporate these cases, uh, invalidate them by, by taking uh, you know, horns of the judiciary and um, put, put, him, put it down, J judiciary rule of law being non-existent, and then goes uh, all the way, diplomatic warfare, uh, creating and inventing enemies all the time. This is, this is something that uh, uh, controlled, the media controlled by him directly uh, through uh, uh, partisan proprietors and also the others, uh, conglomerates uh, dependent on huge uh, public contracts uh, and public tenders, uh, billions of dollars, uh, 
not necessarily uh, uh, same in ideological line with, with Erdogan, but uh, secular, but simply in it for, uh, for the money and for, for greed. And this, is, uh, this has created a spiraling down of, of, uh, of the situation, and Erdogan is uh, being uh, one of the most successful Machiavellis of our time. He's winning, and uh, probably he will, he will continue winning. Uh, I want to go to the audience now for questions. Who's, where's the mic? Uh, we have a question here in the uh, front row. And as soon as this question is done, are, if, are there any other questions? Can I see some hands now? So once we're done uh, uh, with this question, if you wouldn't mind just taking the mic to that gentleman after this so we don't uh, lose time in transition. But here to start. If uh, you want to tell us your name or your affiliation, sometimes that helps. Uh, my name is Beatriz Rios. I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, you have said, first of all, that uh, depending on where you were following the news about the elections, TV, newspapers, your view of the situation was completely different. You said that you didn't manage to um, scrutinize the economic situation in the U.S. Um, you said that only few media gave enough um, coverage to Bernie Sanders, uh, and you have said that many people is only following the news through the TV. So I was wondering, first of all, did you, do you think that this happened because you didn't manage to represent the people in the media, especially in the newspapers, and then that's why people went to TV and they were following completely different news, and these that had some kind of impact in the elections. And if you think it did, uh, what would you do to, uh, fo to uh, face this challenge in the, in the years ahead to try to re-engage these people into your news, into your media, to change the situation again? Thank you. You want me to start? Sure. Oh, um, uh, so it's a complex question. You know, I would say that we are being, just speaking for my own organization, we are being uh, successful in, in engaging people in new ways. I don't think that's just a response to the political situation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a response to where our industry is. So it's, you know, we have found it very necessary and actually very rewarding to experiment like crazy uh, to broaden the range of our storytelling. Um, you know, our biggest expansion this year is the doubling of our video department. Um, and, and that's what one of the things that we need to do as an organization uh, to survive and even to prosper. Um, and, you know, politics, um, you know, isn't everything, right? It's not the only story we tell. Uh, frankly, Donald Trump isn't everything. There are many other important stories in the world to tell right now um, and in the U.S. So, you know, I, I think we have a kind of um, institutional imperative to, to do what you're suggesting, right, which is to reach out to readers, to find new ways of connecting with them, uh, to bring them more into the process, frankly, of reporting, uh, not just of consuming what we do. Um, so, you know, I, I, and, I, and I like to think that we're having some success in doing that. Um, and, you know, and some of that is driven by a sense of uh, not wanting to... Um, you know, to, to make up a little bit for some failings in the past. Um, but as I said yesterday, news organizations can't keep trying to cover the story that they missed, right? You have to keep yourself open to what's happening now that needs attention rather than looking in the rearview mirror about how you might have told the story of the working class in America more effectively. And I think, I mean, it is a complicated question and a lot of it has to do with consumption habits based on age demographics and, you know, cable television skews older and digital media skews younger. And I think the important uh, charge for news organizations is to reach as many people as you can in as many different places as you can. So CNN isn't just a 24-hour cable channel. It has a very robust digital arm. Um, the Washington Post now reaches tens of millions of people a month. A um, hundred. But okay, I wasn't sure if it had gotten million. to yeah, 100 yeah. million. Yeah. Um, and we've got to go where the people are, which is, I think, the fundamental shift in our business. When I used to work on a network television show, the only way you could get 
Nightline was to turn the TV on at 11.30 at night. Now, guess what? We have to go to you because you have choice and technology has allowed you to time shift and all those other things. And I think any newsroom that relies on their one method of reaching audiences is going to be left behind. Uh, before we yeah. hear from this gentleman, any, who wants the microphone next? Hands. Anybody else? Let's go with... Uh, oh, there's one at the back. Well, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I'm Steve Shear. I'm a, a correspondent with Reuters here in, in Italy. Um, my question, I mean, the, there's been a lot of sort of dissecting what went wrong before um, the election. And, and um, I mean, I think a lot was probably just wishful thinking uh, on the part of journalists uh, covering uh, the campaign, uh, thinking that, you know, they, they couldn't imagine really Trump winning. And I also think that, you know, there's uh, the, the, an aspect of sort of Hillary just was not the right candidate, you know, and I think a lot of people don't, don't, don't see that. You know, it's not just not, you know, that, that the press didn't cover um, a certain income level or something like that. There, there was also sort of uh, taking for granted um, that Hillary was, was going to be a candidate that could beat him. But what I wanted to ask was now a lot of the same people who couldn't believe that Trump could win are um, thinking he can't last four years. Now, how can we go four years with Trump, right? And I was wondering what you thought of that. You know, is there any, you know, is there any sort of, um, I mean, the only way that it would possibly end and uh, it would be like Nixon, I think, you know, when there's, a, when there's a, a crime that gets investigated and then, you know, the, the president's put with his back against the wall. So what do you think could happen in the next four years that, you know, that could possibly see uh, a Trump leaving or, 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 or uh, you know, it seems like something that, that's impossible, but there's a lot of talk about it. Uh, whatever happens, I bet you won't, the Washington Post won't have the story to itself this time around, will it? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're not preparing for the early exit of President Trump. We're, we're covering his administration as it is today. Um, you know, I, I think th that just falls, uh, that, that's just too speculative a question for me. Um, I think that's better put to uh, a political commentator. Um, you know, the, we have a lot to do, right? He's, a, he's an unpredictable guy. He m moves in different directions um, without warning. Um, we are, have a lot to do to understand who's around him and what the backgrounds of those officials are, how they're likely to advise him. So there's a lot, there's a lot in front of us, um, and I think that's what we're focused on. The the, the subject of Bernie Sanders was raised earlier. And uh, we did a piece on Sanders, I think, mid-primaries, because he was drawing 16,000 students in Madison, Wisconsin, and getting 30 seconds worth of coverage over eight months on CNN. Again, there's a difference between print and television um, in the way Sanders was covered, I think to a lesser degree than there was on Trump. But one of the people that we spoke to uh, who was trying, uh, in a piece that we were trying to do to try to explain the disconnect between what was happening uh, with the Sanders campaign on the ground and the, the lack of coverage that it was getting in ma U.S. mainstream media. Someone was saying, well, this, this word socialist, uh, and you know, we've talked a lot about demographics this morning, and someone was talking about the demographics of the modern American newsroom, that most people in that newsroom um, covering politics at a senior level would be my generation, uh, 50s, 60s even. And to them, as this commentator put it, the word socialist evokes eras, uh, takes them back to the Cold War. Whereas uh, for millennials, as he put it, uh, if they hear the S word, they're more likely to think of Norway or Ikea. And that there was that demographic. I mean, people talk a lot about the Rust Belt, disaffected voters that didn't get the, the, the coverage that perhaps they deserved. Uh, again, and, and we're scrolling back here, uh, and I know Cameron wants to look forward, which is why I'm putting the question to Madalika. <laughs> but why, I mean, wh what do you think about that demographic dichotomy? And is that a way of explaining why someone who was attracting such big, large crowds uh, as the anti-establishment winds were blowing across America that Trump was latching onto didn't get the coverage. I think that 
as I said before, people tend to fall back into patterns um, of behavior. And uh, you know, I don't think it's about labels. I think it's about habits. I think it's about sourcing. I think it's about how people perceive a race to be evolving. Um, I don't know any millennial who was really into Bernie Sanders who used the label socialist at all. Um, they were no, in, no, but other media commentators yeah. were, and they were using it almost as a disqualifier. Yeah, mean, Anderson, I, Anderson Cooper on CNN saying, do you really think you can be elected as a socialist in the United States? Yeah, except he was running as a Democrat. Um, and, uh, but he said he was a socialist. Yeah, he said he was a socialist, but you know, I, I don't think people think that that sort of, you know, academically about those labels. Um, I, I just think he wasn't telegenic. I think he wasn't, um, he was just out there very slowly climbing up and people were paying attention to other shiny objects, one of which was the Republican race that had, you know, 100 people running for president. Um, and nobody really paid attention to the Democratic race for the longest time because, yes, they thought it was a foregone conclusion. Clearly, the Democratic Party thought it was a foregone conclusion. And let's be honest, the Republican race early on, as soon as Donald Trump entered, became this crazy sideshow, which turned into a presidency. But that's how it was viewed. And even going back as fall of 2015, um, I was amazed at how interested people were in Trump Overseas, um, I think he just galvanized the uh, the attention and sucked up oxygen in a way that when you're making decisions about where you're going and what you're covering when you have a dozen Republican candidates to cover and um, almost, Hello. you know, that's where the attention was. So I, I think they just saw it too late. And you mentioned earlier smaller newsrooms. I mean... I think that's a huge, huge, huge issue uh, at a time when in the 90s and even early 2000s, every single campaign would have embeds attached to them. You had to make decisions early on about where you were going to put your resources and divide them between a dozen plus Republican candidates. And you, know, you didn't have eyes and ears on the ground in the way you might have done earlier. There, there, were two can, there were two candidates on the Democratic side. I would, I would argue that the reason that they didn't staff them wasn't because they were short on bodies, or even if they did, is because of the S word. I think conventional Washington media could not get its head around a social, a, someone who attached the label to himself, socialist. Uh, I don't think they get their head around it. Uh, you and I, I see I, that, I, quite, I, you, see, you and I see it, this one quite differently. Yeah, I, I do. I really do not think that 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 is, I don't, I don't think there's any Washington newsroom, any other newsroom sitting around that is actively thinking, oh, socialist, no chance at all. Um, well, you don't have to actively think it. But even passively, I just, I, I, yeah, I just disagree. I don't think that that's the driving, <coughs> the, that that's the driving force for why people, quote, missed the Bernie Sanders story and early on. We staffed uh, the, the Sanders campaign. We covered the story aggressively. As to the S word, my my older daughter's high school, which is a public high school in the District of Columbia, has a socialist club. So I think people are getting more used to that term. He was elected to the Senate, more or less as a socialist. So By the people of Vermont. Well, fair point. But still, it's not, it's not as toxic a word, I think, as, as you're yeah, imagining. I, I agree. I, yeah. I just well, think in my so world, it isn't toxic. I'm just suggesting that no, in, in, in the US. US I don't think it's as, as toxic a word in the U.S. as you're imagining. And, and actually, uh, during that period, there was a uh, woman who ran for, I think it was Seattle City Council, who ran as a socialist and won. And you've so, heard of her because of that. You've heard of her because she is an anomaly. No, I heard of her because I think, she, uh, actually, because she's Indian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it was interesting when you have someone who is not a Republican or a Democrat, you know, you're going to hear about it. And Richard, Barack Obama was a two-term president, and a lot of people thought of him as a socialist. No, a lot of people called him a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hi. yeah, my name is Chris Theodore. I publish uh, The Reader in Southern California, which is a free printed magazine mailed to 390,000 people in Southern California. And my question is, um, 
Why don't you think your, um, particularly the Washington Post, why doesn't it um, discuss nuclear weapons um, and the move, you know, when you think about how important nuclear weapons are in terms of um, human civilization continuing, why isn't there more of an emphasis on an ongoing basis on, on nuclear weapons as well as militarism in general in terms of um, it within American culture? Uh, I'll just say this because I think that is actually the crux in terms of the American media's um, moral failing in general to not address um, what some people call America's addiction to war. And so I'm just curious as to what kind of pressures you face in kind of um, uh, being able to communicate that um, from, from the position that you're in. What about nuclear weapons? Well, given its importance, um, why, why isn't there more coverage on uh, nuclear weapons, uh, such as the, um, the proposed treaty uh, of, to um, ban that, uh, make it illegal and force the nuclear weapons um, possessing nations to enter into the negotiations that they promise to do so? But that's, that's just the point. In general, why, don't you, why, do, why isn't there more coverage on nuclear weapons? I mean, weapons? I think the short answer is because there's not much happening, right? I mean, it's not, it's, it's not a story uh, at, at the moment. There's not a tremendous amount of change, right? The news focuses on what's changing. Um, and to your second point, um, we do spend a lot of time covering militarism. I mean, I, I might not put it quite that way, but we have covered a lot of wars um, over the, in recent decades, and we spend a lot of time covering the impacts of those wars um, on the people who fight them, their families, and, and the countries where those wars are taking place. So I, I, I can't believe any reader of the Washington Post is not aware of how much the U.S. military has been engaged um, in, in recent years. Um. Oftentimes with journalism, if there are any other questions, we get some hands up. There's uh, one, a couple at the back. Um, oftentimes in journalism, we try to get ahead of the story and try to see what's coming. And I'm wondering whether uh, this president, and this president does seem to make that easy, because if you want to get ahead of the story, all you got to do is watch Fox News, right? Because he watches Fox, and then he tweets it. And, he, and it seems that he also watches it on television. He doesn't watch it online, so he watches it in real time. And I'm wondering whether someone at the Washington Post has been assigned by the managing editor to watch Fox News all the time just so they know what's coming down the pipe. Well, you, know, you might have seen the, the Times did this. The Times watched 18 hours of Fox yeah. and, and wrote a narrative piece about it. I'm not sure how revealing it was, but it was an interesting exercise. Um, yeah, I mean, we also try to get ahead of the story in, in more conventional ways. We try to talk to advisors and the people on the Hill that are engaged with the White House. Um, I think we'll, we'll keep doing that. Uh, we are aware that he watches Fox, though. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, but it's, 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 like, it's not like you don't know what's coming, right? I mean, it, it, in a way, it's kind of easier, isn't it? I, <laughs> no, I know it's a ridiculous question, but it's a ridiculous situation. I, I, I would go back to the bright, shiny object. Yes, people need to be paying attention to what the president is saying and doing, but to get ahead of the story, you have to make sure that you're covering all sorts of other things that are happening in buildings around Washington, um, you know, in agencies, uh, in cabinet offices. That's where you are going to get ahead of the story. Um, and... There will be people, you know, everyone has beefed up their White House teams and their White House will be covering what's happening at the White House, but the words coming out of the president's mouth or his reactions to what he sees on television, I would argue are not necessarily all that's coming ahead. The kind of work that's been being done in the Justice Department, at the EPA, USDA, all these agencies who have a real impact on people's lives 
that's where you're going to be watching the stories that are upcoming. I, I want to take you up on that, but we're going to take a question from the back. Who's got the mic? Hi, um, my name is Ali. I work for a uh, local affiliate WSB in Atlanta. Um, and I was just curious, um, I think in our newsroom there's been this sense of like if there's a national story about Trump to not touch it or to wait until Washington Post breaks it and then we cover it three days later. And I was just wondering what you think that um, local news stations responsibility is um, to cover Trump, especially when like we're right in those communities <laughs> um, and how we could do that better. I would just pick up where Madalika left off, I think. Uh, actually, one of our um, obligations now is to l look at what's happening out of the spotlight. It, it is important to keep track of Fox News and what the president tweets. Uh, it's actually more important to kind of scrutinize what's happening at the agency and department level. And a lot of that will be felt first at the local level. Uh, so, you know, where, um, you know, you've seen news of the tremendous uh, kind of reconstruction or deconstruction of the government that um, the White House proposes. And that's most clearly seen in, in the budget that the White House, budget proposal that the White House issued. So what does that mean at the local level in terms of, say, EPA enforcement of um, regulations and laws governing the environment? Can, can that be perceived um, you know, in, in Atlanta in a way that's meaningful and that would apply across the country. So that's what I would suggest, is to look for the, for, for the quiet uh, implementation or rollback of what the government does uh, and try to broaden that into international stories. Yeah, I think I saw a great example of that yesterday, uh, a story about the proposed uh, cut in budgets for rail travel and how many... Uh, places around the country were going to be very ad adversely in fact, uh, impacted by not having access to rail travel, um, which that's a real people's, you know, that's real people, real lives who are affected by something that um, is a line and a number on a piece of paper in Washington right now, but it's a whole lot more than that. A uh, quick question. Um, my name is Milit. I'm from International Press Institute. Quick question. How concerned are you about the press freedom in the United States? I'm not talking about the business, number of subscribers, uh, about missed stories, but about the opportunity to miss story or not. Opportunity and the space to do your job professionally. Is it shrinking? Do you expect more pressures? How concerned are you? Um, sure you know, we were concerned. Uh, we were concerned under the Obama administration, yeah. right? Uh, multiple leak investigations. Um, you know, a lot of reporters who are, um, you know, have to spend an inordinate amount of time on source protection and on being able to communicate confidentially with people so that uh, we don't put sources at risk. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. It takes up a lot of our time to, to try to compensate for that and to prepare for, you know, possible negative outcomes. Is it getting worse? Well, I don't, I don't think, I think it's too soon to say that because he's only been in, you know, office for a couple of months. Um, uh, it was really tough under the Obama administration. So, you know, I, I guess it's possible to imagine that it could be worse. Uh, right now it isn't, but it's early days. We have a question at the back. I have a question for Yavuz because I think the perspective from the outside is always very valuable. Um, Yavuz, you're outside the eye of the storm in Turkey. Both Madhulika and Cameron are in the eye of a storm in the United States. I wonder, given your experience and watching US media from the distance that you have the privilege of doing, can you see missteps or traps or potholes that the United States media is liable to fall into or has already fallen into that you've seen happening in Turkey as well, where you have another leader of the country who is very anti-media? I would first say, uh, also related to the, the question, I, I, the, the big, huge difference is, of course, the, the heart of the matter is how robust the judiciary will be uh, in terms of uh, media freedom anywhere in the world. Uh, when it starts crumbling, uh, you see the first effects on the, on the media freedom. Uh, and um, um, then uh, I would go and say that uh, in such times of rupture, uh, such as 
you know, unexpected rise and take over power by, by Trump in the US and you know, other surprises elsewhere like Brexit, etc., etc. Um, in, in these times of rupture, I think the focus uh, inevitably um, is to be on investigative journalism. Uh, and uh, I think what I see uh, uh, on, on, the, on the US screen uh, from outside is um, not enough of it. Um, and uh, because this is one of the, you know, this is the country where investigative journalism is, is the deepest and uh, as a tradition very, very strong and inspiring for the others. And uh, I'd see great opportunities um, as this experiment with Trump goes on in the U.S. that uh, there will be people willing to leak uh, uh, disgruntled bureaucrats uh, in the federal or local administrations, I think there should be focus on that as much as, um, as, much as focus on how, how um, uh, independent the, the judiciary will be. Uh, other than that, I think um, uh, the, 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 the difference bit between Turkey and the U.S. is that there is great trust in print journalism. And... Um, uh, that is doing rather well from outside, and uh, there's still a, a very strong mainstream, uh, independent mainstream, uh, and followed, I think, quite intensely by by the readers. Um, so, I would just say, uh, you know, that there sh this, these are the times that we need to have more cooperation on investigative journalism across the borders, as much as more keenness on on um, the state of journalism across the borders. Um, we, we need to have built more strong uh, united fronts uh, uh, to protect ourselves because our profession is, I think, under the severest attack that I know of, uh, you know, since it all began 200 or 300 years ago. At the risk of ending this on a positive note, which doesn't really sit well with the cynical side of me, I did want to take up... Uh, elaborate on one point, Madalika, that you made, which is the, the idea of getting out and covering the other buildings in Washington, D.C. that aren't the White House. Um, we had that kerfuffle over a few news organizations being kicked out of the White House press briefing, not allowed to attend by this administration. Uh, might that be a good thing? A little more distance? Uh, is, is a little more distance something that's called for? I'd ask for something real quick from you both on this, and then we're going to have to wrap up because they're kicking, they're evicting us from this room. Um, I, I think that access to the White House by a daily briefing is important. Um, I, I don't think it's either or. Uh, I think that's one component and an important part of working in Washington, and a responsibility that the White House has, frankly. They are government employees who represent the country, and this is their way to communicate with us. I believe that is one important part of coverage of the White House. But other reporting is important, too. Um, and that's why I do talk about going back to making sure you're covering other parts of the building. You know, let's not forget um, the uh, that Carl... Uh, Bernstein and Bob Woodward were not White House reporters, they were Metro reporters, um, and they were in a newsroom that saw the value of the work that they were doing. Um, I, I don't think it's either or, I think it's both and. You know, I think it's an essential mechanism of accountability that um, the leader of a government, uh, typically his or her representative, is compelled to stand up every day and answer questions from a free media about what that government is doing. So access to the White House is sometimes derided, but it's also an essential, an essential activity, a responsibility that a government has to a public, which is to be compelled to answer questions every day. And so, you know, do we want to do both? Absolutely. Is it important that we be able to question authority on a consistent basis? It's also extremely important. We're out of time. I want to thank Cameron Barr, Madalika Sika, and Yavuz Baidar. Uh, we've been talking about American 
journalism in the Trump era. Some of our guests will be milling about afterwards. If you have any more questions for them, um, feel free to ask. And thanks for being here. Welcome. Yeah, I will. I'm into my home, so I go a lot. I go a lot. Yeah, that's where I grew up. So, yeah. Right. Uh, Thanks. Actually, I mean, I live in Washington now, but I'm from. Email address. Oh, okay. Let's let's get into that. What was what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Taylor in the That's best like that. Oh, yeah, I got you. Thank you. Then Janine. And then I'll just, just you get you and Janine to respond and then we'll just chat. N-A-K. N-A-K. Yeah. After snow. Don't worry, Taylor. How are you doing? How are you? Nice to meet you. You're right to start us off. You have to kick us off. I'd like five Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I'll give you my card now. And then get Janine. Obviously, to respond. Yeah. Um, it's there you go. Thanks. Thank you so much. Good. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think key things have changed is? Taylor's going to kick us off, right. and then I'm going to go to you, and then I'm going to go to Dan. Which basically Should we sit in that order, then? That really makes sense. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, um, Thank you. Very much, it, it is very much after snow, so it's very much thinking how do we do this shit yeah. going forward. It's really great actually. It's really nice to finally meet you. I feel like I know you. <laughs> this morning I'm not sure I know myself. <laughs> One of those nights? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> No, no, I'm all good. No. I went to one in Europe, yeah, uh, last year. How about you? Didn't seem to know. I think that's very long. Not fair. Okay. Oh no, they can't. Good. But I miss all of us. Oh God, 
Look, the tables are prepared. I haven't got anything. Good. I don't think anything's needed. I just have a couple of minutes. If I get in trouble, will somebody help me out? Absolutely. <laughs> no, we're just going to stand back and watch you. You're actually the only one who act really knows anything about this whole well, topic, no, so... No, I know anything you can about just... after snow. I know quite a lot about During <laughs> I can sit here and go, no, that didn't happen. <laughs> no, we didn't think about that. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, we, I did a bunch of panels immediately afterwards mm. doing a lot of dire warnings yeah. and saying, none of your sources are protected. You must, you know, it, it's almost impossible now to guarantee yeah. anybody anonymity. I don't yeah. know how I will ever look at a source again and go, yeah. I will protect you because I'm not yeah. sure it's in my hand. Yeah. And everybody looked at me like I was nuts and had got a tinfoil hat. Yeah, that was one of the things I was going to mention, is that... Good morning, good morning, whoa, whoa, that was very loud, wasn't it? God, God, that's too loud for me. Good morning, everybody, buongiorno, come stai, um, and that's it, <laughs> in terms of Italian, I'm afraid. My name's Charlie Beckett, I'm a professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics, and um, this morning we're, we are gathered here to discuss journalism after Snowden, the idea of how do we, or how do those journalists do that task of uh, investigative journalism in an era when the state and other authorities have the same power and technology as we do, and it's often turned against the journalists trying to uh, investigate those people. Um, the reason I'm chairing this is not because I ever did any investigative journalism, but I did um, six years, seven years ago, write a book about WikiLeaks. Do you remember those innocent days <laughs> when um, WikiLeaks created the most spectacular uh, story based on um, a data download, uh, which we all thought was... Um, agenda shifting, not just in terms of politics, but in terms of, of journalism itself. And of course, a lot of things have changed since then. Uh, I, for example, I actually wrote the book with a guy called James Ball, ah. <laughs> who at that time um, was at The Guardian and is now at BuzzFeed. And I think that's one of the sides we're going to look at, is the, the way that the journalism has changed. But of course, we're going to look at how the other side has changed. Back in 2010, uh, when WikiLeaks uh, released all those Iraq and Afghan files and so on, um, the guy in the White House was called Barack Obama, and the Secretary of State, who was absolutely furious with WikiLeaks, was, of course, called Hillary Clinton. There you go. So, lots have changed, and we're really lucky that we've got a fantastic panel who have tracked this. We've got Taylor Owen, who uh, edited the book Journalism After Snowden, and already, you know, that agenda has moved on since that book came out. We're very lucky to have Janine Gibson, who is now the boss of BuzzFeed uh, UK, but was also at, was, was at the Guardian leading uh, their amazing revelations with Ed Snowden. And we've also got Dan Gilmore, uh, uh, former journalist, Arizona University, and somebody who uh, very, very much monitoring the public and ethical role of journalism. So we're going to kick off with Taylor, then get reaction from Janine and Dan, and then, of course, we want to go back into you, the audience, to get some questions. But I'm going to kick off with Taylor, please. Great. Thanks so much, Charlie. Um, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes... Uh, so mo just some background. This book was mostly... The chapters for this book were mostly written almost two years ago. Um, right in the wake of the Snowden revelations, I was based at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at the time, 
And we ran a, uh, a project over the course of a year where we did a dozen or so events with sort of the leading people in the debate and, and in the actual implementation of this story, um, Janine being one of them at the time, and commissioned a bunch of papers doing sort of a real-time assessment of how this story was playing out and what the consequences of it were for the practice of, of journalism more generally. Um, but the publishing process being what it is, or the academic one, is it's now sort of almost two years later from when a lot of that, those initial, this initial story was breaking. And so what I want to spend just a couple of minutes doing is just reflecting a little bit on where maybe that debate has gone since the story and since these chapters were written and this initial assessment was, was made. Um, and I just, I just want to make four sort of general observations maybe about how this debate is changing or what, how the debate about journalism and, and surveillance is changing. Um, the, the first is that I think the attempt by governments to securitize surveillance and to um, attach all of the activities that fit under the apparatus of the surveillance state under an objective of security, of national security, has largely proven successful. I think that was contested at the time if they were going to be able to do that because there are a whole host of activities that sit under the surveillance architecture which aren't directly li linked to counterterrorism or to national security. Um, they are corporate espionage, a whole host of other activities. And I think they've, we've managed to normalize that activity of the state, or the state has managed to. And there is broad, at least in North America, public support for that. So I think we just have to acknowledge that that's the case. On the journalism side, within that normalization, I think there's been a normalization of the threat level. Journalists are both acutely aware that there's a high level of surveillance on them or on their sources. And at the same time, paradoxically, there's an incredibly low adoption of the technology to pretend, potentially um, deter that threat. So you have this strange paradox. And you're, I'm, I now live in, I'm Canadian and I live in Canada. And you're, a great example of this is We've now had clear cases of our national police force actively surveying journalists and hacking into the communications of journalists with both very little public outcry or coverage and very little security, new security measures being adopted by journalists. So that kind of shows you that duality going on there. Um, the second point I would make, which is sort of related to that, is that I think we're starting, we're really seeing the limits of um, uh, technology as a protector of journalism at, its most, at, the, at the thing journalists need to protect most, which is um, source protection. And I know Janine's going to talk a little bit about this, but I mean, at the time, we did an event in, at the museum in DC during the series, and we had Marty Barron and Dean Baquet on stage together um, in the museum in Washington, DC, as the Snowden story is breaking, right? So this was, there was a lot of hysteria going on. And both of them said on stage, look, we are never going to be able to guarantee source protection again. And, and at the time, nobody believed it. There was gasps when they said this, the editors of the two biggest papers in America, saying they can't guarantee source protection. But I think that is the case. And it's the case, in, and technology is not the solution to that problem. So as, as I think Snowden said too, I think it was Snowden who actually said it, that the types of encryption technology we have now are, are relatively good at protecting against dragnet surveillance, just being caught up in the collection efforts. But they're almost, they, there's very little utility of them against targeted surveillance, which is really the thing that journalists need to be most concerned about, is after a story is published and there's, act, there's an active measure against either a whistleblower or a journalist who has published something. And I think techno there's real limits to how technology can protect journalism under that. Um, the third thing I would say is that, and, and Dan would be able to speak to this much, and Charlie actually, much better than I can, but I, I do think we're seeing a shifting in the debate about the ideology of the open web. There, there was a moment, as, as Charlie said, before this, the Snowden story, and before WikiLeaks went through whatever bizarre transformation it's now gone through, um, where there was a real alignment between radical transparency and la radical openness and the civic functions of journalism. And I think that's why you saw this really rich interplay between those advocating for open and transparent, to their openness and transparency as a core of journalism and the, and the technologies to do that, like WikiLeaks. Um, and you just saw an alignment between those. And I'm just not sure that is still the case. Um, 
And for a whole host of reasons we can dive into, but really one just being that, that it's pretty clear now that that level of an openness has pretty fundamentally enabled aspects of the surveillance state and has enabled aspects of the surveillance state that aren't linked to either a deep NSA activity or deep illegal activity, but actually just the huge amount of data that's now be out in the open. Um, and so you get these bizarre scenarios where, and I think these paradoxes, where companies like Facebook are appropriating the ideal this original ideology of the open web, of the civic values of sharing and being open, while at the same time capturing and monetizing that data and highly restricting the flows of it. So that, that's, to me, that's irreconcilable. Those two values conflict, or those values of the open web and the ways in which they're being um, controlled in platforms are at some points at odds with each other. Um, the, the final thing I would say is that, and kind of related to that, is that it, it's easy to forget pre the Snowden story and this knowledge of the, of the data collection efforts that are, are around us, um, what, how we were talking about that relationship between technology companies, journalism, and power, and state power. And I think those three pillars um, have really shifted in the last two years. And there's a whole host of new debates that kind of sit at their intersection. That I think journalism particularly needs to grapple with. And just, just a couple of them are, as, as I mentioned, fate, platforms as a intermediary between citizens and information about the world is, is, a, new, is a relatively new phenomenon in the last few years as the primary intermediary rather than the internet writ large. That's a major change. Um, the rise, and I would say dominance, of a, of a pernicious ad advertising technology space that is built on the notion of surveillance, right? <laughs> of capturing and analyzing data about the world, about how we use in, the internet and communicate in, in the digital world. Um, the rise of a new um, surveil uh, Silicon Valley-based um, security and surveillance industry, which didn't really exist five years ago. Companies like Palantir, these big organizations that are thriving mostly off of national security contracts, but have espoused values of Silicon, of Silicon Valley and of tech startups. That's, I'm saying that a little bit more um, um, negatively than it, it that's, it's just sort of a, a reality of what these companies are, and I think we have to come to terms with that. And then, and then just finally, the real questions of how journalism can hold these new institutions of power to account when they're so deeply embedded in them. And this is really in uh, at Silicon Valley um, and platform companies. We really, and, over, and that really has changed since the Snowden story. In the last two years, the financial models, the distribution models, the engagement models of journalism have fundamentally been absorbed into a small number of platforms. And, it's, and uh, I have real questions of how journalism and journalists will be able to hold those institutions of power, which they are now, accountable when they are so deeply embedded in them. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Great, thanks, Taylor. Yeah. Um, and that takes us perfectly to the person who's actually at the sharp end of, of this. Obviously, you were with the Snowden story, and you still are uh, with BuzzFeed and the investigative journeys you do. So answer Taylor's questions, please. <laughs> Um, I will not be responding to everything Taylor said because he has written it all down properly and I've scrawled some notes. Um, uh, but there are, a few, there are a few things that I uh, would really point to. I can remember... Can you hear me? No. I can remember um, two years ago... Two years ago. Mm. Two years ago, sitting uh, on a panel at, at Columbia, um, uh, fairly dazed... Uh, not really able to process any of the things that were going on because it was such an in intense and mad time. Mm -hmm. But I can remember sitting on, on a stage in, in a hall surrounded by very learned people and saying, I, d I don't see how we're ever going to be, guarantee be able to guarantee that we can protect the source ever again. And everybody looking at me like I was crazy, like I really needed a lie down and, uh, and a bit of a holiday because I'd got uh, drunk the Kool-Aid. Um, but, I, but it, was, it was clearly true, and um, the, one of the first things I, I now do, two years on, is sit with a journalist who comes to me with a story or a tip or a source or an interesting something or other and start with, what was your first contact? What was your first contact? Because from the first contact, everything is trackable, everything is knowable. And if we, 
once you start to piece that out, you have to be incredibly, incredibly careful to protect your source's footsteps. And ultimately, if somebody wants to know, they will, they will know, they will find out. We were having a conversation the other day about a story about which I can give you absolutely no details, but it's, it's the sort of thing that sends you into immediate paranoia as soon as you start talking about it. And we were trying to game out how many blind cell phones we'd have to buy in order to have a conversation between two people on two continents. And we got to eight before we got to the point where we thought we might be able to make it work, just between two people. Um, you, your challenge as an editor becomes absolutely one of sort of cryptography and further maths to try and build out how to build a story now. So that one's just on source protection. We can come back to that. The other warning that everybody used to um, stare at me and say, oh dear, she's lost it, was that when the government uh, builds a trapdoor into all of your communications <laughs> on the grounds of national security, the trapdoor goes both ways. And this was the thing that we would preach over and over, and NSA uh, uh, advocates would go on CNN and say, this is nonsense, and this idea that somehow you've built a trapdoor and it's let the Chinese in or the Russians in. And, um, and then you had an election last year, so that, um, that was not reassuring. Um, the, the other thing that we asked repeatedly um, and begged for, really, was that the tech community, from which in many ways Ed Snowden came, uh, and were outraged, as outraged as the media, we, we sort of begged a lot for better tools. And when you said, and it's really a concern, journalists don't, don't communicate securely, journalists sort of don't, they know the risk, but they, they, can't, they can't confine themselves to secure tools. They are still much too hard and much too unreliable. And the few that we have are too known to be the places where people communicate securely. So you just know there's a back door. You, almost ha having a conversation on Signal or Telegram is a flag to this is probably a conversation that you want to track. And once somebody's in your device, it doesn't matter what app you're using. These are still questions that I think industries and communities need to come together to solve. Um, and then the third thing I would just say, just to be more doom and gloom so that in two years' time I can go, I said this in Perugia, and you all looked at me <laughs> and thought I was nuts. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the context for everything clearly is the political climate. When, when we did this story, as an editor, you are both asking extraordinary things of your source. Now, in my case, I, I, I didn't have to ask anything extraordinary of my source. My source did extraordinary things and then came to us with it. But I had to ask journalists to do things that were quasi-legal in a very public service context that I was absolutely confident was... Uh, completely justified and absolutely worth it for the story and there was no, never going to be a problem arguing that out. It was all justified. But that was with a base level. When anybody ever said to James Ball or Ewan or Glenn, you're very, very brave, on a very base level we had an understanding that we took for granted, which was the governments of our countries, the US and the UK, would posture and threaten, and they are still investigating us for treason in the UK, but they'll, they'll stop eventually. We... They were posture and threatened, but in the end, I did not think anybody, they would send journalists working in the public interest to prison. I did not believe that was the case. I thought we might have a very awkward fight, might cost The Guardian a lot of money, and it might, it might get bad, but I really didn't believe anybody would go to prison. I, I'm not sure I can say that now. I'm uh, of either nation, and I think that's a, something, a very sobering thought. I think we have to accept that the dialogue has changed, that politicians will talk about actively pursuing journalistic sources. Mm -hmm. They will not even pay lip service to the idea that journalism is uh, sacred or has any sort of special privilege. And when Theresa May is going after our WhatsApp text messages, she's actually going after our WhatsApp text messages to find out who <laughs> our sources are. So that is my uh, stern warning. I don't think we have the fourth estate privilege that we used to have even two years ago. Thank you. Before I go to Dan, I just want to follow up Janine. I mean, that's a very, you know, somber statement. And Sorry. It's a, it's a, that's what we're here for. And it's a, a sort of big red light. It's kind of flashing a warning light. Could you just say a couple of sentences, though? Because obviously you are still, or BuzzFeed is still doing or trying to do this kind of journalism. And I'll just, could you just say a little bit about, not just BuzzFeed, but how, how you evaluate the 
you know, the effort that is currently ongoing by journalists, if things are so frightening, both politically and technologically, right now, is it having a chilling effect? Is it having, you know, are, are we now being blocked from those kind of investigations or people not even bothering to start them because mm. they're so difficult? Or, you know, what's happening out there, do you think? Um, I'm happy to say that, that um, I do think investigative journalism is thriving. I do think that journalists are at their best in opposition. That is the, that is the very best thing about our profession is um, uh, the more we are sort of cornered or trapped or restricted, the more we come out fighting. So um, I do think investigative journalism is, is, is alive and I, I've never yet, never yet come across an investigative journalist who's gone, oh, I don't know, that's a bit hard. Because investigative journalists are, in the best way, completely crazy. Investigative journalists, you say, that's impossible. They don't know I can do it. It might take, take me five years and you won't see me in between time. I'll just send you my expenses. So I'm, I'm, I think there's lots to be optimistic about in the industry. But the, the, the calculations we have to make before we set you off on a story, the, um, you know, we have a really... Uh, robust security team at BuzzFeed, a department now of people whose job it is to look after the safety of our journalists. There are, there are BuzzFeed journalists currently on a training course in the UK covering, you know, medical combat, what happens if you're in a violent protest, but also what to do with your sources, how to, how to survey in a, in a safe way. If you want to write a story about anything to do with Russia, if you want to do a story about anything to do with um, security and surveillance, about anything to do with uh, technology and fake news. These are the prevailing stories of our age, and you can immediately, once you start to think about it, realise where all the dangers are. Mm. We do an awful lot of non-technological storage now. Pretty much every piece of work that you do, you have to... It's very... Um, it's very 1970s. It's nice for us old people. Is it familiar? <laughs> oh, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Pen and paper. <laughs> Dan, you're very much a, 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 you know, an advocate of journalism changing and adopting new technologies and being more open and so on. How does investigative journalism fit into that for you? It, fi it fits in uh, in any number of ways. The the use of technology is something we take for granted at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that it's, it's likely uh, that, as, uh, uh, as Ed Snowden said to me and a group of other people in, uh, f by teleconference in Munich last fall, that uh, w we should all give up on winning an arms race, that journalists uh, will not win the arms race with governments when it comes to being uh, under surveillance. And that, and that was a bit of a change in tune for him. He had been, uh, he still advocates the use of uh, the tools to protect ourselves, but I, I think that was a sobering remark and that it will take in the end laws and norms to be reestablished that I have a hard time seeing happen in the near future. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I, I, I I'd like to expand this a little bit for a second. Uh, we're talking only about journalists and their issues. I'd like to uh, I'd like to suggest that maybe journalists can help themselves by broadening this discussion to the people who uh, are the uh, users of journalism, namely the audience for journalism, and in many cases participants in it, that it's not just about protecting us, and it's not just about having a world where we can have a conversation without assuming that the state is listening in or recording it for, f for future reference. Uh, but that, that applies to everybody. That applies to people doing business. That applies to people who are, uh, you know, as, as many do, uh, things that they might not want in the public light. I wish journalists would uh, become activists uh, as, as a group for protecting everyone's rights, not just our own. 
and I, I'm afraid I don't see that. And if it, it's unsurprising, though, uh, you know, just bizarre that journalists don't adopt these tools themselves, but as Tyler said, they don't. And uh, as Janine said, it's partly because they're really hard to use. Uh, PGP is uh, not much easier to use for encrypting email than it was when it came out 20 years ago. Uh, which is, that's a statement about two parties, and one of them is, I think, culpable in the problem we have, and that's the tech industry itself, which has not, uh, despite many promises, done what it should and could to help everyone and I'll point straight at Google on one part of this. It's been now several years since Google promised end-to-end -end encryption within Gmail, and they have not delivered. They made that promise. Uh, that would have been good for a lot of people all over the world, but it wouldn't have been good for Google's business model, and I'm, I'm really disappointed in Google for not following through on, on what it said it would do. So I, I want journalists to do what they can to protect themselves, but to, more than that, get the public involved to protect everybody, because in the end that will help protect the journalists uh, as well. Okay. I'm going to come to you in a second and try and get questions from the audience, but I just want to go back to uh, Taylor. Just to, I mean, Janine and Dan, have, well, I managed to get Janine to be a bit more optimistic, um, <laughs> but but times are tough out there, as Dan says. You know, there's a structural problem. Where do you see interesting sort of initiatives, best practice, trying to sort of push back against these barriers? I mean, honestly, I think Janine would know that better than I, being sort of the front lines of this. I mean, it seems to me, though, that Dan's point about the broader structural environment in which journalism is operating is the key one. That Yes, there are discrete tools that, that journalistic organizations use. There are encryption tools for mobile devices to communicate with sources. There's secure drop to, so where sources can anonymously deliver tips and to news organizations. And I'm sure these things are used and have a degree of benefit. But ultimately, unless the, a secure environment is normalized across a population, it is both a flag and is ultimately breakable through a targeted um, investigation, right? And recorded long into the future for retroactive investigation. So, I mean, what, as long as that environment exists, it's hard to imagine any discrete tool really being a, a protective source. And I really think we need to drill into the ad advertising technology space here. I mean, Dan is absolutely right. There's a few things that would make a bigger difference than wide-scale and end encryption of communications. But that just is, that's at odds with the dominant business model um, of most platform companies, right? I mean, so now, I mean, a lot of journalists will say that the iMessage is probably the most secure communication tool right now because it's offering end-to-end. -end. Um, but other than that, there aren't a lot of great examples of the big platform companies providing real security for their user base because they need that information. They need that data. Yeah. And so I don't know how we get around that problem. How do we get around the problem, Janine? Or do you just accept that's the... I mean, I don't, I don't have the um, technological brain to be able to answer that question, but I can tell you that I do not at the moment... Oh, I just, why don't you keep casting me as the doom monger? <laughs> I, I do not think at the moment it is possible to protect retrospectively and to... You know, the longer you do an investigation, the more likely you are to leave a trail that can be pieced together. And investigative journalism takes a long time. Yeah. Um, the, the only reason Edward Snowden got to reveal himself was we did it really fast. Um, <coughs> Otherwise, they would have got there, and we were fantastically careful and did use PGP and tails and every possible thing. But you can't, you can't, and, and of course, you can't, um, you can't always know at the beginning of a story where it's going to end up mm. and, and what level of, of care you need to take. Yeah. Okay. I have one thing to add. I just have one thing to, to Dan's point about the public and the journalists not considering themselves idiosyncratic to this much broader problem. I mean, journalists, and particularly investigative journalists, tend to think of the things that need protecting as themselves, who are doing the investigations, and this sort of platonic ideal of a whistleblower, this inside a government elite who wants to get very valuable information to you. 
That's fine on the extremes, but really what we're talking about here are the way mass publics communicate about information they know about the world. And sometimes that's to journalists, sometimes that's just in the public sphere that they now have access to. But once those people, particularly vulnerable groups, people who want to speak about wrongs that have been done to them or injustices they view in their worlds, once they stop talking, this entire space closes down. And that could be what we're seeing because of it, as a consequence of all of this. That's completely right. And also, we, you know, we tend to focus on the big uh, data dump journalisms, or, yeah. uh, uh, mm. uh, such as WikiLeaks or mm. Snowden. But actually, the vast bulk of important investigative journalism mm. is done by people sitting in a room thinking, right, who would know the answer to this bit? Who can fill in that bit of story for me? Yeah. That person isn't going to come to you via secure drop, right. and you're not going to be able to reach out to them via PGP. And they're not going to write back in and, public email. Exactly. Yeah. So you, it is unrealistic mm. to sort of really over-focus on the one scenario and think that you've built a tool that will protect everyone. Absolutely. Interesting. Would anybody like to ask a question of the panel? We have a microphone at the back. Would anybody like to have a crack at these guys? If not, we'll keep talking. But do you know? What? Mario. Really? Sorry. Uh, I, 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 I would prefer to uh, wait for the others. But anyway, since <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, uh, it all started my train of thought with, with this Northern thing and the Guardian, how the Guardian managed it, uh, especially when the uh, MI5 wanted to uh, actually destroy the hardest, mm. uh, knowing that you people were uh, uh, on the other side of the ocean protected yeah. by the First Amendment. So uh, mm, uh, uh, I'm part of a project which is called the Offshore Journalism, uh, which is offshorejournalism.com, and which we are going to present tonight here uh, at the room Right here, and the idea, and I was wondering, what's uh, what's your thoughts, what your thoughts are about this, uh, not only for investigative journalism, but for journalism uh, uh, in general, especially in Europe, we are, we are seeing increasing threats of uh, 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 deletion of journalism content, be it for injunctions, court orders, right to be forgotten, you name it, and so we are exploring. Uh, uh, if there is a possibility, not just for institutionally multinational outlets like the Guardian to jockey among different uh, jurisdictions, but mm. whether we can uh, do for freedom of speech what big companies do for freedom of their taxes. Yeah. I mean, I think this is really smart. I have. Um, we we did experiment with this. Um, we obviously we we used. Uh, uh, the famous line with um, uh, Alan and Jill Emerson about uh, joining up with the New York Times was, you know, we've got the documents, you've got the First Amendment. It was, it, it was really vital to have a sort of international uh, co-production and alliance. Um, I've also thought uh, that in the same way that big multinational companies go libel shopping around territories and think, oh, we might, we might just do this suit in the UK because they... Um, or in America with the unlimited damages. The, you, that uh, security journalism and investigative journalism is best thought of as something that exists globally and where you might want to fight your battles. That's the one, that's the one uh, shield that we have. Because increasingly, as I've sort of warned before, I'm, I'm not sure journalism can stand on its laurels as we are, we are a vital um, role in society because I don't believe that argument is, is, is respected by the people that run it. And beyond that, the, uh, in country after country, leaders or people who want to be leaders are uh, systematically trying to devalue truth and, and attack the very concept that anything could be true except what they say. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's another challenge. It's a separate one from this, but it's, really, it's quite related. That if we if journalists don't uh, ensure that they do things that people can trust and, and do it visibly, that, that's a problem. And to expand on Janine's point and yours, I, I, the consortia that exist now uh, for investigative journalism, uh, the, especially uh, the ICIJ, is, uh, it's fantastic, it's wonderful, and we need more of those. We need uh, a whole variety of things that will help people doing it in various jurisdictions, uh, but also journalists 
in doing these things need to be telling a better story about why they do what they do and why it matters. Uh, it, we've, for, for a long time, we've just said, well, our, our work stands for itself, it, and, and you'll understand the value and importance of it. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that's going to work much longer. I think there's going to be a lot more needed. Yeah. And Taylor, where do you see the, between the platforms, the threat from the platforms and from, I suppose, the state, mm -hmm. um, your fellow panelists are implying that, you know, this is getting worse. Um, which is worse? Is it a political danger or is it the fact that the platform, the platforms have no self-interest in aiding and abetting this kind of journalism? I mean, that's, that's a huge question. I think my general feeling on the role that platforms play in this is that they are by and large agnostic towards the particularities of the content that's shared in their platforms. And that's because their, their structural financial model does not distinguish between different types of content. It is all, it's atomized and commercialized in, an, in a relatively equal way, whether it's a piece of journalism or a post from somebody or a piece of slander or, right? So, so in that ecosystem, if we're calling that an open market for information, I'm not sure why journalists should expect to be treated differently Right. and prioritized inside that ecosystem. Unless platform companies believe that this sort of information flowing on their platforms is a big enough threat to people's trust in them as a platform, then that might shift. But I, I, don't, th I don't think we're there, yeah. personally. Yeah. So in that ecosystem, you're going to have a huge flow of information, both uh, of, of every kind that will be capitalized on by anyone who wants to either collect data about people or persuade people of things. And that includes states, it includes political parties, it includes advertisers, it includes propagandists, it includes everybody. And so that is, I think, what's happening in the platform industry. That happens to be also very convenient for governments that want to watch what citizens are doing, governments that want to, in many ways, shape the information that people are receiving, right? And that's sort of the, super, the, the surface level information ecosystem in which surveillance and manipulation can occur. Now, there's a whole other conversation about much more targeted um, surveillance activity, which, I mean, some ways intersects with platforms, but really exists exogenous to that, too. Yeah. So there's almost two main, two conversations there. Yeah. The other thing that was occurring to me, Janine, was um, I hate to bring up the so-called fake news, false news thing yet, yet again, but in, in a sort of me media environment where there's so many conspiracy theories which have an, a sort of na an investigative narrative at least, this idea that there's a sort of hidden state and, uh, you know, hidden secrets and so on, how do you distinguish, what do you call it, proper investigative journalism from that? I wonder if that, you know, does that, mm. where, where, where's the barrier, you know, because I know obviously that you do great work on myth busting and fact checking and so on, but at the same time you're trying to bring hidden narratives out in a world which is now packed full of bizarre theories and mm. stories, isn't it? Um, I mean, I, I sort of, uh, I suppose you've just got to trust that your, um, uh, that reputation has authority. I mean, I, I like to think there's a bit of a difference between us and info wars, but um, maybe there isn't. Um, I think mm, we've subscribed for quite a while to the idea that showing you're working is the only way to uh, really build faith in what you're doing. That Which is tricky if you're doing an investigation. It's hugely tricky if you're doing an investigation, especially if, uh, if your source material is, is extraordinarily classified, mm. um, because you can't show it all. We had to uh, go to a lot of lengths to, to not show it all. Um, but in general, the, 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 way to, you know, the way to combat the multiplicity of theories and madnesses and, is, is to show exactly all the steps. And, and BuzzFeed is, is very keen on publishing as much of its source material and, and its methodology as possible. It was something we always tried to do at The Guardian. Because you, you need to take people with you. If you're going to, in the WikiLeaks case, you mentioned how unhappy Hillary Clinton was. 
if, if the editor is going to sit on the phone to Hillary Clinton and say, we understand your concerns, Madam Secretary, but we're, we're probably going to do it anyway, you are already accepting that a large proportion of the public is going to be very cross with you for doing what mm. you're doing. So you better have thought through your rationale for doing it before you do it. Um, and, and even better to sort of publish it and state it and make it clear as part of the story that you're publishing to, to, um, to take people with you on the journey. Otherwise you are sunk because, you know, as, as I say, you, you need the support of your audience or, yeah. or, or you're really in trouble. And do the audience... You know, is this an esoteric, um, you know, dark corner of BuzzFeed, or does it have value for your brand? Oh, investigative journalism is, is core, absolutely core at, uh, at BuzzFeed. Um, we, within BuzzFeed News, we focus almost exclusively on uh, exclusive stories, news stories, or investigative, or extremely rich breaking stuff that's happening right now. We, we, we. Otherwise, there would be no point to us. We have to be telling you something you don't know. Yeah. And our audience is crusading and angry and emotional and passionate and wants to you know, respond to the world. So they, yeah, they... They, they love it. Anybody like to ask a question out there? Anybody out there do investigative journalism? Hands up if you do investigative journalism. Well, then ask a bloody question. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you one? What? Can I ask you one? No, no, don't ask them. Okay. Come on, then. Don't Investive. Don't Thank you. <laughs> They've finally woken up. Come on, well, guys. No, it wasn't that we were asleep. It was that we were too depressed. Oh. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the notion that easier encryption tools, um, easier ways to keep sources secure uh, can, can be elicited from the technology community. Sign me skeptical on that. Um, I'm, I'm old school. I believe in the postage stamps and the dark brown envelopes that show up in your mailbox. Um, they work, they've worked for 40 years. They still work. Uh, um, but the, the uh, reliance on uh, classified information in the surveillance state, as our previous panel noted, um, is becoming a more core part of investigative journalism. Is that a smart move? Is, is there a way to move back to the kind of um, sourcing, human sourcing levels of, of information that, and can they be more easily protected? Or have we just moved beyond that too far? That's, that's, that's I'm sorry, I didn't identify myself. Diana Henriquez was the contributing writer for the New York Times. I mean, I, I, I completely agree that um, we get, we were just saying this, we get completely sidetracked by uh, the, the problems of dealing with the very, very hardest bits of information and the most secure things, when, when really the vast majority of the good journalism that we do is human sources, piecing together a story, going and asking somebody else about it, going and ask someone else, going and ask someone else who might know about that. I mean, that, that's, that is the vast bulk of what we do. But of course, when something when something drops and it is the hardest of the hard, it consumes everybody for, um, you know, just as a sidetrack, because it just reminded me, the thing, I, the thing that's starting to drive me nuts about big dump journalism is when the initial story is, we've got a really big leak, and that's sort of it. It's like the biggest leak we've ever had. No, this is the biggest leak. No, this is bigger than the My leak's leak. bigger than your leak. This, this <laughs> leak... <laughs> I weighed this leak. This leak. I printed it out. Yeah, and this one. You can't even get this one in your hat. We, we've got to stop that. That's not attractive. We, we, that's, that's not a good label. Yeah. yeah, and indeed, it's almost the converse problem that the scale of the, the data set yeah. obscures any narrative and significance right. of it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And when everything is stamped secret, uh, yeah. you know, promiscuously uh, and without real reason, except because that's what governments do. Uh, that, that adds to the problem in a lot of ways because you, you're inevitably then getting things that are classified even though they shouldn't have been in the first place. So right. yeah. uh, it, that, that's a troubling thing. I, I, I think we're gonna be relying on leakers uh, in huge ways for the next few years. Uh, and that makes me really uncomfortable. Uh, just a, a follow up to that, Dan's very, very good point. By focusing on how vulnerable we now feel, are, are we risking that we will discourage 
the leakers that we know we're going to need, uh, certainly in the U.S. for the next, uh, the next four years? Are we, are we frightening them away from helping us in old-fashioned ways? I, well, I, th I, I was heartened by Dean Baquet's statement, uh, public statement, that he would, uh, he'd, be, he'd be willing to go to jail if someone sent in Trump's tax returns. Uh, I, I think that's a, that's a very positive statement from the, the top editor of uh, one of America's best news organizations. Um, it's terrifying that he had to say that, and uh, Janine is right. We're in the U.S., I think we're heading for uh, rough times with uh, government pursuing not just the sources as they were done in the Obama years, but I, I think journalists are going to be facing uh, trial in not too distant future. Yeah, I'll just add one more point on that, that I, I think we need to recognize and acknowledge that what Snowden and the journalistic organizations, including Janine, led, was in many ways what you're talking about, a collaboration between a large database and reporting over a long period of time. And that is, stands in quite significant opposition to the more radical WikiLeaks model of, mm. of radical transparency, right? And, and I'm not, I think we need to acknowledge that that was the right way to do it, and it was incredible, it was difficult, and the people who did it took a huge amount of risk. Um, but that probably is the better model than just this, in my view, than this more radical option. But are we in a place now where the more radical option is actually the more feasible one for the people involved? Mm. And, and we may, for, for the leakers, for the journalists, for everybody involved, are we in a, a type of environment where that data dump is actually just significantly easier and less risky for everybody involved? Are we going to have news organizations willing to take that same multi-year investment and risk that, that I think the New York Times and The Guardian and their network did around the Snowden data? Okay. I, I don't know. There was a question at the back. Have we got the microphone? Thank you. In Italian, or... Okay. Headsets. No. <laughs> <laughs> Io sono un giornalista italiano, volevo farle una domanda. Uh, vedendo il film di Edward Snowden, di Oliver Stone, mi ha colpito molto il coraggio di questo ragazzo che... di questo ragazzo che ha tentato di, di svelare al mondo quelli che erano appunto i progetti della CIA. Eh, che fine farà appunto Ed, secondo voi, e se verrà riportato negli Stati Uniti, dopo che ora è in Russia? E, diciamo anche il, il problema anche di quelli che sono i governi che appunto non, non rispecchiano i popoli, che cosa ne pensate tutti e quattro di questa affermazione? Magari gli Stati Uniti non rispecchiano il popolo statunitense non rispecchia appunto il, il governo appunto in carica, grazie Janine first mm. what, um, what happens to a guy like Ed Snowden? What, uh, did everybody hear? The, so, no, so, okay, so, alright, so, so the question was um, I wrote it down uh, <laughs> The, the question was, unfortunately, that uh, a nice man has been watching Oliver Stone's film. I, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't know. Yes. Anyway, so, uh, but he was struck by uh, the courage of Ed Snowden and uh, wants to know uh, how he's going to end up. Will he remain in Russia? Will he um, uh, be sent back to the United States? And uh, then there was a subsidiary, uh, which was about the governments reflecting the view of the population and do we think, where do we think the view of the U.S. population is on Snowden? Um, which I can't really answer because I haven't lived in America for, for three years and I don't know what the public mood is. I think, um, I think a lot of the things that people threatened about Ed Snowden, that he was this you know, narcissistic, egotistical, weirdo traitor who uh, was in the pay of the Chinese and then, and then Putin, have, have been proved uh, demonstrably untrue. So I hope that uh, over time his uh, genuine belief in what he did and why he did it um, uh, stands and that he can return to the United States um, uh, with, without fear of, of prosecution as a whistleblower. 
Um, the NSA has said several times since the revelations that uh, a public debate was necessary, that a public debate needed to be had. That public debate was clearly not going to happen unless, unless he told everybody what was being done in their name. Um, I have absolutely no idea what will happen to him, and neither does he, as far as I can see, because if your future is in the hands of Putin and Trump, how could you possibly have an idea what might happen tomorrow? Which stands for all of us, really, doesn't it? Yeah. Dan, what do you think? Uh, the, I think uh, Janine's right that there has been some uh, lessening in the American public of the initial uh, Snowden is a traitor stuff. Uh, but there are, there's clearly campaign going on uh, among people in power to paint him continually as a traitor. Uh, you know, books come out that have demonstrably false charges about him that the Wall Street Journal will play up and, and others who uh, want to portray him this way. Uh, I, I wish that, I wish everyone could see the movie Citizen Four and they have a chance to make up their own minds at some level about who he is. And uh, I'm, I'm troubled by what might happen to him. I, I, hope that, uh, the, I hope for the best, but like Janine, I haven't a clue where it's going to go. And you asked about uh, whether governments reflect their people. Um, I, all I can say here is that uh, the government doesn't reflect my views at the moment. <laughs> but I, you know, there are some tens, of, you know, some lots of millions for whom it does. I wonder if a big part of the normalization of the U.S. I'm not American, but um, of the American population towards state surveillance and that securitization rationale for it was that the bulk of that technology develop, technological capacity development with the state happened under the eight years of Barack Obama. And that that meant that the natural constituency who would have been pushed back against that in the Bush administration just didn't to the same degree because it was Obama telling them it was important. There was a degree of trust there. And I wonder with that apparatus now in the hands of someone like Trump and the mobilization against him, if, there, if and when there are abuses, there just might be more pushback against it this, under this president than the last. Charlie, may I make one request of the Italian investigative journalism community? Please uh, look into companies like Hacking Team in a really deep way. Uh, they're here in Italy. Just go from there. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Listen, I think we're running out of time, but I think we've covered an extraordinary range of this um, topic. And I think it is amazing when we're thinking about individuals like Assange and Snowden, and yet we're also talking about these huge superstructural forces as well. But in the end, to quote Janine Gibson, Investigative journalism is always best in opposition, and boy, are we in opposition. Um, I want to thank Janine Gibson, Dan Gilmore, Taylor Owen for their wonderful contributions. Thank you. Yep, we need to get out of here. Um,
One, two, three. Are we not quite ready? Uh, is that okay? Okay. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for coming. Um, hi, my name is Lila King. I lead news partnerships for Instagram based out of New York. Um, I, we have some fun things to share today. Uh, I'll run through that in just a second. But first, I wonder if you would indulge me. This is an Instagram for news session. So we should Instagram first. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot an Instagram of the room. So, and we're going to do a boomerang. Are you all ready? Does everyone know what a boomerang is? Okay, so when I say go, everyone make, make a subtle movement. You can lift your arms, peace sign, whatever you like, or just sit silently like objective journalist that you are. Okay, ready? One, two, three, go! Oh, that was very nice. Yeah, we got it. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> All right, I'm posting that. I'm posting that on Instagram under the location International Journalism Festival. All right, there we go. Beautiful. <laughs> Mission accomplished, okay. Um, good morning, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm excited to see so many faces here. Um, oh, oh, we have video. Uh, so welcome to the Instagram for News workshop. Um, my name is Lila King, I lead new, news partnerships for Instagram. What I thought we would do today is, uh, we've got a, a couple of different things. First, um, I brought some best practices and general guidelines for being successful on, on Instagram as a news organization. And then we have a really um, a special treat. We have Francesca Triani from Time Magazine here. Hi, Francesca. Um, who's going to join me and share a really, really amazing project that she's been working on on Instagram. And then, um, of course, leave lots of room for, for Q&A. And please, please feel free to stop me as we go and if you have questions in, in between, okay? Sounds good? All right. Excellent. Okay, so um, first up, just to set context a little bit about news on Instagram, the way this is structured, um, I spend a lot of time, especially in the United States, especially in New York, working with news organizations and journalists who are using Instagram to help them understand how to make the most of the platform and get the most value from it. And I get a lot of the same questions as I, as I travel around and see <laughs> visit newsrooms. So what I brought here is some of the top questions that I get and the answers to them, including some examples along the way. Um, so probably the first question and the broadest and maybe most obvious is, I'm a journalist or a news organization, why Instagram? Why, why focus there? Why put energy there? And I would say there are kind of, kind of uh, sort of three main answers. First is that there's a very large and growing community on Instagram. It's an incredibly compelling place to build your next generation of news audience. I mean, that you can see here, the platform is growing, growing like crazy, 600 million people active on Instagram every month. The, the, second, the second reason, the second thing to focus on is that Instagram is an incredibly rich source of storytelling and first-person experiences that can help tell the stories that, that you're working on. You can find, find people who align with almost any interest or beat in the world on Instagram who are sharing their own first-person experience. And, and then last, but certainly not least, Instagram is a, is a visual first medium and visuals as we all know are it can transcend the borders of language and geography and are becoming an increasingly important way to communicate with your audiences especially um especially younger audiences who say hello with the video it's a language that we as journalists need to learn to speak um so uh question number two so news on Instagram, what does it look like? Is, is Instagram a place for news? What works? Um, so I brought a few examples. First, naturally, visual news works on Instagram. That's maybe the most obvious. But then a, a few other characteristics that we find are very successful. 
Um, first, news on Instagram tends to be more successful when it's very personal. Um, I brought these examples because I think they, they do a really nice job of using a first-person perspective to help make sense of a big story. Um, this example on the left is from a, a very recent project from BBC Newsbeat. Um, they were covering the recent headline on uh, recent Brexit headline, the letter delivered, and you know Brexit is not the most visual story <laughs> in the world. Um, but what BBC did, which I thought was really smart, was went and found a couple of people and put them on camera, one who represented who was in support of Brexit and one who wasn't and asked them a set of consistent questions about what they thought and produced an Instagram story for their account that was really you know, shot on a mobile phone using, using the, the drawing tools and text tools that come inside the app and helping you see from one person's perspective, like give a little bit of color to that story. And then the example on the right, um, that's Anderson Cooper on the election night in, in the United States. I, I think the thing that makes these two examples really stand out is that they are both shot on a phone. They're not, it's not a whole lot of extra production value. It's not even objectively incredibly high quality video by you know, video and photography standards. But they're really intimate and close and personal and that's what makes them work. Um, the second thing that a lot of really standout Instagram projects have in common is that they're very is that they're collective. They represent not just one person's perspective or one organization's perspective, but a collective of the audience plus the organization together. Um, I, I love this example on the left. It's from Refinery Twenty Nine, a, a women's focused publication based in the U.S. Um, what they did was report on a story that happened right after the U.S. election. One of the subway stations in New York City started filling up with post-it notes. People put post-it notes with messages of, of hope or solidarity or uh, reflections and reactions to the election. And what Refinery29 did was tell a story on their Instagram about that exhibit that was crowdsourced and then invited their audience to add their own messages and then kept adding to their story there. Um, and the example on the right too um, is a super compelling project from the Hindustan Times um, where they actually used Instagram stories to teach a group of people, citizen journalists, to go out and collect other stories and bring them back together to tell a single story for, for their site. Um, and then the and then the third thing that really um, the third thing that stands out in Instagram news that is really compelling is that very often it's active. It's um, Instagram is a place where people, where individuals come to express their identities and become themselves. And often what we see in news on Instagram is that what breaks through tends to be not just the headlines and the thing that's happening but actually a, compel a call to action to do something about it. It's not necessarily the journalists themselves who are, who are making the call to action, but kind of inspiring people to get involved in a movement or express an opinion or uh, donate to a cause or, or declare themselves part of something. Um, the, so the, the third question uh, that I get all the time is, given the big audience on Instagram, given that it's growing, given that there's a, a lot of opportunity there, how do I get after that for myself? How do I grow my own audience? So I look at it a couple of ways. Um, first is to think about the search and explore tab in the Instagram app. Um, that is personalized for every individual user. It's meant to show you as an individual when you go there a set of things that you aren't yet following, but you might like based on other things that you're liking or following or acting on inside the app. So when you're thinking about how to make your own work show up on Search and Explore and how to grow your, grow your own following, you want to be sure you're there. And the, the simplest way to do it is to produce something for every section of that surface. So if you look at it, on the bottom it's photos, in the middle it's video, and at the top it's Instagram stories. I mean, really, that's, it's that simple. Produce a mix of photos and videos and Instagram stories, and that gives you that many more chances to show up there when the 150 million people who visit that surface every day uh, look at it. 
Um, a slightly different way to answer the same question is to look across the board at which, look at how publishers on Instagram are growing and what are the, the things that are common among publishers who are growing really fast. And there are really three fast growing publishers on Instagram in the news space are posting more frequently than publishers who are, who are growing more slowly. They're posting a higher percentage of their post mix that's video, and they have a much more precise offering. And what I mean by that is accounts that do one thing and do it really well tend to grow faster than accounts that try to do a lot of things. So uh, niche accounts, accounts that focus on one vertical or one beat or news for one region, um, tend to be more successful in growing quickly. Um, and then an example here, the Financial Times has done a really great job with this. Um, uh, toward the end of last year, the Financial Times became one of the fastest growing accounts on Instagram in the news space. And uh, you know, a couple of things that they were doing really well, one, they were, they were using location tags on their posts when they take place in a specific location. It seems really obvious in some ways, but I'm always surprised at how few news organizations are using the location tags. It takes two seconds. It's a great way to make sure your post is, is accessible to, um, to people who aren't already following you. Um, they started, um, for the FT, they started posting more frequently. And also, and I think this is important, they, the FT on Instagram, does what the FT is known for and what the FT does best. They're not posting a lot of travel photos or things that are a little bit outside, outside of their um, what you would expect from the Financial Times. They're really doing difficult stories, financial news, the kinds of things that are not necessarily the most visual, but they're translating them and making them visual with a lot of infographics, especially moving infographics. Um, Question number four out of five. So Instagram has added a lot of features lately. Uh, in August of last year, Instagram added Stories, which is an ephemeral, uh, ephemeral uh, storytelling platform. Instagram has added Live, and of course there are still feed posts. So when you think about covering a story, what do you do with all of those options? What goes where? Um, here's an example that I think uh, works well around the, the inauguration in the U.S. in January. Um, of course, every news organization was there, was trying to figure out how to tell the story. When you looked across the board at who was doing what on Instagram, I found um, on the left, this is an example from BBC News, this, is, um, this was a moment right before the it was right at sunrise and right before the events actually started and they went live from their account and it was a it was interesting it wasn't a it wasn't like there was something huge happening like actually there was nothing happening yet it was just literally the sun rising um but it was a moment for the reporter who was working on that account to pause and have a conversation with the people following it about what to expect for the rest of the day and kind of in some ways like stopping and marking the moment and having a, a collective experience and a collective conversation about what we were all about to watch. The example in the middle is from a local news organization out of Washington, DC. They used Instagram stories in a really smart way to take their viewers along with them in all the inauguration balls. It's, it was a nice way to say, We've got this awesome ticket. We're about to be somewhere really cool and interesting. Come along with us. We'll do this so that you can be here too. And then the example on the right is from a feed post. It's probably the, the classic Instagram. It looks sort of like Humans of New York. Um, someone went to the, the protest marches that followed the inauguration and took portraits of the people who were, who were marching and asked them why. Um, and they made some really lovely pieces that persist on that feed um, forever. And then fifth, last but not least, a question I get a lot. What are you guys working on? What's happening? What should we know about? What are the features that we should be using? So I just, I brought a few of the recent ones. Um, first, uh, just a few weeks ago, Instagram rolled out multi multiple posts, multiple media in feed posts. You can now add up to 10 photos and videos in a single post. It's a great way to be able to tell a longer story in a single post. 
Um, you can now save a live video. Live on Instagram is totally ephemeral. It goes away the moment you're done shooting. But you can actually save it now. So if you happen to be live and something really amazing happens and you want to keep it, you can save it. Um, third, this is really important. If, you, um, if you're on Instagram and you haven't turned on two-factor authentication, this is, my, this is the most important thing, the thing I hope you will take away. Please turn on two-factor authentication. It's a really easy way to keep your account safe. Um, number four, um, Instagram in the, in the past few months has spent a lot of time and energy investing in ways to make the platform safe and a safe place for expression. One of the things that we've rolled out is a set of comment controls. So you as a publisher can add your own list of words that, or even emojis that you don't want to appear in the comments on your posts. Um, you're also able to turn comments off if you like. So I know sometimes, sometimes a news story is hard to take. Sometimes conversation gets out of control. Sometimes you just want to say, time out, <laughs> let's take a break. Um, and you're able to do that now. And then last but not least, in, uh, we have recently rolled out insights for your account. If you're not using insights, you can easily add it by changing your account to a business profile. You just go to settings in the app, switch on business profile, and then you can see things like who your followers are, where they come from, what time of day they're most active. You can see which of your posts is resonating. You can uh, sort by different um, time frames and, and different metrics. So it, it's a good thing to turn on if you haven't. So uh, quickly, five things to remember. <laughs> Um, Instagram is a great place to build a young, engaged audience for news. Um, news on Instagram looks a little bit different from news in other places. It's very personal, it's collective, and it's active. Um, the secret to growth, or the, the three kind of formulas for growth are uh, post more frequently, make sure you are posting video, and have a very precise offering. Um, four, Real is better than perfect on Instagram. Resist the urge to overproduce. Shoot with your phone. Use the native app tools. And number five, if you haven't yet, please, please turn on two-factor authentication. It's simple and easy way to keep yourself safe. Um, so with that, I would be happy to take some questions. But first, I'm really excited to have here, um, look at that, Francesca Triani from Time Magazine. Um, Francesca, come up, come up. Um. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, awesome. Um, so a lot of the best practices we just looked at are really embodied in a project that Francesca and team have been working on at time. Um, uh, so maybe, maybe we could watch the trailer and yeah. then talk a little bit about it. I think this should work. Fingers crossed. So powerful. Um, so tell us, tell us about finding home. Yes. Um, first of all, thanks so much for having me here. We were very excited about talking, uh, finding home. Um, we are three journalists. Uh, I'm a video journalist at Time. I'm working with Lindsay Adario, world and out photojournalist, and with Aaron Baker, our Time correspondent. And we are following for one year three refugee babies and their families. All the women we are following traveled from Syria to Greece while pregnant. And um, we're all familiar with the images of refugees desperate coming to the shores of Lampedusa or Greece. But what we don't see usually is what it's like to then continue that journey and try to find a home in Europe. 
Um, so by now we've been with the families for five months. Um, we film uh, the birth of all the babies. Um, and now the families are waiting to find out which European countries will take them in. And what, one of the things uh, that makes the project really different is that you're, you're yeah. out reporting it. It's ultimately ending up in the magazine and on the Time website, but it's all happening first on Instagram. Yeah, so Time has never done something like this. Uh, instead of you know, gathering material, reporting, and then releasing at the end of it a magazine story or a documentary, we're actually reporting live on Instagram uh, what we're finding. Um, so um, everything we gather, all the photographs and video, we try to we post daily um, to update our readers on what's happening in the families' lives. Um, and when we started this project, we, find, we wanted to find a way to do long-term storytelling um, with short-term stories. Uh, and we already published in the magazine, um, we already published online, but we really wanted to use Instagram. It was the perfect platform for us because we're, first of all, visual, uh, to be able to basically keep a diary and experiment um, with what it's like to post as you go. So how does, how does like, <laughs> posting as you go make your reporting different or your storytelling? Well, um, we were very nervous initially because as journalists, you're used to keep all your sources secrets and all the information to yourself. So the, the final product is amazing. Uh, but it actually has been incredible. Uh, we had to learn how to film differently and how to report differently for Instagram. For example, we have been um, shooting the babies from above so you can see on the platform how they grow over time. Um, and we also... It's helped us a lot in terms of gathering our reporting because we see how people react to our stories as we're posting them. We had people ask incredible questions. Uh, we had people engage in a way that it doesn't happen when you're publishing a magazine and then it disappears or you're publishing a video online. Um, so in that sense, it's been very helpful. I love the example you shared. You, you, you're collecting lots of questions. I mean, obviously, people have tons mm -hmm. of questions. And then you used Instagram Live to answer them? Yeah. One of our most successful lives, um, we had a lot of questions from people. And we asked a refugee we know, a 17-year-old kid, to walk around the camp and introduce us to people and answer people quest people's questions. And that was incredible because... We were not there acting as filters. This kid, uh, who is super smart, speaks English, taught himself English while waiting to like, go to Europe, basically. Um, he introduced us to his friends and showed us the camp and responded to people's questions. And, you know, uh, from how do you use the internet in the camp to what do you do with your friends when you're 17 by yourself in the refugee camp. So uh, that was just one example. But... Um, <coughs> We've also had uh, people ask questions, and we do reporting based on those questions. We ask our uh, characters to answer questions that people submitted. Yeah. And, and one, of the, one of the women you're following is on Instagram herself. Yes. How, does, how does that work? <laughs> well, first of all, refugees, it's such a hot topic right now that obviously um, we, there is some concern of what it's like to talk about refugees on a public platform, but we found an incredibly supportive community. Uh, and we have people who comment every, and like everything we post, we share. And one of the women, she's a first time mom, her uh, name is Noor, and her family is under ISIS control, and she can't communicate with them often. And she's very active on Instagram, and I think she found a lot of purpose in seeing that people are following and that they care. When refugees arrived in Greece, they were in Idomeni camp at the border, and thousands of, of journalists came and told their stories. Like, there's a joke that we say, that the refugees say that every refugee has told, spoken with at least a journalist. They all have a journalist's like, phone number in their phone. <laughs> But nothing happened. Like, they feel as if nothing happened. No one cared. So when we showed up to the camp, most refugees asked us, why, why should we talk to you, right? 
And I think we kept coming back, and they saw on Instagram people caring. Like, they saw people commenting and, you know, uh, liking her outfits or asking her, um, you know, congratulating her if she got a move to a hotel. And um, I think it has helped, instead of hurting our access, being so public about our storytelling, it has helped us solidify our relationship with our subjects uh, because they trust our work. They see it every day. It's, um, it's, it's really uh, refreshing and wonderful to hear that like, the response has been positive. I mean, you told me, it, when we were chatting earlier, you told me an, an incredible example. Like, one of the families found out they're going to Estonia, yeah. and we're like, ugh. Well, <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> you know, we've been waiting. Like, basically, there's one phone call that every refugee is waiting for, and that's a phone call that tells them where in Europe they're going to end up. Most of them want to go to Germany or France. Um, and one family we have been following, uh, you know, we travel with them to find out where are you going to go. And when they came out of the asylum office, their faces were just like blank, you know? And they were like, Estonia? <laughs> and they didn't know where Estonia was, they didn't know how to pronounce it, they didn't know of anyone who lived there, any other refugee. And I think they were nervous about us posting their reaction on Instagram. Are people going to think we're not being grateful? Are people going to judge us for not being excited? Are Estonians going to see this and not be welcoming? Um, and I think, you know, we talked about it and we had a conversation about the importance of showing the challenges of refugee life, which is you don't know what's going to happen to you. You have no power over your future. And I think that helped them understand what journalism is. Um, and I think they saw people commenting from Estonia, don't be scared, it's cold here, but we're nice. Um, you know, tell us when you get here. So I think that's been fascinating for us. We were very worried and we were being very protective about them, but we realized that um, it was fine. <laughs> Um, and we'd be happy to take some questions too from the audience. Um, I'm a, I, one thing. One thing I, I'd love for you to share. I, I think it's interesting. You're doing uh, your work. Obviously, is journalism first. It's um, and very principled. There's also a lot of. You probably get a lot of comments with people wanting to help and yeah. wanting to do something. I know you've given some of your yeah. storytelling to NGOs who are working mm -hmm. with yeah. refugees. Like, how, how does that work? Well, uh, that's a good question. We are following uh, Time's very strict ethical standards and guidelines uh, when we're on Instagram the same way we would be for a magazine story. Uh, but usually what happens is when you do a documentary at their release, people want to know how to help, and you can direct them. Uh, we don't know of any other journalist who has had the problem of people wanting to help while you're reporting the story. We asked the community of documentary filmmakers we know, and they were all like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> but I think at the end of it, we decided to partner with the organizations who are actually helping right now in the field the refugees we're covering. So um, on Instagram, we organized a takeover with the ICRC uh, and the Red Cross. Um, and also, we are uh, funneling any requests for donations to uh, organizations that are already on the ground working with refugees. So the, um, w one thing I, I, I feel compelled to share, we, we've seen on uh, news accounts in particular, takeovers tend to work really well. It's that personal thing, like someone putting their face on a story and like talking directly to the audience, yeah. which is what you were essentially giving yeah. right, to the ICRC. And I think like for the ICRC, for example, they work with refugees and their biggest challenge is finding a way for people to connect with stories. And what we are doing is telling a very universal story. Everyone knows what it's like to worry for your family or have a child and worry for their safety. And I think we have seen a higher engagement than your regular account about refugees. Uh, it's a very hard topic to make people care about. Uh, and so we worked with organizations who do that for a living, to try uh, to have people care. 
Um, and you know, they helped us in terms of reporting and, and figuring out access, and we are trying to help them like get their message out. Yeah. I find um, one thing I, I think is so compelling about what you're doing on the Instagram account is that it's, it's not just the photos of, you know, the, the things that you tend to see like on the front page of, you know, the newspaper. It's, um, it's like what people are eating for lunch yeah. and like normal daily life struggles, right? It's just so much more relatable in that way. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is the whole idea of the story. Mm -hmm. Like we want people to really see what it's like to be a refugee. And a lot of times it's waiting and cooking and hanging out and waiting <laughs> and cooking and hanging out. Like, and one of the biggest things we found that we didn't expect, uh, when, we met, when we met all the women we're covering, they lived in a refugee camp uh, outside of Thessaloniki. And when the winter came, they were moved to a hotel. And most people would think that's an improvement. It is an improvement. Like they are sheltered, they're in a hotel, they have hot water but they completely lost community. They're in the middle of nowhere, separated from all their friends, from all their family, and especially young moms are alone in a room with a baby all day. So we've seen, and NGOs told us, that they've seen very high rates of depression and anxiety. Um, and so on Instagram, we were able to show that, I think in a way that it's harder to do in a magazine story. Like I can tell you that they're bored and that they're lonely, but I think on Instagram you see their lives, you know, in their simplicity in a way that is a lot more direct. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes it easier for people to connect, um, you know, when, like, we posted recipes that they cooked and people, like, asked us about it, like, um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and you're doing it... Uh, both on a separate account, Finding Home, mm -hmm. at Finding Home, for those of you who'd like to follow the project, it's amazing, um, and the Time account. How do those yeah. two work together? Well, we, uh, every time there's a bit of concrete news, we post on the Time account. The Time account, I think, has four million followers, so we already know. I mean, Time has a, had a long history of supporting uh, journal, vis visual journalism, um, and so, for example, when there's breaking news, we post on the Time account. Um, and we keep the Finding Home at the account as a daily diary, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. Questions from, from the room? Any? Sure. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you, good morning. Um, I'm very touched by a project, so it's a bit difficult to ask a kind of nasty question, but I <laughs> imagine that you get that also more often. Um, why should I have also Instagram and not just use Facebook, Facebook Live? I mean, why did you go for Instagram? And also perhaps for you, what are the I mean, reasons why we should also go for Instagram? Well, it's a great question. I mean, uh, when we started, we had no doubt Instagram would be the best platform for us. There's just an appreciation for good visual storytelling on Instagram that you can't find anywhere else. There's also a community of people. Like, we have followers that are engaged every single day. Like, Gail from Arizona, right, comments every single thing we post. Um, and it really is unique in terms of how you can experiment while keeping an audience. Um, we, there's really no other uh, platform for that, like where you can post something every day and have people comment in a way, in a space that is also very safe. Um, when you're talking about refugees, I think you have to think about that too. I mean, I would, I would echo those things. Like it's, it's about visual storytelling and storytelling that leads with visual. So like if that's the kind of project that you're working on, like then Instagram is the natural place to do it. Um, oh, I saw a question here. Hi. Hi. Um, so obviously Instagram is a very kind of self-contained platform that you've got the opportunity to put external links in uh, your bio and in some bits of stories. Um, so I'm just looking at the Finding Home account now and it's great. Um, and uh, I see that you've got a sort of standalone web page with 
like um, sort of summaries and longer form pieces um, on the families that you're following. Um, so how do how does that kind is there a kind of tension between the um, pieces that you put on more traditional places on the internet and the way that you're telling the story on Instagram um, and how successful have you been in kind of using Instagram as a platform to redirect users to other places where they can get more information? That's a great question. We think Time has a lot of publishing platforms and we think of them completely differently. The people who read Time magazine on print are not the people usually who go on Instagram and they're often not the people on Facebook, and they're not, they're not the people on Twitter. Uh, so there's no tension. Like, when uh, every time we come back from our reporting trip, we publish a big spread with, with beautiful photography on the magazine. The same way uh, we publish, the first issue of this year was a cover with the four babies. Like, each baby had a cover. Um, and we also, talk about the story on Twitter from the main time account and we tell the story on Instagram. So in that sense, time has, I think, has been leading in that sense of having video, photography, and print work together in different spaces. Um, I think that's helping us a lot instead of hurting us. I think people from Instagram go to the Finding Home page uh, in a way that is different than people from Facebook going to it. But we've published on Facebook, too, the trailers, yeah. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, to both of you, uh, how do you judge the, um, the kind of interaction you have with your readers and with people following um, profiles on, on Instagram um, as far as the stories are concerned, since you, you, the stories cannot be uh, shared and you cannot like the stories? Hmm. Like, I'm, yeah, so I, I, I think I'm understanding your question right like how are you measuring success or like thinking about success in stories um, I'd be curious to hear how your, your answer to this I find that I mean, there, there are literally two things you can see you can see the number of views in stories and, the, and DMs direct messages so when people reply to your story I think um, one thing I hear a lot from news organizations across the board is that they look at um, the completion rate on a story and as a as a measure of how successful they are in in bringing people along and and sustaining interest and engagement over the course of multiple posts. And you know you can see when you look at your insights, you can see if people just looked at the first post and then you know and then skipped to the next thing, or if they stayed. Um, that tends to be kind of a measure of like the quality of storytelling and the and degree you're able to like keep someone interested. How does, yeah. how does that match what you see? Well, I think, first of all, at the beginning, I think we <laughs> did a lot of mistakes and we realized that what was not working. Uh, every time that we posted things that were personal, um, every time that the caption talked was from our own uh, point of view, or every time we included direct quotes from the subjects, we found a level of engagement that was much higher. Um, the same thing with lives. Like we've had lives that were not as successful, people weren't as, as engaged. I think, for example, for a live, for us, uh, we felt that like walking in a space and like bringing people to, to a place was more interesting because you have the inherent tension of wanting to see what's gonna happen. Uh, that was very successful for us. Um, and we started from zero and we have now a community that is following and you know people are asking me what's going on with Helen what uh, when are they flying to Estonia like you know I think that's a level of engagement that you don't really see in a magazine usually or even on Facebook uh, so that's a big success for us Do you, you you mentioned this like you mentioned what's successful, like, and you you learned because you made mistakes. Would you be willing to share, like, what's one thing that you tried that just like didn't work? It's often helpful to hear the mistakes too, right? Uh, well, I think well, we when we did lives, this is just for us. I think when we did lives where we were on camera, we're not as successful. <laughs> I think we're not on camera people. <laughs> we are like love be being behind the camera. Uh, so that was not great, but we've seen that working much better on Facebook, like uh, than Instagram. Um, 
we've also uh, some of the things that we found successful that we never thought of doing like kind of like by mistake I posted a photo that one of the women sent me from Syria of her hometown in their Azor and that was something that people like even the photo was a bit crappy like they just like love seeing where these people are from um, so that was a bit of an experiment that happened by accident um, at the beginning, like we started sharing photos of us in the field, and we've seen people react to that a lot. They, for some, for this story, they're interested about who we are as well. Like, and as a journalist, usually that's something you don't want to do to be part of that story. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you have another question? Thank you. Um, as you showed also in the examples or with uh, your project, um, social media, Instagrams, visual stories uh, on that kind of media are um, probably uh, more personalized. They, they are better to be narrow focusing, as you said before. Mm -hmm. But it, it is not pushing a limit between uh, entertainment and journalism in favor of the entertainment. And w what is the limit for a, a visual journalism deal with short story and Instagram between these two kinds of different language? That's a very great question. I actually had someone else ask me, like, what are you, what's different? Like, are you doing a TV live show of their lives? Like, I think that's a very legitimate question. Um, I think we use the same journalistic standards and we use so much reporting behind what we do like um that it's not that at all like we try not to show it <laughs> but you know to get asked like no journalist had permission to film in the camp when we were there it took us months to get permission to film in the hospitals to get that shot of the birth we had consent from all the doctors um a lot of the information of the numbers that we share on the account took weeks of reporting to find um, and access that no one else has at the moment. So I understand how it looks simple and pretty on the page, but we are using the same tools that we would be using as if we were publishing on a print magazine. It's just a different platform. Yeah, I think that's an important point. I mean, it's it's almost a different language or a different set of like tools for communicating a story. But what makes Finding Home so successful, I think, is that it's you're using like all the same like rules and principles and like doing capital J journalism, but translating it for a different platform that has a different sensibility. Yeah, and one for example, we met with the International Organization for Migration, and if I were to talk about that meeting for a print story. I will have a bunch of numbers that I'm sharing that are boring. There is 11,000 refugees. They finally made their way to Europe. There's 15,000. They're waiting there uh, for, to travel there, blah, blah, blah. But the way we did it is that we said, we talked about how we had a meeting. Yesterday, we met with IOM. This is all the news we got. Like, it was a lot more informal. Um, and I think, in a way, people remember those numbers better maybe and they stop for a few more seconds like at a time when we're trying to get people to engage we found that people care a lot more about the numbers if they know the, pe the people associated behind those numbers and they stop and they ask us about it in a way that sometimes the news stories can't do Thank you. Uh, I've got a question for both of you. I, I feel a bit bad asking you about this because what you're doing is so worthy and I don't want to actually ask this topic, but I don't feel bad asking Instagram. I want to ask about <laughs> monetization and, and, you know, these social networks, Facebook, but Instagram in particular, are great for audience building, for storytelling, but ultimately, whether you're a large multinational media organisation or you're a small and independent, you need to make money. And, just sort of curious what your views are on how Instagram can lead to a monetization strategy. Um, I suppose particularly when we're in a landscape where Facebook and Instagram are actually trying to charge publishers to push their content higher. It's almost going the opposite to how it used to be. So a broad, slightly tricky question, but I'd be curious to hear your, your broad, tricky thoughts. Thanks. 
Yeah, I mean, on the on the Instagram side, um, Instagram uh, has is is has been around, you know. Uh, not quite as long as Facebook, and Facebook has, has been making strides. I and mean, we've certainly been looking at, for example, um, what Facebook has done with a, a branded content policy, uh, for example. Um, and those are the kinds of things we're thinking about, how to, what is the right way to do that at Instagram, what makes sense. Um, at the moment, um, at the moment, I, I think the best advice for a publisher is to think about and focus on developing an audience. Um, and you know, at Instagram, we're certainly uh, working on on what to do on our side as well. <laughs> well, for us, well, it's not my job to think yeah. about the money, <laughs> first uh-huh. of all. <laughs> but um, I have to say that because we're trying to experiment so much on a new platform, we were able to get grant money uh, from the Pelletier Center, uh, which is a well-renowned institution in the U.S. Uh, for those who are you were not familiar, and that's not something that you get easily for other types of reporting. Um, And also, I mean, we just look at platform, for time video, Instagram is just part of it. We have a lot of other sources of revenue, Uh, so obviously we wouldn't be able to do it if we only did this on one platform. We're just diversifying, I guess. Actually, I, I have a, a question for the room. Actually, I'm, I'm one of the things that uh, one of the things that I do is spend a lot of time with news organizations and journalists, helping them understand how to be successful on Instagram. But at the same time, I take a lot of feedback back to the product teams um, on what journalists and newsrooms would like to see from Instagram. I'm, I'm just curious: is if anyone would be able to be willing to share, if you could wave your magic wand and change one feature on Instagram or add one feature that would help you do your do your job more successfully, what might that be? Um, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, of course. Hang on. <laughs> um, frankly, I work for a very small um, regional news network as a social media and online news editor. Yep. And we are not allowed to post links in our Instagram posts because we're so small and our account has not officially been validated. Um, That's definitely, we try to change that uh, because obviously, especially for a smaller organization, it's very valuable to be able to connect links um, to your posts, um, which we and many other um, regional and smaller independent journalists right now can't do. So that would be something... If there's a way to work around that, that would be wonderful. Great. I, I would say too, like you to you and anyone else in the room, we um there is a Facebook and Instagram help desk that's literally right around the corner. So come and follow up. Let's let's talk about that. Um there. I'll be there all afternoon if anyone has other Instagram questions. Um anyone else wish list thing you would love to see? <clears throat> Changeably, and oh, I, um, I'm from a news organization in Atlanta. Um, we use Snapchat and Instagram interchangeably, and um, I think it's we found that it's more difficult to post text quickly on Instagram stories because there's no just text line feature. It has to it always covers the content. Does that make sense? It's a random one. So would you um, uh, tell me what you would love to see? Um, more of like a uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stand up. Um, more of a just being able to sort of type and have it sit over a box instead of right now it's um, you can post and then it's living in a big white box, yeah. um, which covers the visual that we're trying to show. So we've had a lot of trouble with that just in the field trying to get it to you know work. So that would be great. <laughs> Cool. Thanks for that. Is it one tip for you and for anyone else who struggles with the same thing? There's a if you update your app to the latest version, there's a, a new feature that will put a transparent uh, color behind the text so that you can still see what's behind it, but also um, you know add whatever context you need with the text. So um, if you'd like, come by the help desk, desk later. I'll show you how it works. Awesome. Any other questions or? or Wish list items from anybody in the room? <coughs> yeah? Hi, uh, 
And visual storytelling has uh, uh, Instagram overcome Snapchat, uh, in your opinion? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, would you mind repeating the question? About, about visual storytelling. Um, Instagram is uh, uh, more effective than uh, Snapchat in the, at that moment with stories, live, uh, and other features. Um, I, I don't know if I've... I've, I've if I, that's exactly the way I would answer it. I mean, I think uh, Instagram with stories and live and with the feed posts, the combination of things makes a really compelling way to tell a big story and go deep, like something you've seen in Finding Home for sure. Um, and we're certainly continuing to roll out new features constantly and explore uh, new ways to use it. I think it's, um, it's a really exciting time to be telling stories on it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, yes. Oh, sorry, just a. Yeah, sure. I know everybody asked a question. Just wanted to add a suggestion. That you're yeah, asking please. For. I'd love to be able to schedule natively within mm, yeah. the app. Sorry. Uh, I mean, scheduling is quite important for what I do, and I have to use an external app to do it, and I feel like it has an effect that's not good, and so on. So, especially from desktop. Sorry, yeah, scheduling from desktop would be amazing. Please. <laughs> I've heard you. Yes, thank you. Um, you probably won't be surprised to hear that's a pretty, that's a pretty common request. Um, one thing, I, I, I'm curious how, how you do this, Francesca. I would also add there's... Um, it's not quite a scheduling tool, but there is a relatively new feature that lets you save a draft post, which you can do, you know, Friday afternoon if you want to save a bunch of drafts for the weekend or something like that. Um, it's a it's a baby step in that direction, but I, I certainly hear you on that. Is it how how do you do it? For yeah, many I um, I save as drafts, and then uh, I have external apps that help me. One of the tips that you actually gave me a while back was very helpful. Like I. I mean, I do other things in addition to Instagram as a journalist, so uh, it was helpful for me to focus an hour of the day every day to just thinking about scheduling and responding to comments uh, instead of having to worry about it throughout my day. Uh, but I mostly try, if I can, to schedule ahead the whole week um, and then post something every day. And I try to post at the same time uh, to maximize U.S. audience and European audience. Um, okay, I think uh, I'm getting I'm getting the signal. I think we're out of time. Um, I, I appreciate your questions. I also appreciate your uh, your feature requests. Uh, I promise I will take that back to our product team. And if anybody has additional questions or or anything, we're um, the Facebook and Instagram space is just right around the corner. Come by, have a coffee, get some help on Instagram. We'll we'll be there this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, so thank much. you to Francesca. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
the delay. Let's okay. go. It's complicated. <laughs> Hello, thank you all for coming. This is a session on investigative journalism, how technology has empowered it, which um, is uh, hosted by the Google DNI Fund. Um, just to introduce everybody that is here on this panel, if I start uh, on my far left, uh, we have um, Alison Gao, who is from the UK and is the innovation editor for Trinity Mirror, which is the UK's largest newspaper group, and obviously more than newspapers these days. Um, then we have uh, Stefan Candia, who is the founder of the European Investigative Collaborations Organisations. I have Pavla next to me, who is from the Centre for Investigative Journalism in the Czech Republic. And to my right, my colleague on the DNI Fund, Ludovic Blischer, who um, prior to, to that was also the digital champion at La Liberation and uh, a fellow at the uh, Newman. So we're going to kick off this morning, if it's okay with you, with uh, a brief introduction about uh, the DNI fund and the investigative reporting things that we are funding through that scheme that aren't in the room. And then we're going to uh, go to each of our panelists and they're going to tell us a little bit about the work they do in this field. And then obviously we want to very much open this up to, to you, um, take all your questions. Um, so please, uh, let's, let's get going. So I'll hand you over to Ludo. Okay, so br very briefly, I'm going to introduce the DNA Innovation Fund because I think it's important to give you a glimpse of what we are doing with the fund. Uh, do you all know what is the Digital News Initiative and the DNA Innovation Fund or not? Okay, so let's assume you know. But uh, the, the DNA Innovation Fund is part of a broader initiative, broad um, upon three, built upon three pillars. The one is product. The other one is research and training, and the third one is innovation. Innovation is all about stimulation. And this digital news initiative is Google framework for dialogue with the news ecosystem. Through the innovation pillar, what we are trying to do is to help the news ecosystem to test new ideas, to their taking risk, and to come with project about innovation. It's not about modernization, it's really about innovation and stimulation. Aim of the fund is again, stimulate the news ecosystem. We've made available 150 million euro over three years for projects that demonstrate new thinking in the practice of digital journalism or that support the development of new business model. Everyone that have idea for news can apply to the fund. The fund is very broad and open. 32 European countries are eligible to apply, and it's open to startup, individuals, journalists, broadcaster, legacy media. That's very broad and open. It's about having ideas, having projects, be specific, be in depth, and trying to tackle big challenges the news ecosystem is facing, and investigation is one of those. So we are very glad that you're going to talk more about your project. Very briefly, we have three tracks. One is for big ideas that have assumptions to be tested is the prototype track, up to 50K, and we found 100% of, um, uh, of the amount of funding requested, again, up to 50K. And then we have medium and large project, up to 1 million euro funding, and medium and large are open only to company with at least one journalist on staff. Prototype is open to everyone. Um, we get in 2016, 2,300 yeah. uh, 2, yeah. application coming from 30 European countries. At the end of the day, we selected last year 250 projects for 51 million euros across 25, uh, 27 European countries. So there is a lot of traction. We receive a lot of projects. We're having a lot of interaction and discussion with publishers. And at the end of the day, we always make a very tough, earth-breaking uh, decision. So it's important, if you want to apply, to have in mind that 
the application process in itself is an opportunity to step back, build your vision, brainstorm with your team, and have a project that you are proud of. Difference between uh, the two rounds we had last year was in terms of quality. First round, we had a lot of projects, a bit less on round two, but much more that were high, very, very quali qualitative, and much more collaborative project and collaborative effort, and especially uh, for investigation. What we've tried to do is to organize through clusters the type of project we received. And that's very complicated because innovation is by default something new. And no one tried to really organize uh, all the type of projects. So we created some kind of clusters. One is intelligence, data and management and workflow, interface and discovery, social and community, somehow about business model distribution and circulation. Um, and the two more, I would say, trending category, the one we receive uh, the, m most of the project is about intelligence. It goes to audience development, semantic, analytics. The other one is next journalism. Next journalism is very big and broad. It goes from fact-checking to gamification, that data journalism, robot journalism, audio development, and uh, new format. Um, and uh, one of these, of course, is investigation. And this is where I, whoops, sorry. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> I made it. This is where I give you the floor to talk more about investigative projects. Um, thank you for the five minute signal. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to talk today uh, purely about investigative journalism. Um, this, this quote sort of caught my eye because um, I, I believe this. Uh, without investigative journalism, really, um, the, the whole the whole thing of journalism is probably uh, will fall apart. So, um, I was just very taken with this uh, quote. And I thought I'd like to share it with you. Um, in uh, the work that we've done on the DNI, we've actually had um, now ten. Uh, investigative journalism projects that we're funding. Um, we look forward to receiving more in the next round. Um, I've, I've put there just some details that I just sort of pulled together having a look at them. And one thing that surprised, surprised me, and is perhaps a bit of a talking point for later, is that why are all ten from non-profit organisations? <coughs> Um, the, the variety of projects, the variety of countries is very broad. Uh, as you can see, they're everywhere from UK, Romania, Italy, Finland, and the Netherlands are interested in investigative journalism. So some of the things that aren't in the room, but you may uh, know a little bit about. Um, anybody here went to the uh, Jeff Jarvis Trump panel at the beginning of the week? Anybody? Yeah, so you'll have seen there... Um, uh, Ghia from the Italian uh, uh, investigative reporting project. Uh, she spoke uh, a little bit about it there. But their project is mainly, uh, uh, it's called the Mafia Files, which is a catchy title, but is uh, mainly looking at archiving how public, how public money is used and spent in Italy. Um, it's a prototype. That's one of our, our smaller sort of projects, but it's 50,000 euros that uh, they'll be able to explore that issue more deeply. Uh, one from, from my home country, the UK, uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, uh, we are supporting. This is actually our biggest uh, award in this area. Um, and they are looking at how to... Um, really help local journalists, journalists on the ground and grassroots, to use data in investigative journalism. And so they've only just started work, um, but they, their project is sort of getting underway, and I think it will get a lot of news headlines one to look out for, really. Um, back uh, d over to Romania, and uh, this project from the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting project. I love the names of all these investigative things because they're so straightforward. They tell you exactly what they are, don't they? Um, but it's crime and corruption reporting, and uh, these people actually want to find a sort of white label solution to looking into uh, public expenditure and uh, how to uh, follow that through. And finally, um, not quite finally actually, next but finally, um, from the Netherlands, uh, again, follow the money, 
tells you what they're going to do. That organisation's actually been up and running for a while. It's a non-profit um, based in the Netherlands. And they want to uh, develop a sort of gamification, if you like, how to involve their subscribers more. They're mostly subscription-funded, and uh, their, their readers are also the people that take part in their investigations. So how can they provide them with some interesting kind of tools to, in order to do that and to deepen the engagement they have there? Um, and finally, from, from the UK again, um, Bellingcat, which is probably something that most people in this room have heard of. Um, they do a great deal of verification, investigation, um, at, at, in all sorts of uh, places. But this particular thing they're doing at the moment uh, is part of an archive for conflict investigation. Um, and they've created... I won't play it out here because the video's a bit... Uh, but um, if you have a, a look on, on, on YouTube uh, for Bellingcat, you'll find this Syrian archive, which is an absolutely fascinating document, documented um, video about the work they're doing there. So that's it from us. We're going to hand over now to uh, the good people on this panel. Uh, but before we go, we are available after this uh, for any questions. But basically, the deadline for this is the 20th. Um, please do find us out after. All right, I'm going to hand over first to... <clears throat> okay, so I'm not going to talk about uh, Czech Center for Investigative Journalism as the uh, topic was how actually investigative journalists use different digital tools. So I'm going to, to show you, hopefully, yes, uh, I'm going to show you what uh, are my favorites. And there are not many of them. Usually the problem is that actually uh, we as investigative journalists, we are quite often approached by different uh, tech companies who want to help us. But usually um, it doesn't work. Uh, so we actually had to uh, first really strictly define what do we need. And then we were actually able to tell the tech companies what do we need. So, we can split the technical tools we use into three main categories. The first one, we have to deal with security. So, the first tools I would like to mention that I like and that I use, uh, it's encryption. Encryption on your cell phone and encryption of your emails. Even though the emails are kind of old school, still we use them uh, and we encrypt them. So PGP or GNU-PG encryption is a combination with uh, Thunderbird. It's my favorite on a cell phone. We use Signal as it had proven to be the best one so far. Uh, then the second category, I'm going to show you a little bit more, are actually how we deal with the big chunks of data because sometimes we've got like hundreds of pages of hard copies. Imagine that someone leak you a hard copy court folder of 800 pages and you have no idea what's in it. The names, uh, and you are not ready to read it. You don't have a time to do it. So what we have and what is like really great tool, it's for free and it's online, is actually investigative dashboard with a new feature that actually keeps me, uh, keeps my discipline on. And that is that uh, you've got six different pillars of this investigative dashboard and actually my favorite is search your stuff. You can upload the scans that are not indexed uh, to this platform and you can keep the documents indexed. You can search them afterwards. You can find the keywords and you can actually match it against <laughs> other company records that are already there or you can match it against different names and you will see which other investigative journalists already worked or covered this issue and you can actually check with them uh, what did they find, if can you use what did they find. And uh, the best feature, I'm not sure if Fred is here. Yeah, he is. I'm not sure if it is. He's the developer, so actually I'm just doing PR of investigative dashboard. <laughs> it's um, entity extraction, what means even if you will upload 800 pages, if you give you, it will give you the names of the entities that are there. Is it already on or are you, Fred, still developing it? 
it's on. So, okay, people, go upload, and then you, you will have a great tool how to search your own documents. Apart from searching your own documents, you have access to, to a lot of love, a lot of love, business registries data, what means company ownerships, uh, different scans of uh, such a things as are, for example, um, gazettes, business gazettes, what means those are the data that you can't find online because they are only offline. Someone <coughs> took the job, scan it, so you can now search it. Uh, and you can get a different chunks of data, you can search different land registries. So that's it, that's what we, we are using and that's what we need. Then what we, else for, what we also use for communication, and I'm using one of my projects, is a talk. It's kind of a simplified Slack, and I like it more because, once again, it keeps me more focused on the things I'm doing. I can invite other people to create the channels. I can check what did they discover. I can assign them tasks and so on. And actually the last one, and that's usually the problem is the tech companies, they are often coming to us that they will give us a tool that will analyze the links between different entities, including phone calls, including uh, business, including family relations, that we just need to give them the data in Excel and then we will see the links. But actually that's, that's not the way it works for me because I need to be able to stand for my investigation. What means I need to be able to go to the court and explain what are the links. And if those links are generated by the machine, I won't be able to explain like, yeah, this is clear because she's a wife of this businessman and if she's actually in a public tender and at the same time a close friend of this businessman, then we can, by circumstantial evidence, say this and this or assume this and this. And actually, if those links are generated by machine, we can't use them. That's why we got this very simple thing we call this, where you can actually draw, your, uh, draw, draw the links yourself and you will be quite aware what does it mean and you will be able to explain it. Yeah, those were my five minutes. Thank you. So, S Stefan, do you want to tell us a bit about the work of the European Investigative Collaborations that you co-founded? Co uh, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. So I wear uh, several hats, and uh, European Investigative Collaborations is the last uh, um, initiative. It's a, uh, it's a partnership that I started with the Spiegel in Germany. But actually my initial um, affiliation is the Romanian Center for Investigative Journalism and uh, I'm working with it, it's a non-profit in Romania, for the last 15 years in investigative stories across borders. Mostly it was organized crime at the beginning. And I kind of seen and witnessed um, technology <coughs> developing, um, investigative journalists trying to develop technology or trying to partner up with uh, technologies to develop tools they need for the last 15 years and it's, it was quite fast but you think, think about that I started in a newsroom in Romania where there were no computers, there were only uh, typewriters. So <clears throat> it's a really uh, long stretch, uh, long journey. I've been witnessing how uh, data, uh, um, yeah, data exchange yeah, infrastructures uh, have been uh, uh, growing. Um, how journalists were using uh, whatever was available um, uh, to buy, and then they started to customize some of the stuff where it was possible. And now in the latest years, people do uh, develop their own tools, like you've just seen, in <clears throat> different groups, in different ways, with different uh, architectures, but in a way with the same goal in mind. Uh, you have these two big uh, uh, problems you have to solve, is the um, management of the data that you want to look at in a group and it's the uh, information exchange <clears throat> that the group has to uh, be communicating fast about findings across different countries and uh, different uh, places where they are located and that can be a group of five people or it could be a huge uh, group like uh, the ICAJ Panama Papers for hundreds of people. The Ike um, uh, group it's a bit less than 100 journalists working uh, <clears throat> on different topics in parallel, on different stories. The latest one was Football Leaks, and I uh, talked about it yesterday um, more in detail. But what I would uh, like to <clears throat> talk more about now is um, 
while doing this uh, these tools of uh, of uh, support for investigative journalism we, we also realized that um, the way we construct these tools to to function this is also the way we kind of shape our um, community of journalists working together so um, I was starting to look at uh, ways to uh, actually decentralize these uh, tools that we are using for cross-border investigations instead of centralizing them in one place. So it's a bit of a different approach. Uh, I, I, I see the, the needs for having and maintaining a platform where everybody goes and you can just uh, make a good security of that platform and you can uh, administrate that place. I'm trying to do to work now with uh, my colleagues on a, on a different approach where we decentralize this to a point that um, every journalist who, or every person who wants to be part of the project would have a box that would um, have this uh, bundle of tools. And this is actually um, a project that it's one of the projects that has been financed by, um, it's been endorsed by the Innovation Fund, and it's called Liquid Investigations. And the idea is to bundle on an arm board on a small mini computer, uh, these few uh, apps we are using constantly. Uh, that are growing or already existing apps that have uh, communities of developers behind them. And these are the chat. We use Rocket Chat. We use free software um, uh, to bundle on it. Um, Rocket Chat that does have uh, the OTR for um, encrypted communication, the pads. People are editing in groups on, on pads. The wikis and um, creating the wikis, it's creating our knowledge base. And we add two things um, that we played with in the last years. We develop our own search uh, index and search engine called Hoover, and we put on top of it um, uh, annotations. We are using hypothesis annotation um, that it's a protocol, I think, originally developed by the Open Knowledge Foundation, um, where you can um, interact directly with the documents by annotating them and leave a mark for the others who are coming to the same document. Uh, we are playing with integrating uh, robots to communicate when annotations are done into the chat so that we can uh, have an overview who's doing what and on what topic. And basically this is the idea of liquid investigations. We try to put all of that into a small box that we can give to, to the journalist and we are working on the communication protocols between the boxes so that we have uh, decentralized and almost peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication from small to bigger groups. And I'm drawing here, like we have several partners in this. Um, one of them, this is where, where I think the idea started, one of them is uh, uh, considering that technology, it's, it's politics by other mean, means. So we had that in mind when, when designing this, uh, this, uh, this project with the specific goal in mind to de democratize and make easier and uh, cheaper uh, the um, cross-border investigations groups. And I think, yes, we will test that and we are testing that and we are drawing from the experience I have in various networks uh, that I'm part of, That's including great. Ike. And but can, can just closing. On that in a minute? Yeah, yeah, just closing it. <laughs> and I think this tool could be used also by others than just journalists in ad hoc investigations. Okay, thank Thanks. you. And, and finally, just for introduction, uh, back to Alison. Um, uh, I mean, we know you work with a lot of uh, local news teams. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about their, how they're incorporating investigative work into what they do. Sure. So I think the thing with um, local journalism, and I'm not saying that this is true in the industry, but certainly from an outside perspective, there is a general view that you don't get good quality investigative journalism in uh, local titles, and I, I think that's just such rubbish. Um, most of the really great stories that you see appearing on um, broadcast TV or actually in the nationals originated from uh, a local journalist knowing something and digging deeper in it. So I, I really think, you know, there is so much great work doing in, going on in our newsrooms. Um, and I work across kind of all of Trinity Mirrors regionals, um, so I kind of see some of the things that, that's going on and sometimes I get involved and help with it. There are some kind of fundamentals that we need in our, um, in our, in our journalism, uh, and that is if we're using tools, uh, we don't have massive budgets, so they've got to be cheap or, or free. 
and intuitive because people haven't got a lot of time to spend on these tools. They've got to be really helpful and useful and relevant, not just tools for the sake of it. So actually we do tend to use um, most of the free suite of tools that exist on the internet that anybody can kind of find, use and, and download or get into. Um, where we need to, we will build our own. We, we have an internal search and trends dashboard, for example, called Hive Alpha, that, uh, that really helps our journalists dig into what the audience is kind of looking at on our sites or actually on external sites um, and how, the, how long they're interacting with it and the sort of stories that matter to them as well as social trends that they can pick up on and that's all in real time. So we, we do build tools but mostly we use others. Um, so some of the things that we use, if it's useful to touch on those... Um, Around sort of geo tools, we will use a lot of the Google suite. So um, Google Earth and Street View, really important to us, especially around historic things. Um, looking at, for example, how an area has changed in Google Earth um, over the years. Uh, got a great story out of it around um, the shrinking of cultivated areas, for example, on, on a, a <coughs> an area in the northwest that showed that green spaces that people were managing were actually in decline. And what that actually translated to was the complete collapse of the farming industry in that area. And you could see it from an aerial perspective in a way that perhaps the data wouldn't have told you. So actually help, it helps people visualise. And then you can also make fly-throughs with Google Earth that let the reader see what you're doing. Uh, we use Street View a lot um, around our investigations, particularly around verification when we get kind of stories sent in to us. So that's, that's a really useful one. And other kind of geo tools that we use, uh, obviously tweet deck searches, which people will be familiar with, with geo codes or, or advanced Twitter search. And we, we do use data miner, which I think is a, a paid for tool, but that's excellent around breaking news. And some of the other things that we use are um, Google Trends, uh, historic, obviously, and can show uh, how a mood uh, or a search pattern has changed over the years. We use that a great deal, and particularly now it's come down to a more granular level. It's more useful to our regional newsrooms. Um, and on survey, we do a lot on surveys, um, and they are particularly brilliant at, ask, at getting the readers involved in your investigations. So we might use Google surveys, or we might use SurveyMonkey. Um, but that whole kind of putting your journalism out there and asking the reader to get involved in an idea that you've had so you can investigate it with their help it is uh, really empowering and brings the brand closer to the audience as well. Um, we've just done one in Manchester around kind of life, living, health, mental health, all sorts of things, and I think there were over 5,000 responses on that from local people who wanted to talk about their experiences in the Manchester Evening News in that area will dig deeper now with those people's kind of buy-in in, into the issues that matter to them. Uh, in Wales, we asked readers um, about a particularly dangerous stretch of road, help us investigate some of the accidents that happened there, help us investigate how we could solve those problems and how they'd be funded. And they actually, the answers that people came back with were so um, comprehensive and interesting um, that the Welsh Government took that as a document and is working from it now to try and implement some of the changes. So it was actually investigative journalism at a local level that affected change. Um, and finally, uh, just a quick one. We've got Google DNI funding for an Internet of Things connected news initiative. But as part of that, I've been working with guys who uh, work in uh, maker communities. And from that, we're now looking at doing investigations with drones and sensor journalism. So you might not have the expertise in your newsrooms, but there are people in your communities who will do. And uh, I would say if you can... You know, connect with universities, with their innovation labs, and, and just start thinking about how wearables and nearables, the sensors that you can put in the world and that will collect data around, whether that's kind of particulate data for pollution or movement data around kind of urban traffic, that sort of thing, I think, is going to become more and more important to our journalism. I'm really interested in doing a pollution um, investigation around schools. Everybody knows that People dropping kids off at schools clog up roads, and that's a nuisance. But it doesn't seem to stop anybody from doing it. I suspect if we can do a sensor and particular um, investigation around traffic and 
uh, pollution, we will be able to tell parents that they're damaging their children's health by doing that. So that's kind of the next step that we're looking at. So I have a quick question for you all and ask you for a quick answer before opening to the audience. But you are talking here about connecting people and um, we can see that more and more investigative efforts are collaborative. If you look at the Panama paper or other, the more it goes, the more it's collaboration between newsroom, between network of journalists. It's all across Europe. Do you think that would have been possible without technology and how technology can help this kind of uh, effort? <clears throat> that was a leading question. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be possible. I mean, like... Most of the meetings we do are online. We can't meet in person. We run different uh, relationships with different uh, people from different countries. For example, I'm, when there was the, the, the case of the Panama Papers, I was running a group of Cuban journalists, and really I, I can't be in Cuba just to coordinate them. It happened online mostly. I think that it's a yeah, leading question. Uh, I think <laughs> depending on the on the scale of it, yeah, we we would do uh, investigative projects with five six people in 2000. Let's say where we wouldn't use any tools. Basically, we would only uh, meet from time to time in a smaller region. So, depending on the scale you you want to do and uh, you want to obtain, basically, I think that's where communication uh, communication tools intervene. And of course you need uh, this kind of stuff, unless you work for a huge, wealthy news organization and you can really travel around with a lot of people. I think it, it definitely speeds up the process and opens up the process. I would, I would say that um, it, it makes us more aware of some of the things that we can do, but I also think that there was great journalism, amazing journalism being done before the internet, and, and I think you know, if somebody pulled the plug tomorrow on the internet, journalists would still go and ask questions and find out great stories. So, I th yeah, I'm going to be slightly urgent provocateur and say yes, but only in the way that a laptop makes it easier for me to write a story than a, than a pen and paper and, and then distribute it. Okay, so um, as you've heard, there's a real breadth of experience here and expertise from different parts of Europe. Um, do we have any questions for our panel, please? Any questions at all? Yes, we've got one in the middle there. Um, can I just ask, if you ask a question, would you mind letting us know who you are and who the question's aimed at? Uh, my name's Liz Enox. I'm on the board of a... Uh, I'm on the board of a nonprofit investigative journalism organization in the United States, the San Francisco Public Press. So my question is for the DNI. What are you doing in the U.S.? <laughs> so, again, the DNI, it's not just a fund. Uh, it's an initiative that is a, today a European initiative. And it's built upon those three pillars. So the one is product, and part of the products are global. Uh, among the products, we have, for example, AMP Accelerated Mobile Pages, and that is not just in Europe. Uh, the fund is today open only in European Union and IFTA. So if you want to apply, you need to have a legal entity that is established in one of the 32 <coughs> European countries. But it works in partnership, right? <coughs> Say again? Work, it will work in partnership, basically, in partnership with the European structure. What do you mean? Like uh, there's uh, a partnership between a European... Oh, that, that, you, that you can collaborate yeah. with other parties, but the, yeah, yeah. the applicant should be established in yeah. European Union or yeah. IFTA. That's it. I think we yeah. have a question down yeah. here. I already have the mic, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, my, my question, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm Georg Dahm from the uh, German media startup, Fair Beta Media, and um, we deal a lot with trying to, to get journalists or freelancers to collaborate with us, so my question is directed at Pafla. Um, we, I've, I'm an advocate for, for email encryption as well, and um, a lot of people I try to convince find uh, the whole Thunderbird solution an extreme pain in the ass. So and I'm, I'm really frustrated with the, with the state of technological development when it comes to the usability of encrypted email. So I'm, I'm wondering, is really Thunderbird the only way to go? There have been some 
um, startups like the Swiss um, Swiss offering Proton Mail. Everybody claims uh, we will we will find a simpler way to enable people like journalists to send encrypted email, but it never seems to take hold. So. And I'm thinking a lot of journalists don't even care about encrypted communication anymore. They love Slack, they love their email, and, and they don't give a shit about encryption. So I was wondering if you have some thoughts on that. I believe Slack is encrypted, but I'm not sure about it. And you can use Mailvelope, what most of my colleagues are doing, but still I find uh, old school Thunderbird with PGP encryption uh, most convenient for me. And I am not really a techie person, you know. I've learned it because I needed to, and I set it up because I needed to, because uh, in this case, it's, it's better to stay safe than to be a sorry. And it's not only about you, it's also about your partners you can expose by um, sending unencrypted emails. So, yeah, uh, just force your colleagues and that's it. <laughs> Use, it, use some violence. I, w I would add to this. Uh, so we, we have about 100 people working now in um, EIC, and they all have to have uh, PGP encryption because they would get uh, invites to enter different systems that we use for communication. So basically we use these two steps. One is the email encrypted uh, to get into the different uh, system that is secured, so then they don't have to deal with this encryption then on a daily basis. Because I really find, like, in big groups, PGP emails is just <laughs> unusable. I mean, people respond, and by mistake, they don't encrypt anymore, so they can they expose the whole thread of communication. Okay. Well, it happens so often that I really, like, <laughs> you, you are right in a way. But also, I find that with these 100 people, and it's, it's been very fast, the process, if they want to get into the, the data, if they are interested to look at some data, they do take the effort to... Uh, set up a PGP key and reply to you in, uh, encrypted, at least for that moment when you push them to a different communication system that is more secure. I have a question at the Hello, front. Mario Tereskinilale, the Offshore Journalism uh, Toolkit Project, which, by the way, happens to be funded by the ANI. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, actually, you're, of course, talking about tools for uh, reporting on investigative projects. We are more working on the published part of the equation. Uh, we uh, kind of think that there are lots of material that's being published, even not so very important investigative pr uh, projects that are being uh, uh, threatened with uh, deletion for any uh, possible reasons, uh, especially in Europe. And so we are studying in, uh, we are in, uh, uh, whether we can, like big companies, uh, jockey around uh, different jurisdictions to uh, minimize their fiscal contribution, whether we can maximize our freedom of speech uh, by doing just the same. That's why we call it the Offshore Journalism Project. And I think it's not exactly your uh, turf right now in this panel, but it, it's germane to it. And I thought it, it might be interested uh, to know. It's just journalism, uh, offshorejournalism.com. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the middle. Hi, my name is Lindsay Sample. I work for a Vancouver-based company called Discourse Media. So we do long-form investigative and in-depth reporting. Um, I'm really curious because you guys mentioned a lot of tools that you use. And I'm just curious, um, because there's so many people here that might want to try different things that are out there. Are there any tools that you've used that totally suck that you would not recommend anyone ever try? Emails. <laughs> and maybe if, if you can just explain some of, the, some of the sort of red flags or things to watch out for. Good question. Take that, anyone? Okay, I, can. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, sometimes you think they're good, and then, uh, and then technology and the world changes, and they turn out to be rubbish or they suck. As you, so we used to use Tableau a lot for kind of visualization and um, kind of information around that, and uh, it's not great on mobile. So that was one that we we would have, you know, if I'd been talking to you three, four years ago, I've been like, yeah, that's a really great tool, and, and now don't. Equally, um, we don't do much with Google Maps because you get stuck in them on mobile, and, uh, and so that's something that we, we tend not to do an awful lot with as, as a tool. That's just a couple. I wouldn't bash any tool. I mean, any tool, it's just um, um, a way to... You, you try it as a user, you use it in different ways. 
So if it sucks, it's maybe your fault. Um, but you should, I think you should also inform yourself what the tool does and what it doesn't, uh, and also what it does in terms of data. Uh, for you as a user, if it keeps data, how the data is stored, where they are going to, and so on. And this is not only for the big, like big uh, tools and platforms, but also for the smaller ones that you are offered when you enter in a collaboration. And then I would say one that really sucks, but in a nice way that I uh, enjoy uh, watching are uh, email <laughs> lists that people uh, use by mistake to respond all instead of responding to one person. So then you can see uh, a bit more of uh, what that person really thinks about stuff. Um, but that, that would be one ancient tool that is still in use, I guess, by a lot of uh, people. Okay, any other questions from the floor? No, that's great. I have uh, one last question I, I wanted to ask, actually. I, I was talking to Pavla before this session, and it struck me, as uh, I said before, that there's a lot of non-profits working in this sort of space, and I was wondering how, how eager, how amenable um, mainstream news organizations are uh, to actually take the resulting investigations that these guys are all busy doing. Um, so I'm going to ask that question again to Pavla, um, so you can also hear. Yeah, <clears throat> actually, as in uh, in big part of the Europe, the situation of the media ownership changed in the last three years, and we are talking about some kind of oligarchization of the media. Uh, in uh, we've got our own Berlusconi in Czech Republic. It's actually a guy, the most powerful politician these days. At the same time, he's leading the, the most powerful political party. He runs the biggest Czech business, and at the same time, he owns the biggest media house. Uh, so, as a kind of um, response to this, a lot of small media initiatives emerged. And actually, uh, 12 of a Czech businessmen decided they are going to throw some money to support such a independent media initiatives. And they created a fund for independent journalism in Czech Republic. It's like very recent. Um, they started uh, to give the first grants just in December 2016. Uh, they funded us, but what I want to tell is that you know we as investigative journalists we are not lost because there are most probably always be people who actually appreciate what we are doing, so just make some push, push on your business people to give some money and uh, to create a fund to support their own independent media, otherwise they they wouldn't know what is the hidden agenda of the media who can afford to to pay normal journalists, regular journalists. I would add to this because uh, I'm working for a year and a bit with uh, this European network that involves um, a lot of uh, existing media, but it's new players and old players, uh, big players and small players around Europe. And I've seen that um, there is an interest. It only depends how uh, fast you, you start to discuss your idea um, before it develops into a story, into an investigation. If you come and hit them with a, a ready story, that's not going to uh, work well. If you develop the story together or the investigation together, that works really well. And second, on these uh, new tools and uh, uh, development of new tools, I was also surprised to see that uh, most of these big media organizations don't have uh, internal uh, tools like this developed. But... Uh, I, I understand the reason, because they have a daily operation ongoing, so they cannot put resources from the, from the tech resources they have into developing and experimenting with new tools. So that's where I think we, we do play with new technology in Ike, uh, with some of the people from this media. They are really eager to, to do stuff. It's just a matter of resources and money. We've talked here a lot about tools to help doing investigative effort. Uh, technology also empowers the readers. Uh, I would like to talk a bit about the follow-up of the investigative effort and how technology and user engagement can change, reshape the way you are engaging the conversation with the readers after the investigative effort. Do you want them to yeah, listen. Okay. So... Um, we have a, a small 
data unit that covers the whole of the regionals, and, and there are a couple of journalists in that, and a developer and a coder, and basically they, they constantly kind of look for publicly available data, clean it, um, make it accessible, our journalists will use it, and that, that data is generally always put out into the world for other people to use. Um, and if they've built something around that, the code with it is always on GitHub for other people to use as well. So actually, if you search GitHub for Trinity Mirror Data Unit, you'll probably find tools that we've built for us that, that you can also use. Um, but where it, I think it becomes really interesting is um, where, one, once you've put the data out there, you've put the information out there, the feedback that comes in, whether that's on Facebook comments or um, from people taking it, using it, changing it in some way, or actually just people phoning the reporter back to talk about it. And you can see stories evolve all the time because of that. And the other interesting thing is if you, if you do your investigation in the wild as it progresses, I think that getting people involved in it, whether that's kind of in a, a Facebook group or um, in a, in a you know, crowdsourced way, you, it, it will always change the, the end point of the story that you think you're working towards and make it better. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think that collaboration is really important for us. I mean, I guess you guys are dealing on, with kind of some very, very sensitive and important kind of dangerous data, which may not be worth putting out like that. But certainly at our level, it, you know, the things that we look into, we try and involve people. Good. Do, you, do, do you have anything extra to add on that sort of crowdsourcing element that might be helpful? It's probably it's slightly distant, but yeah. No, OK. I, 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 I would say I have seen different projects using or releasing data. And I, really, I really think it's great, but it's a long-term thing, and it's uh, building up an archive. People will use it. It's, I didn't see any impressive uh, result of crowd uh, sourcing. People digging around, and you know about a, a few very well-known projects. But if you go in and talk to the people who organize them, you will know that there is a lot of effort to do that, and it doesn't really pay off in the end. Okay. Well, but it's a crowd, uh, crowd sourcing project. It's Wikipedia, so that's where people. So I think we've got to the end of the panel, unless there's any last-minute questions. But thank you all very much for coming. Um, I know everybody here uh, has enjoyed it and will be available for any other questions you have. Thank you. Isn't it? It's stifling in here. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank you for introducing me.
is caged by frail Restless by day and by night Rants and rages at the stars Eh, 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 eh,
the beast in me Is caged by frail and fragile bars The beast in me
Ok, buongiorno a tutti, grazie di essere qui. Eh, siamo molto felici di avervi in questa sala perché vogliamo parlarvi di creatività e ci siamo chiesti cos'è la creatività, cosa la fa uh, venire fuori, come si può alimentarla, quali sono le difficoltà che bisogna superare. E nel porci questa domanda come Sky abbiamo pensato in realtà di allargare il senso della creatività ad ambiti diversi e quindi oggi a parlarci di che cos'è la creatività, come viene fuori, abbiamo scelto delle figure che vengono da settori molto diversi. Abbiamo una scienziata, abbiamo una fotografa, abbiamo un designer, abbiamo uno sceneggiatore. E saranno loro a fare delle riflessioni, speriamo che vi uh, facciano diventare tutti anche un po' più creativi, vi diano qualche idea e ho intenzione di cominciare con Barbara Mazzolai. Barbara è la coordinatrice del centro eh, di microbiorobotica dell'Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia e eh, il suo racconto ci porterà in un ambito molto particolare perché lei si occupa di robot ispirati alle piante. Lascia a lei la parola che sicuramente vi coinvolgerà. Grazie. Provate a immaginare una persona creativa è probabile che il vostro primo pensiero sia andato verso un artista, un creatore di opere di un certo valore estetico, sia questo nella pittura, nella scultura, nella musica, nella danza, solo per citare alcuni dei settori. Ma se la creatività è la capacità di proporre idee innovative e anche originali, allora vi posso dire che il mio mondo, il mondo della ricerca, non esisterebbe senza la creatività. Il creativo è colui che guarda il mondo da una prospettiva diversa, è colui che deve andare oltre i confini, oltre il noto e soprattutto è colui che si deve porre delle grandi domande. Allora il neurobiologo che studia lo sviluppo del cervello o il fisico che definisce le leggi che regolano fenomeni naturali, ma anche il robotico che propone un nuovo dispositivo, tutti hanno in comune un percorso creativo e tutti hanno in comune una caratteristica che è quella della diversità. Spesso la diversità viene considerata con un'accezione negativa, ma in realtà la diversità è quella caratteristica che ci conduce verso qualcosa di magnifico come la creatività. Allora io vorrei parlarvi a questo punto del, di quello che è, il nostro, è stato il nostro percorso mio e del mio gruppo, eh, nel trasformare un'idea in un risultato, in un caso di successo, in quello che è il nostro mondo, quello della robotica in particolare, e soprattutto noi ci occupiamo di robot bioispirati, cioè l'approccio è quello di eh, prendere ispirazione dalla natura, di tradurre alcuni di questi principi in nuove macchine, in nuovi robot. E ad oggi vi sono già molti robot bioispirati, Molti di loro sono ispirati eh, al mondo ehm, degli de animali, quindi vi sono robot che sono in grado di volare, di nuotare, di correre, di arrampicarsi e mh, diciamo che l'obiettivo è quello di avere delle macchine nel futuro che eh, ci potranno aiutare nelle nostre attività quotidiane, eh, potranno condividere con noi determinati ambienti, no? quindi si muoveranno in ambienti reali. Ecco perché è importante prendere ispirazione dalla natura. Portiamo via i robot dalle fabbriche e i robot dovranno condividere con noi gli stessi spazi. Si parla quindi di animaloidi e di umanoidi. Ma la nostra idea è stata quella di prendere ispirazione in realtà da un altro modello, non soltanto dal mondo animale, ma eh, dal mondo vegetale per realizzare quello che ehm, si chiama plantoide. Un robot ispirato, ehm, alle, eh, va un robot ispirato in realtà al mondo delle piante, in particolare alle radici, quindi lo chiamiamo plantoide in analogia agli animaloidi e agli umanoidi, e eh, è stato il primo robot al mondo a prendere ispirazione da questo nuovo regno, cioè il regno rispetto a quello che viene considerato il regno per eccellenza in robotica, cioè il mondo, il mondo animale. Questo ritardo in realtà, questo è il plantoide, 
Questo ritardo in realtà nel prendere le piante a modello in robotica è probabilmente dovuto anche alla percezione che noi abbiamo delle piante, perché molto spesso nell'opinione diffusa, nell'opinione comune, le piante non si muovono, non comunicano, non interagiscono con l'ambiente, quindi sono quasi organismi passivi, ma in realtà non è così. Le piante sono in grado eh, di muoversi, lo fanno in maniera molto efficace, lo fanno in maniera diversa da noi. Spesso il movimento è associato alla crescita e hanno capacità sensoriali molto sviluppate, quindi loro percepiscono l'ambiente, dirigono la, cres la crescita verso e lontano determinati stimoli e anche comunicano, quindi comunicano con altre piante, comunicano con animali, con batteri, con funghi. Quindi tutte queste caratteristiche, la comunicazione, il movimento, la percezione, il controllo, sono caratteristiche fondamentali in robotica. Quindi la nostra idea è stata quella di prendere queste caratteristiche e tradurle in un robot. Ma in particolare noi ci siamo focalizzati sulle radici, cioè sullo studio del movimento delle radici, per capire come fanno questi organismi a muoversi nel suolo, che è un ambiente estremamente complesso, dove pressione e temperature sono, soprattutto attriti, sono elevati in pochi centimetri. Loro fanno perché crescono dalla punta, aggiungendo cellule e poi cercando i nutrienti, acqua, di cui hanno bisogno per la fotosintesi. Allora l'idea è stata studiare tutti questi principi, provare a semplificare e a tradurli in un robot. Ma in realtà io vorrei parlarvi anche della storia che ci sta dietro, cioè di come io e il mio gruppo abbiamo eh, cercato di tradurre appunto questi principi in un, in un robot e di come sia stato questo percorso, perché ehm, in realtà ci sono stati grandi soddisfazioni ma anche tanti insuccessi, tanti fallimenti e momenti di sconforto, perché questo binomio tra la biologia e la robotica, che caratterizza, se volete, anche eh, il, la mia formazione, è stato il fulcro di un progetto, che si chiamava appunto Plantoide, che noi abbiamo sottomesso alla Commissione europea per avere finanziamenti e portare avanti le nostre ricerche, ma soprattutto anche per essere più visibili e riconoscibili a livello internazionale, dato che era la prima volta che proponevamo questo, questo risultato. In realtà il progetto Plantoide è stato accettato soltanto al terzo tentativo, quando ha raggiunto, diciamo, eh, è arrivato primo nella lista delle, di tutte le proposte eh, sottomesse nell'ambito di quel programma, raggiungendo diciamo, il massimo anche del punteggio. Prima di questo successo in realtà ci sono stati tanti no, tanti anche momenti di sconforto, come dicevo, scetticismo da parte della comunità scientifica di riferimento che non credeva nella possibilità di studiare le piante per fare dei robot. E è stato solo nel momento in cui noi abbiamo creduto talmente tanto nella nostra idea che abbiamo cominciato a fare i nostri prototipi senza un finanziamento esterno, ispirate alle piante e questi funzionavano, erano reali, quindi abbiamo veramente convinto i valutatori che questa idea era realizzabile. E considerate che questo è spesso vero nella scienza perché eh, molte delle scoperte che poi hanno rivoluzionato la nostra vita sono partite da dei fallimenti o anche da delle scoperte casuali. È poi l'abilità del creativo, in questo caso lo scienziato, che riesce a vedere oltre l'evidenza e quindi trovare davvero il risultato pos positivo in un possibile fallimento. Quindi il nostro robot è questo. Eh, ha le sembianze diciamo, di una pianta, ha un tronco, ha dei rami con delle foglie, anche le foglie sono bioispirate ai materiali reali delle piante e le radici eh, si possono muovere crescendo dalla punta come fanno le radici naturali, hanno dei sensori nella punta come quelle naturali, quindi si muovono allontanandosi o cercando dei target nel suolo. Quindi l'applicazione che noi abbiamo in mente per questo robot è quella Prima di tutto ambientale, il robot può andare in maniera autonoma alla ricerca dell'acqua, di nutrienti, ma anche di inquinanti a seconda dei sensori che noi eh, introduciamo nella punta, ad esempio metalli pesanti che sono assolutamente nocivi per la salute umana. Um, Un'altra applicazione possibile è quella spaziale, in realtà noi siamo partiti dall'applicazione spaziale attraverso un piccolo finanziamento dell'ESA, eh, dell dell'ente spaziale europeo, 
perché le piante la prima cosa che fanno è ancorano la struttura e poi crescono quindi anche il nostro robot si deve ancorare nel suolo e poi crescere quindi può essere utile per sistemi di ancoraggio che sono problemi aperti in campo spaziale ma nel lungo termine potrebbe anche servire in applicazioni mediche perché ehm, crescendo dalla punta riduce gli attriti e le pressioni durante il movimento e quindi non danneggia l'ambiente circostante, in questo caso l'ambiente circostante è il nostro corpo, i nostri tessuti, quindi può muoversi alla ricerca di target di interesse. Quindi, questo è stato diciamo, l'evoluzione del, ehm, del progetto. Non credo, io non ho una ricetta particolare per la creatività, credo che ogni storia sia a sé e ogni storia è una storia di successo. E, diciamo che per quanto mi riguarda sicuramente un aspetto importante che vorrei sottolineare è quello della creatività, perché ehm, dobbiamo essere creativi, dobbiamo essere affamate di sapere, anche di discipline lontane dalle nostre. Io sono una biologa che ehm, lavora da tanti anni nel mondo dell'ingegneria e della biofisica e nel mio gruppo lavorano biologi insieme agli ingegneri, insieme ai fisici, agli esperti dei materiali, ai chimici. Quindi il primo problema che dobbiamo risolvere è riuscire a comunicare. Quindi con umiltà mettersi in confronto no? e cercare di capire l'altro. Quindi è un, uno sforzo notevole, assolutamente non banale. E l'altro aspetto eh, che credo sia importante è mettere passione nel proprio lavoro. La passione mi ha aiutato tante volte a superare difficoltà durante il mio percorso, ma credo che la cosa più importante sia poi il gruppo di lavoro, un gruppo di persone che insieme a te condivide un'idea, un sogno, un percorso e che consente di trasformare un'idea in realtà, in qualcosa di eh, concreto, tangibile. Questo è il mio gruppo, sono le persone che lavorano con me su queste tematiche e è grazie a loro che io oggi sono qui. Grazie a tutti. Grazie a Barbara Mazzolai. Diciamo che spesso si parla dei robot come quelli che possono togliere il lavoro e si difende il lavoro dicendo che bisogna essere più creativi, quindi in questo speech io trovo in un certo senso una sintesi, una quadratura del cerchio tra il valore della creatività e l'opportunità di applicare la creatività in tutti gli ambiti possibili. Affascinata dal concetto di essere affamati di curiosità e appassionati per tutto ciò che si fa, Adesso facciamo un salto e passiamo a un altro ambito della, della creatività, passiamo la parola a Stefano Bises che è uno sceneggiatore, giornalista televisivo per 15 anni ma poi adesso autore di serie tv molto famose tra cui Gomorra la serie, il capo dei capi, tutti i pazzi per amore, lascia la parola a lui e ci porta in un mondo un po' diverso ma sono sicura che troveremo delle affinità con quello che abbiamo sentito finora. Grazie. Eh sì, le affinità ci sono perché <coughs> la cosa bella della creatività è che è uno degli elementi più abbondanti in natura, eh, siamo tutti creativi, lo siamo continuamente anche quando non, non ci accorgiamo di esserlo, quando cerchiamo parcheggio siamo senza dubbio creativi, eh, dobbiamo consolare un bambino, siamo creativi, preparare una cena senza aver fatto la spesa, siamo creativi, lo siamo eh, continuamente, la creatività è abbondante e Solo per il fatto di essere creature viventi siamo eh, creativi, nel senso che siamo stati dotati della più incredibile qualità creativa, la riproduzione, è, è il più grande atto creativo eh, immaginabile. Quello che è molto difficile della creatività eh, è definirla, eh, perché la creatività è fatta di immaginazione, di fantasia, invenzione, sono tutti concetti che non hanno nulla eh, di oggettivo, eh, c'è chi considera la fantasia un valore positivo, chi invece la vede come una bizzarria, un'insidia che può distogliere dalla realtà, e così l'immaginazione e, e l'invenzione. Eh, sono tutte categorie che non hanno nulla di oggettivo, una bugia per esempio la consideriamo negativa, ma è un atto creativo, ci vuole immaginazione per confezionare una bugia, spesso pensiamo che quanto più è iperbolica la bugia, tanto più è credibile, ci vuole un grande atto di immaginazione. Io ricordo un mio compagno di liceo, parliamo della fine degli anni 70 in Italia, la violenza ideologica di strada era piuttosto 
eh, frequente e lui giustificò il fatto che non aveva il quaderno con le versioni di greco dicendo che i fascisti gli avevano dato fuoco alla macchina del padre e il suo quaderno era dentro. La genialità stava nel fatto che il professore di greco era un ex partigiano e quasi si è commosso questo. Allora è un atto ignobile indiscutibilmente ma è un grande eh, atto creativo eh, al tempo stesso. E malgrado la creatività appunto sia molto difficile eh, da, de da, da definire, da dei contorni, c'è chi ci ha provato, ha creato un test eh, di creatività eh, in, col quale misura la capacità del soggetto di dare risposte originali, non convenzionali e sulla base dei risultati addirittura predire un futuro di successo o meno eh, in un ambito creativo. E in parallelo sono stati definiti i cosiddetti killer della creatività, cioè quelle condizioni eh, ambientali, psicologiche, caratteriali che appunto possono eh, uccidere la creatività. Le più importanti sono l'ansia, la paura, eh, la pressione, eh, il giudizio. Io personalmente vivo costantemente in queste quattro eh, condizioni psicologiche e caratteriali. E penso che come me eh, moltissimi eh, che vivono di un lavoro creativo, perché la creatività non ha nulla di dato, non abbiamo nessuna certezza, eh, non è ripetibile. Eh, nessuno ci dice che se siamo stati capaci di scrivere una bella storia lo saremo ancora eh, il giorno dopo, una settimana dopo, un mese dopo, neanche riproducendo le condizioni che hanno portato alla nascita di un atto creativo un luogo, ore della giornata, musica, cibo, qualsiasi cosa. Non abbiamo nessuna eh, certezza, perché eh, la creatività è misteriosa, è un dono senza dubbio, ma è, è, è misteriosa e, ed è anche un demone in qualche modo, eh, perché una cosa che ti gratifica così profondamente e al tempo stesso ti tortura psicologicamente è un demone, non si può eh, definire in un altro modo. Il eh, primo episodio della serie eh, I Soprano eh, finisce con una canzone di Nick Lowe che si intitola The Beast in Me, la bestia dentro di me. E, The Beast riferisce... in Me è questo. <ride> Si riferisce chiaramente al protagonista della serie, che è eh, Tony eh, Soprano, eh, che è un boss. Eh, ah, eccolo qua, no? Scusate. Che è un boss della mafia italoamericana che viene assalito da attacchi di panico. Ma si riferisce molto anche al creatore della serie eh, I Soprano, un, un genio che si chiama David Chase, il quale fino alla ideazione dei soprano era considerato uno sceneggiatore eh, non brillantissimo eh, lui aveva un contratto di esclusiva con una piccola casa di produzione americana e ha passato quasi gran parte del, della durata di questo contratto andando periodicamente tutte le settimane a sedersi davanti ai suoi produttori e a dire non ho un'idea ho tante paure ho tante angosce ho tanti pensieri ma neanche un'idea poi improvvisamente il miracolo da un articolo Uh, sui mobster del New Jersey nasce un'idea che cambia profondamente uh, la serialità televisiva e inizia una rivoluzione creativa che è quella che abbiamo visto in questi anni e che stiamo vedendo anche oggi la nascita di una forma d'arte visiva che non ha nulla da invidiare uh, al cinema e questa grandissima intuizione era la creazione di un personaggio con un demone un personaggio sfaccettato, complesso, pieno di difetti e quindi di umanità, di debolezze, intrinsecamente negativo. Era il primo personaggio autenticamente negativo della storia della serialità. Era nato l'antieroe. E Tony Soprano è il padre di Walter White, di Breaking Bad, di Don Draper. Sono tutti personaggi che hanno un demone. E a quel punto la creatività di questo tipo di lavoro si trasforma in un gioco di specchi, perché il creatore ha un demone dentro di sé ed è attraverso il suo demone che scava il demone eh, del, personaggio, <coughs> del personaggio che ha creato. E quindi um, quel atto, uh, di quel, quel sentimento di inadeguatezza, ha generato eh, un personaggio come questo, 
tanto che Nick Lowe canta nella canzone God Help the Beast in Me, eh, Dio aiuta eh, la bestia che <coughs> è dentro di me. Allora, diciamo, parlavo di, di scavo del personaggio, scavare è una parola che evoca fatica, e qui in qualche modo usciamo eh, dall'idea romantica della eh, creatività come scintilla eh, magica e misteriosa, e torniamo sul terreno delle regole, cioè quelle regole che non esistono per favorire la creatività o per intralciarla in qualche modo, sono invece determinanti per esercitarla, per eh, far sì che quella scintilla venga nutrita, sopravviva, altrimenti durerebbe veramente un attimo. E la prima è proprio la fatica, eh, ci vuole un'incredibile fatica e un'incredibile quantità di lavoro per trasformare una buona idea in qualcosa di concreto, senza nessuna garanzia che questo accada. Uh, L'esempio di, di Mad Men, Matthew Wiener, il creatore di quella serie, impiega sette anni a mettere a punto il pilota uh, di quella serie meravigliosa. Sette anni a correggere, a limare, a, a perfezionare uh, qualcosa che al suo creatore stesso non è mai apparso autenticamente perfetto, il demone, l'inadeguatezza. Noi nel nostro piccolo con Gomorra eh, abbiamo fatto una media di 10 stesure di copione eh, per ogni singolo episodio. Alla fine di una stagione io avevo sul mio computer un libro di circa 5-6 mila pagine. Eh, è molto importante la fatica, è molto importante il lavoro ed è molto importante l'insoddisfazione perché ci costringe a eh, a, a vedere difetti a volte anche difetti dove non ci sono ma in qualche modo eh, ci porta ad affinare le cose l'altra eh, regola importante, requisito è la conoscenza perché la creatività è quasi sempre anzi è sempre come dire, la capacità di stabilire relazioni e quante più cose si conoscono, quante più relazioni siamo in grado di stabilire e quindi quante più cose che prima non esistevano siamo in grado di creare o di, di, eh, di trasformare. E sono relazioni tra cose anche elementari, eppure possono essere, eh, possono essere eh, rivoluzionarie. Nel 1958 eh, Man Ray stabilisce una relazione tra un pane, eh, una forma di pane, e un colore che non è il suo, e nasce la baguette blu, totalmente inutile direte voi, ma è un esempio di relazione. Un altro esempio di relazione elementare eh, lo fa Italo Calvino, per esempio, nelle città invisibili, eh, dove costruendo una città eh, eh, ci racconta di una città che è composta di due mezze città, una che è quella fatta di palazzi, di chiese, di monumenti, di negozi, e l'altra metà eh, è invece un circo, eh, e quindi ci sono le giostre, le bancarelle, il tendone. L'intuizione in, creativa sublime di Carbino è di invertire la relazione tra la parte stabile e la parte provvisoria, per cui a smontare le tende non è il circo, ma sono i palazzi, i monumenti, le chiese. E eh, la città si chiama la città di Sofronia, e Calvino ci lascia con un'immagine struggente, la mezza città circo che non si è mossa, che aspetta l'altra, che l'altra torni, perché la vita ricominci. Possono essere relazioni tra cose eh, complesse, eh, in House of Cards, eh, la serie americana, eh, la, bisogna conoscere molto bene la politica, per, eh, la politica americana per raccontarla, perché è racconto, è credibilità. Uh, anche qui nel nostro piccolo in Gomorra noi per raccontare quella realtà la dovevamo conoscere perfettamente come la gente che ci viveva per raccontare una piazza di spaccio dovevamo averla vista dovevamo vedere come si confezionavano le dosi sapere quanta gente ci lavorava uh, quanto guadagnava per esempio perché da ognuno di quei dettagli eh, poteva nascere eh, ed effettivamente poi è, è nato racconto e poi c'è ancora come dire, la conoscenza di, della realtà più complessa di tutte, che è appunto l'animo umano. Eh, la serialità contemporanea 
è principalmente un lavoro di relazioni tra i personaggi più che di trame, più che di costruzione di trame. Sono i personaggi che attraverso le loro relazioni con gli altri, con il mondo e con il proprio demone, ci raccontano una storia, ci portano a creare eh, una storia. L'ultima eh, diciamo, regola eh, che la creatività chiede, soprattutto se ne vogliamo fare un mestiere, ehm, è quella di conoscere le regole dell'arte nella quale ci stiamo eh, cimentando, perché ogni arte ha la sua tecnica e le tecniche bisogna conoscerle. Se noi diamo a dei bambini eh, dei fogli di carta e dei pennarelli, loro disegneranno quello che vedono abitualmente, eh, una casa, alberi, un cane, ma lo disegneranno a modo loro, in modo infantile fatalmente. Se a questi bambini non verrà data una tecnica, vent'anni dopo, grosso modo, disegneranno il cane, la casa e l'albero tendenzialmente alla stessa maniera. E così eh, ci vuole una tecnica per scrivere un romanzo, una tecnica per comporre una musica evidentemente, una tecnica per scrivere un film e una tecnica diversa da quella per scrivere un film per scrivere una serie televisiva, perché ha regole diverse. Bisogna conoscere tutte queste regole e tutte queste tecniche, magari poi per eh, violarle sfacciatamente e dare vita a una rivoluzione creativa. L'ultima cosa che volevo dirvi ha un po' a che fare con quello che diceva Barbara, quantomeno con le macchine. E, e torniamo diciamo, all'inizio, al fatto che la creatività la possediamo tutti, eh, e che eh, la creatività ci, ci aiuta molto spesso a vivere meglio, e la vita è migliore se la viviamo in una maniera eh, creativa. Nel 1996 ehm, l'IBM costruì una macchina infernale che aveva il compito, a fini pubblicitari, evidentemente, di battere il campione del mondo, l'allora campione del mondo di scacchi, Garry Kasparov. Era una macchina fatta apposta, eh, calcolava 200 milioni di posizioni al secondo e tutte le varianti che potevano scaturire da quelle posizioni, miliardi di calcoli in pochissimi istanti. Apparentemente eh, è una partita persa contro il cervello di un uomo. Scar eh, Kasparov è stato sempre tranquillo, è sempre stato sicuro di battere quella macchina, perché a quella macchina mancava una cosa, mancava la creatività, la capacità di adattarsi in qualche modo. Per cui lui, uscendo da una partita tradizionale, dai canoni della logica scacchistica, sacrificando un pezzo, facendo una mossa irrazionale, mandò in confusione la macchina e vinse, e vinse la sua sfida. Quando fu fatta la rivincita perse, ma perse perché accanto alla macchina avevano messo cinque grandi maestri internazionali di scacchi che erano molto creativi in qualche modo. E allora questo per dire che ognuno di noi ha il suo mostro, tutti quotidiano, ricorrente, un persecutore che c'è sempre. Ecco, provare a portarlo su un terreno creativo della creatività può essere... Eh, una buona idea per sconfiggerlo. Ecco qua, grazie a Stefano Bises. E adesso vi portiamo in un'altra atmosfera. Stefano parlava dell'importanza di uh, combattere dei demoni, e perseverare c'è una grande storia di perseveranza che stiamo per raccontarvi con Darcy Padiglia che è una fotografa che ha pubblicato foto ovunque New York Times, New Yorker, Le Monde e uno dei suoi progetti più importanti si chiama The Julie Project e lei ha seguito per 21 anni la famiglia di una ragazza uh, colpita dall'AIDS e questo progetto è un po' un modo per dire appunto che la creatività non è una scintilla, è un percorso, è una fatica, è un impegno che si prende con se stessi e con gli altri. Lascio la parola a Darsi, sono molto onorata di averla qui. Thank you for coming. Eh, Darsi parlerà in inglese, quindi potete indossare le cuffie per la traduzione. Hello. I have some notes. Um... So it seems like we're all in the same 
position of what we think of creativity. Um, I hope I can maybe point you in some directions that um, my esteemed colleagues haven't. Um, and I hope you understand what creativity is to somebody who uses a camera. Um, can I just ask how many photographers are in the audience? Yay, cool, great. Okay, so I'm going to discuss kind of a duality that exists for me with creativity. And the duality is um, this process of um, believing in myself and my idea. But the most important part of that is the questions that come around that. And it's by questioning that reality that, um, that I'm able to arrive at different places. So, oh, thank you, you put that image up. Um, so this image is from a project that I did on AIDS in prison. Um, I really wanted access to this prison. Um, my first phone call was rejected. Um, my second phone call was rejected. And I go through a series of six months of calling um, this lieutenant to get access to this prison. Um, and at the six-month point, he says to me, Darcy, I really want to let you into this prison, but this is what I need from you. And he just simply said what he needed. But the key here is, is that I desired to do this story. Um, it was an important story that I cared about. And I wasn't going to back down without a yes. And so I was diligent in pursuing the story. So I provided him what he needed. I get into the prison. And I'm able to stay in that prison for about a year working. Um, it was actually, honestly, he, he probably would have still let me continue. I'd probably still be there, but he, he moved to prisons. Um, so the value of being determined when you have something that you believe in is, is very important. Um, for the second image. So that brings me to this point in my life. Um, in 1991, I was offered a staff position at the New York Times. And um, I was just finishing college. And I, I knew what a great opportunity that was to have that opportunity to work at a paper like the New York Times. But I, I politely declined the offer. Um, and some of you are probably thinking that's crazy. Um, that's something else you need to have with creativity. You need to have a little bit of craziness inside of you to believe that, that there's something else for you other than what's in front of you. Um, and by the way, I didn't tell my parents I'd been offered that job because I'm pretty sure they would have like told me that I was crazy for walking away. Um, and I think there's only two times in my career that I thought, mm, maybe I should have taken it. Um, but what that does is that puts me in a position to pursue being a long-form narrative documentary photographer, which is something I really wanted to do. And I knew that if I would have stayed at the New York Times, that they couldn't afford to give me the time to do the projects that I wanted to do. So creativity involves taking risks and taking chances and blindly believing in whatever it is that you believe. And I did not know the story that I was going to do, but I just knew it was important that I afford myself the opportunity to put myself in a position to do the kind of reporting that I wanted to do. Which brings me to this image of Stephen. Um, I end up in this hotel project at the height of AIDS in America. And this was a hotel where people were too sick to leave to go to clinics. And I was following a team of doctors there. I think initially that the story is the doctors. Um, but by being there and by questioning everything that's going on around me, I start questioning the standards of the hotel and the poverty and, and the people that I was meeting. And I realized quickly that the story was the people. And the amount of people of this population of the indigent and the poor in San Francisco that were dying of AIDS in these hotels. So. That takes me to this image of Julie Baird with her daughter, Rachel. Julie Baird was a part of this project. I, at this point, am a year into that project. And 
This brings me to leaving the job at the New York Times, affording myself the creative freedom to wander and take risk and to put myself in a place of trying to tell stories in a different way that wasn't being done really in photography. Um, and, and I meet Julie, and Julie's really interesting. She's the first kind of young person that I meet in the hotel that has HIV. And I want to get to know her. Now this, is, this is, gets back to that determination. So she's kind of hard to get to know. Um, I'd knock on her door. Initially she said yes to the project, but there were a lot of times that she would say no to the project and slam the door in my face and tell me not today. Uh, can I, I can cuss, right? Oh, not today, bitch, and slam the door in my face. And, and I always knew that it wasn't about me, her problems, and that the story was bigger, and her story was bigger than my feelings or me being intimidated in this process. And so I just continued, and, and our, our relationship develops that I end up spending um, 18 years with her before she dies of AIDS in the backwoods of Alaska. Um, but the important thing here in journalism is sometimes we think that we choose a story, but the reality is, is the story and the people choose you. And it's really important to step back when you're working on any project and understand that. Um, the questions that come to me in this process of this project is I'm, for the first time, trying to get away from aesthetics. Um, and I'm asking myself, what do I want to say here? The aesthetics that um, had controlled me on a visual level, right, through the process of photography, I was backing away from. And now I want to understand what it feels like to be Julie. These are questions that are coming. And I'm, I'm not sure if I answered that, but it, it's the search for that question which is the really important part. Um, sorry, how do you do this? Next? Okay. Which, which I think my other two uh, speakers ahead of me discussed this. Um, it's not being satisfied. I can look at every single photo I ever took and I can find so many errors and problems with my reporting and my vision. And that's what drives me. It drives me to further seek um, perfection, to understand emotion, to understand an aspect of someone's life that, that I can't understand, that I want to understand. So it's all of these questions that get me to a place. Now this is where the intuitive comes in. And, and this intuitive process is really important because this is creativity. If you don't ask those questions, you don't get to go to the next step. And so by asking yourself some of these tough questions, is my composition good? What is it like to be Julie? You know, it puts you in a position of searching for something different than what is obvious and what is in front of you and what you know. And for me, that's what drives me as a journalist is not necessarily this is the story, but how does somebody get to be this person in the story? And trying to, to relate to that. So, you can bring up, brings me to um, the next two images. Sometimes photos can be too obvious. This is an image of cat in an area of uh, Skid Row in Los Angeles, which is the highest concentration of homeless ple people in America in a 50 block area. There are about 6,000 people who are homeless. The metaphor here is Wall Street. And there's actually a street called Wall Street in Skid Row. And it's a good metaphor. And yeah, I could have just done a very different image of her but trying to play with the metaphor and trying to take somebody to a different place in a photo is also this challenge in this, this process of searching. Um, and then the last image, sorry for this. <laughs> I just thought we would end with that. I, don't, I think it might be appropriate today. Um, So I had the opportunity to cover the elections for Le Monde last year. And one of the complications in doing the elections is that there's a lot of barriers. These barriers can hold you back, or they can be this great motivation to, to push you forward. Um, oh, just press stop. Sorry. That's my cue. Ah. 
just stop. There you go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'm out of time. Okay, I'm done now. Um, but it brings me to the inauguration. I, I had the world's worst credential. Um, I, I, it, it was just the world's worst credential. And um, a lot of people had the same credential I had. And, and they continued to stand in that one spot. Well, what I did was when the guards weren't looking, I jumped a fence. I jumped a barricade. I even asked my fellow photographers to help me jump over. You know, the cop went that way. I went past the gate. And, and through Trump's speech, I'm finally at the front of the inaugural platform where nobody is, with my big lens just doing my photograph, because nobody really cared. And so I'm going to say that the other part of creativity is being incredibly resourceful and breaking rules. And, and that's where I'm going to leave it. So thank you very much. Ringrazio uh, Darcy. E prima di passare la parola all'ultimo interlocutore, all'ultimo speaker, voglio dirvi che alla fine lasciamo un po' di spazio per le vostre domande, ma ci piaceva proprio l'idea di sentire tutti e quattro gli interventi con punti di vista diversi sulla creatività in modo da creare quella cross pollinazione, diciamo così, di riflessioni da un tema all'altro per poi stimolare un po' di domande. Lascio la parola adesso a Leonardo Romè, direttore dell'ISIA di Urbino, che è uno degli istituti storici nella progettazione della comunicazione. Grazie Francesca. Non ho mai fatto uno speech seduto così, ma quindi, però qua è necessario, altrimenti non, non posso tenere il quaderno, speriamo non, non cada niente. Allora, sono qua perché ho raccontato a Francesca qualche giorno fa un progetto molto interessante che abbiamo fatto eh, in collaborazione tra l'Università della Comunicazione che dirigo e la Galleria Nazionale delle Marche di, di Urbino. E questo progetto complesso appunto, di, di progettazione concentrato in, in tre mesi mi ha dato l'occasione di riflettere su cosa significa eh, quello che viene definito creatività, progettazione e così via. Iniziamo da una, da una mia considerazione sulla nozione di creatività, ovvero io da una parte credo che i concetti legati alla nozione di creatività siano molto utili ed efficaci, ma che ormai ci sia una sorta di, di deriva no? in quello che si intende per creatività. Cioè se voi mettete creatività su Google, image, troverete cervelli che esplodono, colori, mappe concettuali arzigogolatissime, eh, come se la creatività in qualche modo fosse una sorta di, di dominio autonomo del pensiero e dell'agire umano che si basa su una sorta di improvviso intuito e così via. E da una parte come se ci fosse quindi la, il dominio della creatività e dall'altra parte il dominio della logica, del pensiero astratto e così via. Quello che invece io credo è che la creatività, ovvero la, la capacità umana di creare dei processi che non sono predefiniti, di trovare soluzioni senza seguire le procedure predeterminate o di porsi problemi che altri non si sono posti, è in realtà un incrocio tra Uh, dimensione logica, dimensione emotiva sempre che le due siano distinguibili perché anche la logica no? ha una dimensione passionale e logica, pensiero astratto pensiero concreto, dimensione fisica no? gesto se prendete i grandi artisti del passato cosa sono? dei creativi, sì, ma sono anche dei, dei, dei licenziati, dei logici e nello stesso modo gli interventi stessi che abbiamo avuto oggi uno scienziato una scienziata, uno sceneggiatore, una persona che indaga la, la, la realtà, la società attraverso la fotografia, eh? sono di fatto figure che vengono da, da, da diversi ambiti in cui la dimensione della conoscenza teorica, la dimensione dell'indagine, la dimensione logica, la dimensione espressiva sono mescolate insieme. Quindi da un certo punto di vista potrei dire che uno dei nemici principali dell'idea dell di creatività è la nozione di senso comune di creatività. Quindi, che è diversa, da, che, che appunto prevede invece una dimensione del tutto così intuitiva, eh, semplicemente di tipo artistico per così dire, o artistico nel senso dell'eccessiva del, dell leggerezza, diciamo così. E questo un po' poi relega i creativi in un ruolo un po' sempre secondario nella no? società, che è quello di, di quelli leggeri, poi ci sono i sedi che sono gli ingegneri e così via. Un altro concetto, visto che siamo una scuola di design che è molto dannoso per il design, è il concetto di design. Cioè quando si parla di oggetto di design, spesso si pensa ad un oggetto che è 
esteticamente efficace, carino, fatto da un creativo e così via, quando in realtà design vuol dire progettazione. E molto spesso gli oggetti di design non sono ben progettati. E allora ci vuole una, una grandissima fatica per una scuola come la mia che si chiama di design della comunicazione per far capire che noi spesso risolviamo anche dei problemi, oltre a, a, fare, a scegliere un carattere trendy o a fare un'infografica molto carina di cui non si capisce niente come la maggior parte delle infografiche che si trovano sui quotidiani. Ecco, quindi, eh, proprio perché sono un teorico, diciamo così, perché ho, sono un semiologo di base, penso che sia molto difficile teorizzare cos'è creatività, cos'è cos design, bisogna stare attenti nell'uso di, di questi termini all'accezione più diffusa che hanno. Però veniamo al, al, eh, al caso concreto di cui voglio parlare, ed è questo progetto che abbiamo fatto, che nasce appunto da, da una cosa molto interessante che c'è a Palazzo Ducale, che è questo palazzo... Eh, eh, che da sei secoli domina Urbino eh, il palazzo del duca di Montefeltro no? quello col naso con quel col colpo qua e che si vede sempre di profilo perché gli mancava un occhio allora in palazzo ducale eh, a Urbino c'è pieno di iscrizioni cosiddette iscrizioni antropiche cioè graffiti vuol dire che dal 1461 62 adesso non mi ricordo eh, tutti sia gli abitanti stabili del palazzo sia i visitatori, quindi i legati papali che arrivavano, eh, le guardie, eh, i prigionieri, lasciavano dei segni sulla pietra, iscrivendo la pietra, scrivendo oggi sono felice, oppure che ne so, chi ama Urbino non è nata Urbino, oppure cioè, ci sono le tacche delle diverse altezze del duca figlio de, de, del duca di Montefeltro, in cui si vede l'evoluzione perché erano molti preoccupa molto preoccupati che il figlio non, non, non crescesse abbastanza, quindi è uno spaccato di sei secoli di storia. E una tesi di un nostro studente, di un nostro ex studente dell'Isia di Urbino, che si chiama Manuele Maracini, del Biennio di Fotografia dei Beni Culturali, ha, a partire da delle ricerche ventennali di una professoressa che si chiama Raffaella Sarti, ha realizzato una tesi in cui con delle tecniche avanzate fotografiche, quindi qua vedete, è creatività, è? Eh, sono tecniche avanzate di rilievo fotografico che hanno permesso di mostrare effettivamente questi, questi graffiti. A partire da questa idea il direttore della Galleria Nazionale delle Marche, Peter Freiter, ha detto facciamo una mostra, è interessantissimo per noi perché è il palazzo che parla di se stesso, una cosa che non è stata mai fatta. Eh, e quindi eh, l'ho incontrato a dicembre, questo dicembre mi ha detto ma perché eh, non facciamo una mostra? Inizialmente l'idea è che lui avrebbe fatto la mostra a partire da una tesi di uno studente e poi l'avrebbe affidata ad uno studio, invece ha detto no facciamola completamente con voi, con voi di Sia di Urbino e quindi io ho detto sì. Perché ho detto sì? Perché c'erano delle precondizioni che consentivano a me come direttore di quella scuola, che sia Urbino, di sapere che potevo realizzare quella mostra, cioè che i docenti e gli studenti della scuola potevano realizzarla, perché avevano le competenze espressive per fare il catalogo, il manifesto, i video, i, i, i materiali tridimensionali, il touchscreen, il piano espositivo, tutto un, tutta la complessità di una mostra avanzata anche sul piano multimediale. I prerequisiti della creatività in questo caso cosa sono? Erano l'autorevolezza della scuola costruita in 40 anni, la presenza all'interno della scuola di un team di docenti e di studenti progettisti, tutti quanti, uno spazio che consentiva l'interazione fisica tra le persone. Senza, senza queste precondizioni, precondizioni abilitanti, diciamo così, il processo di progettazione non sarebbe potuto emergere. Adesso vi faccio vedere rapidamente qualche immagine, no? questo è il team di lavoro, una parte del team di lavoro con ingegneri, fotografi, illustratori, eh, Ilvo Diamanti che è il presidente, vabbè, che ha fatto soltanto, e <ride> ha dato, mi ha aiutato a realizzare più sul piano no, dell'autorevolezza, dell eh, il direttore della galleria, tutti gli studenti. E qua vedete ecco, che ne so, i pannelli, non va. Eh, un video in cui si vede una parte di un graffito, il touch screen in cui cliccando su ogni pagina, della, della, su ogni a, eh, stanza del, eh, del palazzo si possono vedere i graffiti presenti. Il QR code che consente di vedere eh, ingranditi i graffiti presenti, che sono questi qua a sinistra, vedete? È una, un prodotto fatto con una stampante 3D che consente di toccare i graffiti. Ecco per darvi un'idea del tipo di, di, di progetto. E questo progetto, che è stato realizzato in tre mesi, veniamo alla parte più strettamente di cosa, 
significa un processo di progettazione o di creatività, come vogliamo dirlo, sono stati tutti i problemi che sono nati in questi tre mesi, che hanno portato a, a dei conflitti quasi quotidiani che sembrava che ogni giorno, ogni giorno facessero, facessero fallire il progetto, ma che in realtà alla fine sono quelli che hanno consentito che il processo andasse, andasse in porto. Come è avvenuto questo processo di progettazione? Quali sono gli elementi che l'hanno determinato? Beh, innanzitutto è, definito, è iniziato con una definizione del rapporto tra cliente e committente. Un committente pubblico, una galleria nazionale delle marche, un committente pubblico a sua volta, un istituto superiore, prestigioso, eccetera, eccetera. La prima negoziazione di questo aspetto del rapporto cliente committente è stata l'aspetto principale. Ma fino in fondo non è stato chiarito in tutti gli aspetti. Non era possibile prevedere quali sarebbero state le richieste che sarebbero arrivate dalla Galleria Nazionale delle Marche e quanto queste richieste avrebbero poi messo in crisi, non tanto me, ma in alcuni casi i docenti che dovevano lavorare, che in alcuni casi hanno sentito no, invasa la loro sfera di autonomia espressiva, di, di, di autorialità e così via. Questo rapporto committente e, e cliente è quello che ha determinato l'orizzonte delle azioni. Cosa è avvenuto successivamente? Quali sono le cose che hanno eh, consentito il processo creativo? È stata la costruzione di una squadra di lavoro, una squadra di lavoro composta da, da docenti e da studenti che si sono sacrificati per due mesi dormendo due ore a notte per realizzare il progetto. Inizialmente si pensa che la questione principale nella creazione di una squadra di lavoro siano le competenze tecniche. E le competenze tecniche certo sono necessarie, ma ci sono delle soft skill, eh, una delle questioni no, che dobbiamo affrontare è questa, che sono ancora più complesse, che sono le competenze di tipo comunicativo, competenze relazionali. Quanto il team sarà in grado di dialogare? Quanto il team sarà in grado di dialogare con i capi progetto e quanto i capi progetto saranno in grado di dialogare con gli altri capi progetto, cioè referenti in questo caso della galleria? I problemi comunicativi, sia orizzontali che verticali, sono in realtà quelli che possono determinare oppure... Eh, determinare la riuscita o il fallimento di un progetto di comunicazione, più delle questioni tecniche, perché le questioni tecniche sono risolvibili, le questioni relazionali riguardano lo statuto della soggettività di un essere umano e quindi sono ben più complesse perché chiamano in casa questioni etiche, estetiche, ehm, sociali, no? impegno civile, eh? non è semplice chiedere a un docente di grafica modifica quell'aspetto, perché quello può dirti no, la mia autorevolezza no? è, è messa in discussione, c'è un, una, una continua negoziazione che è parte del progetto ed è giusta, perché quando una, una persona in qualche modo crea una, un conflitto vuol dire che ha, ha cura il raggiungimento di un obiettivo. Ed è quindi normale che vi siano dei conflitti tra dei soggetti. Se non c'è conflitto vuol dire che probabilmente le persone non sono molto interessate ad arrivare ad un risultato. Un alt altre due cose che sono state fondamentali nella, nella gestione del processo. Finsare degli indicatori di successo che fossero in qualche modo credibili e che fossero negoziabili. La mostra doveva andare in porto in due mesi e ci siamo riusciti. Questo ha comportato che ovviamente ognuno doveva rinunciare a una parte del suo lavoro. Il video poteva essere fatto in modo migliore, il catalogo sicuramente. Ma poi qual era l'indicatore di successo? Era l'esecuzione perfetta del singolo catalogo o era la riuscita complessiva della mostra che poi ha avuto un'ottima no? anche ricaduta di stampa e così via. Era un equilibrio complesso tra diversi indicatori di successo che devono essere negoziabili, non sono stabilibili fino in fondo, così come la relazione cliente-committente deve essere continuamente rimodulata. Ed è quindi necessaria una continua negoziazione. Partendo da quale presupposto? Partendo dal presupposto che la base dell'interazione tra esseri umani è l'incomprensione. Cioè, ovvero, di base gli esseri umani si capiscono, sì, se si sta parlando magari di qualcosa di leggero, ma se hanno degli obiettivi concreti da raggiungere, il conflitto è la norma. Partendo da questo presupposto, ci si pone un atteggiamento di soluzione del problema e si parte dall'idea che è la, che è la felice comunicazione che è il miracolo e non viceversa. Quindi l'incomprensione come elemento eh, positivo, diciamo così, che consente un'evoluzione, una trasformazione del proprio punto di vista. Venendo ad, ad una conclusione dell'esperienza che ho avuto, oltre alla, al fatto che due elementi, le precondizioni di un progetto anche di tre mesi sono magari vent'anni di ricerca, il fatto di avere degli studenti disposti a lavorare in una certa direzione, a sacrificarsi con delle competenze, dei docenti che lavorano in team e così via. Quali sono i, i sei punti chiave che, che, che mi sento di, di consegnare? Uno, che appunto il processo creativo di invenzione, di scommessa interpretativa può essere fatto soltanto se c'è un terreno preesistente che lo consente. Quindi anche quel gesto di un secondo richiede dei mesi di, pre, di, di, di presentazione. Secondo, attenti alla nozione di creatività, 
che spesso è la, è la peggiore nemica della creatività, eh, l'incomprensione come regola, indicatori flessibili dei risultati che possono essere rinegoziati, l'ambizione di realizzare qualcosa che sia il miglior progetto possibile, dati certe, gli elementi di partenza, e poi il fatto che in alcuni casi l'azione migliore è quella di non agire direttamente, ma creare le condizioni perché l'azione avvenga in una certa direzione. È la strategia dell'efficacia, l'arte della guerra, no? A, eh, di, 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 di tradizione cinese, cioè agire senza agire. Creare le condizioni, quando devi intervenire, vuol dire che è già troppo tardi. Quindi sono le condizioni dell'agire che devono essere create, in questo caso il rapporto cliente-committente che doveva essere negoziato e chiarito con gli indocenti prima dell'azione che avrebbero determinato uno svolgimento eh, diciamo così, più sereno ma nello stesso tempo è l'incomprensione stessa che determina poi la possibilità di una trasformazione dei punti di vista che va verso un, un risultato che può essere migliore rispetto ad un progetto apparentemente più dialogico e sereno. Grazie. Sono stata un po' brutale a togliere la parola a Leonardo ma in realtà volevo sapere se ci sono delle domande. Ok. E per chi? Così poi io passo il microfono ai nostri... Vorrei fare una domanda... Veloci, veloci, Prova. le domande brevi. Le domande Vorrei, brevi. Sì, una domanda a Stefano Bises. Gomorra è una serie girata in dialetto stretto. Mi chiedevo se a livello di scrittura è stata una difficoltà e se a livello creativo è appunto magari un vincolo oppure anche uno spunto, un motivo di ispirazione, non so diciamo che è stato un obbligo era una serie in cui la, la, la cifra principale era il realismo e non potevamo sbragare sulla lingua la lingua non vuol dire napoletano voleva dire scampia eh, che è un'altra lingua molti dei nostri attori erano quasi tutti insomma, napoletani ma pochissimi di scampia eh, erano di scampia i ragazzini i, i giovani amici di Jenny ed era un'altra lingua la segretaria di edizione eh, che era napoletana quando abbiamo fatto le letture dei copioni ha detto io non vi garantisco che questi dicono quello che c'è scritto per cui abbiamo deciso di prendere uno di scampia e di riscrivere tutti i copioni con l'onomatopea eh, del dialetto di, di, di scampia io ho le registrazioni di queste sembriamo Totò e Peppino quando scrivono la lettera con, con questo che ci dà l'onomatopea di, di queste cose e è stato per certi versi un vincolo evidentemente come, era un, come la realtà è sempre un vincolo e, e Gomorra da questo punto di vista era piena di vincoli perché non, non potevi sgarrare su nulla cioè non, non potevi permetterti eh, che qualcuno ti dicesse quello non è vero, quello voi siete inventato anche per tutte le polemiche che hanno accompagnato il lavoro di Roberto Saviano e la serie e quant'altro e però eh, parliamo di vincoli quel territorio l'umanità di quelle persone, quella lingua così ricchi così ricchi di storie di appunto di dettagli, di particolari di, di, di cose che ignoravamo totalmente che l'essere stati costretti là dentro eh, ci ha dato una, una spinta creativa e di curiosità cento volte più forte che se non ci fossimo dovuti limitare a scrivere in un dialetto napoletano come posso scriverlo io che non sono di Napoli. Ecco. Altre domande velocissime, una sola? No? A posto. Allora ringrazio i nostri speaker Stefano Bises, Barbara Mazzolai, Darsi Padiglia e Leonardo Romei. Grazie a tutti. Scusate, devo chiedere a tutti di lasciare la sala per far entrare il nuovo pubblico e i nuovi speaker. Grazie.
e, ok 2-2-2 2-2-2 3 3 3 4 4 4 
to give you more space, maybe. E poi quando il collegamento, cioè per qua poi fate voi. Ci pensate che serve subito? Sì, sì, partiamo subito con cioè, quello. Sì, sì. Ok, so maybe we can start? Yeah? Ok. So, hi all, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm uh, Carola Frediani, a journalist uh, at La Stampa, and I'm pleased to be here to introduce this uh, interesting panel uh, with uh, Stefania Maurizzi, who is a colleague from journalist uh, from La Repubblica and also a media partner with Wikileaks since 2009. Then we have uh, Lorenzo Franceschi Bicchierai, a security reporter at Motherboard Vice in the US, covering hacking and cybersecurity and leaks. And uh, Andrei Soldat Soldato Soldatov, <laughs> Sorry. Fine. Uh, director of uh, Argentura and um, uh, you know, investigative reporter, expert on uh, um, security ser Russian security services and also co-author of the book uh, The Red Web. So, uh, it's a very dense uh, um, uh, panel because uh, uh, just, uh, I just want to show some of the timeline we, of the things we are, we are going to talk. Uh, because if you followed the news uh, uh, since last summer and the, the U.S. presidential campaign, uh, you will know there's, a li there's, a li there's been a lot of uh, unexpected things going on and uh, all mixing together in a quite confusing way also for a journalist. So I listed some of the main events, not all, not at all, no, that, uh, just to help you to have an overview or the complexity of the media landscape uh, uh, referring to, to some of the facts we are going to talk. So, you know, uh, we had like uh, the so-called DNC hack, the hacking of the Democratic National Committee in the US, and then uh, we, have, uh, we had the leak uh, of, of uh, a lot of emails that uh, uh, some of them ended up on WikiLeaks, And then we had an FBI investigation. We had uh, some very uh, strong position uh, by the U.S. government, who at the end basically uh, claimed that you know Russia was behind it. Uh, and also we had uh, also other stories about uh, uh, al uh, you know al alleged um, possible connection between Trump associates and uh, Russia and also an investigation on this. Um, of course, uh, um, if we go like this, no, no, okay, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, anyway, uh, if we go, maybe we can do this, yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Some Russian hackers. <laughs> Some Russian hackers. They are here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how many stories are here? You know, you know, in this timeline we just saw there are different stories. Of course, there is a story of the hack who did it and how. There is a story of the leaks on WikiLeaks and elsewhere, and uh, the contents of the leaks. There is the story of all the political consequences of what happened, and the story of U.S. and Russia relations, and also, uh, also the story within uh, the U.S. Uh, government in possible tension between uh, Trump or Trump administration and uh, intelligence agencies, and also what's going on in Russia, actually, which for, um, for, uh, for us, for, you know, like journalists living, you know, in Western countries, sometimes uh, I was telling before to Andrew, it's very difficult to understand now what's going on. So let's start so, from really from, from the beginning, so from the hack, okay, the hacking of the Democratic National Committee and what happened also afterwards. And so I uh, would we'll start with uh, Lorenzo because uh, you followed very closely 
uh, both the hack, the leaking, and also um, you also uh, were able to engage in chat with this uh, uh, online persona that at a certain point, uh, um, you know, like uh, came out of the blue saying, uh, claiming that he was the one who did the hack, right? And that he was a Romanian hacker, but a lone hacker, right? And it was a very interesting story because, Lorenzo, I think you were the only one who actually were able to engage him and make him uh, talk uh, via chat, right? So maybe you, you can tell a little bit both of this story and also about, you know, the, the hack and... Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, basically, yeah. this is like June 15 or 14 last year, and uh, the Washington Post reports that uh, two groups of Russian hackers uh, broke into the DNC, which is basically the, the, the Democratic Party, over the last few months, or even a year, actually. And uh, they went undetected for a few months, uh, stole all kinds of documents and emails uh, until they got caught and uh, got expelled, basically. Um, that's, that was a big story at the time. Uh, this was still, you know, a few months from the election, but basically the story was Russia was spying on uh, the Democratic Party and uh, to try to find out what they thought about Donald Trump. So even Russia was a little confused about Donald Trump. Um, and uh, this company, American company called CrowdStrike, which was um, hired to investigate the hack, comes out and says this was Russia, this was two, two groups, they call them Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear. <laughs> Um, but they, they also said that these are actually just um, spies. So they're the FSB and the GRU, which is the military intelligence in Russia. Uh, but then after like a couple of, one, not even one day, I think 24 hours more or less, um, this uh, character calling himself Guccifer II, which is, um, he takes the name from another famous, a relatively famous hacker. You might remember him because he was the hacker that, stole the paintings of George W. Bush and inadvertently launched uh, George W. Bush's new artistic career, which is a very uh, bizarre outcome from, for, him, for, for Bush. Uh, anyway, so he says CrowdStrike is wrong. Um, he doesn't say I'm not Russian, but basically that's the implication. He says CrowdStrike was wrong. I'm just a lone hacker. It was just me. I want to like denounce the Illuminati, this conspiracy theory. And, and to prove that he was really him, he, he, he does publish documents that come from the DNC. So at that point, it's not just someone that says, oh, it's me, because this happens all the time. When there's a cyber attack, uh, hackers come out and say, oh, I did it because they want to be, they want to be famous. But in this case, it does, it does look like it was him. But as Carola said, um, I tried to talk to him uh, because he, he had a Twitter account, just like everyone else. And he had open DMs, so direct messages. So I just sent him a message, and I, and I thought he was not going to answer, because at that point I was already, I suspected that he was Russian, because a lot of people were already saying, this seems too good to be true. It's, it happened too quickly. His, also, his claims are too weird. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, so I thought he, would, he wouldn't answer, because he didn't have any interest to answer. Um, but I was wrong. He answered, and... Um, I tried to test him a little bit. I asked him, you know, how did you do it? Why did you do it? Are you Russian? Uh, do you care about the election, right? Because if you hacked the Democratic Party, and you, you must care about the election. And he said, no, I don't care about the election. I don't care about Donald Trump. I don't care about Hillary Clinton. Um, and then I asked him, are you Russian? He said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not Russian. I hate Russia. Um, I hate Vladimir Putin. Um, and I said, okay, well, then where are, you, where are you from? And he said, I'm Romanian, just like the original Guccifer. I'm like, okay. And then I was like, okay, I'll ask him some questions in Romanian. I don't speak Romanian, but I went to Google Translate and I just asked him like s simple questions. And initially he was a little bit um, annoyed at me because he was like, is this a school test? Why are you asking me these questions in Romanian? Um, but he answered in Romanian um, and, uh, and his answers seemed correct. You know, obviously I don't speak Romanian, but using Google Translate, they, they made sense. But then I showed them later on uh, I showed them oh, the same day. I showed them to a few Romanian speakers. One is a journalist that works with us. Uh, I have a couple of other sources that are Romanian just by chance. And I was like, does this make sense? Is this Romanian to you? And they were like, well, this is Romanian, but it's the Romanian that maybe a person that hasn't, doesn't really, it's the second language or their third language. Um, so this, is the, this guy is definitely not Romanian um, of origin. 
and, and so this was a, yet another sign that he was lying. He was also like lying about how he hacked into the DNC. The technical details didn't make sense. So at that point, I just didn't believe him anymore. And at that point, actually, he had stopped talking to me because he was annoyed that I was asking him questions in Romanian. So he said, look, I'm busy. I have to go. And then he posted a blog post saying, if journalists want to ask me questions, send them uh, to my Twitter, and then I'll collect the best ones, and I'll answer later, which he never did, actually. Or maybe answered a few, but the most boring ones, obviously. So at that point, nobody, he, he stopped talking to people. Um, I don't know if it's because whoever was behind that Twitter account got fired by the Russians uh, for talking to me, or because uh, they just realized there was no point in talking to journalists. Yeah. But, but yeah, that was the story. And, and Guccifer has been around. The other thing is that he's been around for weeks after that, releasing documents. But then, magically, he disappeared after the, the day of the election. So the day, the day before the election in the U.S., he, he said, I'm going to monitor the election. I'm going to be a volunteer monitoring the elections. And then he disappeared for weeks. Uh, he had another blog post saying, I'm back. And then, but he basically... Yeah. Yeah. But there was also, there was also another entity, uh, which was the DNC leaks, right, at a certain point, which was uh, apparently separated from Guccifer and... Uh, yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, this is an interesting, something that a lot of people have forgotten, because this website called DC Leaks actually comes yeah, out in March or April, yeah. so three months before the DNC hack, and no one really noticed it because, noticed it because they started publishing... Uh, boring emails fr from uh, generals. One of them was General Breedlove, a relatively famous general in like military circles in the U.S., but not someone you know, not someone like Podesta or, and and no one really noticed it. Uh, there was a, an inter a, an article on the Intercept at the time, um, and I remember seeing that, and I was like, who is this, what is this DC leak? Um, but didn't that that didn't really work in the sense that they didn't get too much attention from their website. But months later, when uh, the Podesta hack happens and other data comes out, uh, researchers were able to connect the, all, all these characters together. So there was a clear link with public evidence between the DC leak website, uh, Guccifer, um, the Podesta hack, and the DNC hack. So they were all connected together. So you could c conclude that it was all part of the same operation from the same group. Okay. So uh, I think we, we can come back also on this because there are some other details that we can talk about. But uh, I wanted to ask uh, Stefania. So, um, you know, uh, of course, WikiLeaks published uh, thousands of emails from, you know, the DNC hack and also from uh, Podesta. And uh, some people, uh, even people who were like, who have been sympathetic to WikiLeaks in the past, were a little bit perplexed by this because they thought, you know, maybe WikiLeaks is kind of uh, helping uh, Trump uh, over, you know, Clinton in this case. So there was this kind of debate. So uh, I would ask you, so what do you think if uh, WikiLeaks just did what uh, have been always doing, so publishing uh, uh, leaks that things are relevant, or you know, there was a, or the time, or there was a problem of timing of it, or you know, what do you think? And also, I know that uh, not only you, as other people, uh, you, you, are, you are a bit skeptical about the Russian attribution, or at least uh, you think that you know, it's too easy f uh, for now to say this. So maybe we can we can talk sure. about this. <clears throat> so. <laughs> See, yes, I have. Um, I am. Um, uh, first of all, I want to clarify. I'm not saying that Russian intelligence doesn't do this kind of operations. Of course, they do. I mean, <laughs> that's what intelligence agencies do. They they steal information which have intelligence values, and they use this information to do all sorts of operations. We can, like, uh, for example, blackmail or uh, taking advantage, some economical, political advantage of this kind of, of this information they steal. So I, I'm not naive to believe that they, they cannot do it. Of course they can do it and they do it. I'm absolutely where they do it. So I'm not saying it's not true because the Russian cannot do it. 
they can do it, they do it as many intelligence do first. The, the US intelligence, we have seen, I have worked on the Snowden files with Glenn Greenwald. I had access to the, the files, so I know what the NSA do. And with the NSA and other intelli US intelligence, even the CIA uh, intelligence, agency do. So I'm fully aware that this is, thing, this, this is the kind of things that intelligence do. Uh, my, my, um, my skepticism is about, first of all, about the main inconsistency in the story. When you have complex stories, of course, you have many inconsistencies. That's quite normal, obvious. But in this case, here you have, a, according to the press report, I have read thousands of um, press reports. So you have the major inconsistencies. Let, let's take Guccifer. So apparently here we have a very high profile intelligent cyber espionage operation to target the US democracy at the highest level. Because when you hack uh, the presidential elections, you are hacking the US democracy at the highest level. And you cannot, do, you cannot run such operation without the highest approval. You, you need to have the highest approval to do this kind of operation. It's impossible that one day, uh, F an FSB or a GRU operative decide to hack the, the Democratic um, National Committee and go ahead and do it. You need to have political approval at the highest level. So you have this very complex, very high profile operation, cyber espionage operation, and then you have this stupid Gucci first. 2.0, going around talking to reporters using Google Translate, which is completely mad because when you use Google Translate, you expose yourself. You expose you are not a native speaker and you expose your uh, <coughs> problems with language. Not only you have this stupid Gucci fur, which uh, basically posting online documents, Microsoft Word documents, were created by an, uh, kind, uh, someone who uh, called himself, uh, let me check what is, was his, Felix Ekmundovic. This name, this was the name of the founder of the so secret Soviet police. So I mean, <laughs> if you have created this online, fake online identity in order to have this obfuscation, kind of obfuscation on this high profile cyber espionage, how can you have such a stupid obfuscation operation with such a stupid guy? I mean, it doesn't make sense. I, I really cannot understand how they can, uh, this, uh, you can have this kind of inconsistency. and. and this is not the only one we have. Look at the DNC, for example. They spent six months, six months, in order to start realizing the hacking. So you had the FBI notifying them in September 2015, but they didn't care for six months. This is completely mad. I mean, they can be, of course, uh, appallingly incompetent. That's po entirely possible, of course, but you know, it's quite incredible. You have the FBI even unwilling to go in, to, um, to the DN DNC headquarters to discuss this hacking, very high profile hacking, with the DNC executives. How is that? I mean, very bizarre. So even if you stick to the official version, there are so many inconsistencies that make you realize that something wrong with the official reconstruction. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm not saying I'm just <laughs> putting facts together. Journalists are supposed to do this, just putting facts together. And facts, as, as, a, as a, we have seen, as we have read in all sorts of newspapers, are quite bizarre in the story. What happened with the pu publication? So, I, I mean, I can bring my experience. I mean, I'm there since 2009. I know WikiLeaks uh, 
publishing methods and operations and choices since the beginning. <laughs> I work with them on everything. On uh, Afghan, before everyone, anyone could know WikiLeaks, I was already working with them. So <laughs> I have seen all sorts of publishing, all sorts of choices. Uh, I'm not saying there is something, I, I'm not saying that uh, WikiLeaks, uh, all WikiLeaks did, I know about it. Well, it's possible, of course, I'm not the CIA, I'm not here during the night. <laughs> I'm not saying <laughs> it's impossible because I, I haven't seen it. I'm not saying this. I'm saying I bring my experience, eight years experience working with them. I know how they work. And if you ask me, did you notice anything unusual during the publication of DNC email and during the publication of the Podesta email? Did you notice something wrong, something unusual, something they didn't have done before? I didn't. Absolutely, I did, and they did whatever they have done in the past with all sorts of releases. They receive materials, they cross-check materials, they publish when, when the material has the maximum impact. They publish. They, you can have the most incredible, the, they, you can have all sorts of impact, they publish. And this time, this is what I have witnessed. They did what they have done throughout their history. There's their uh, 10 years of activities. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course, uh, uh, none of us, I think, uh, has uh, the full picture of, of we are all Absolutely. trying to, to reconstruct exactly. a very this is complex puzzle. And, uh, uh, but before going back also to the uh, attribution aspect, because maybe we can go back on this, because uh, I wanted to ask Andre, you know, we, we talked about, uh, you know, the states, uh, agency, states do propaganda activities. Uh, Russia has uh, been doing it for years, but not only Russia, also the US, other states. Uh, we know that you know, there is also a, a, Rus a, tr a Russian tradition from you know, secret services of you know, active measures and other kind of things. So uh, maybe you, you could tell us something about this and also if it's possible, if you think that it's possible that on the cyber front, uh, uh, Russia... Uh, recently started to become more aggressive because, I mean, as a, uh, as a journalist covering, for instance, security, uh, I, I always know that, you know, there was a very high level uh, activity of cyber espionage that being done by Russia, right? So, uh, but uh, lately, if, if the attribution to Russia of some of these activities is correct, if... Uh, it seems that there is a more aggressive strategy, not just silent uh, cyber espionage, but really hacking, strategic leaking, hacking for doing strategic leaking, hacking for trolling sometimes. So, uh, do you think, yeah, how do you see the scenario uh, knowing Russia from the inside? And also, how do you see um, the reaction from uh, uh, U.S. and European countries who seem to be now so worried about uh, uh, Russian influence? Is it maybe we are too much worried about it? Maybe it's a little bit hyped or spinned also by Western countries? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, well, it's not, well, Russia is not like China. It's an uh, it's absolutely different country. Uh, in China, you have a uh, hierarchy, you have generals, uh, they give orders, uh, someone gets hacked, and usually it helps in terms of uh, attribution. Uh, in Russia, and I've, uh, I've been covering this issue since 1999, uh, the picture is, um, is absolutely different. Uh, the, the biggest problem is that, yes, we have uh, very powerful security and intelligence agencies, and they have cyber elements, uh, very well funded, uh, and very good uh, math mathematical schools, very good uh, cryptographers, all that stuff. But when you look into the attacks, in many cases, actually in most cases, you can see that not these people uh, were used by the Kremlin. Instead, they use so-called informal actors. 
hacktivist people who might be not directly connected to the state, they might be not part of the government institutions, they might be not in uniforms. Uh, these people, uh, they have some contracts. They are, basically, they are hired by the authorities, by the Kremlin, because it's extremely useful. It's um, actually it's outsourcing, and this outsourcing as a tactics was adopted by the Kremlin, as I said, back in 99, maybe in 2000, first to attack uh, the websites of Chechen rebels abroad. And it's uh, it's extremely useful because it helps you to lower your risks and the cost of your uh, operations. And of course, the Kremlin underst understands very clearly the benefits of these things, and they always maintains the same line, like it's not about the government, it's about some people outraged by your actions. It's about some students, and actually the very first attack we got uh, back in 1999, it was about real students from Tomsk, they attacked uh, the website of Chechen rebels in Europe, and immediately the FSB encouraged them and issued a special statement saying, look, these guys, they are doing their patriotic duty. And we got all these attacks, and most visible of them started in 2007 with the attack on Estonia. Once again, we got not students, but activists of pro-Kremlin youth movement. And why we know that? And we know that for fact, because uh, some of these people, they actually they went on the record. And uh, there was an interview in the Financial Times, and these people openly admitted they were behind this attack. And with uh, DNC hack, we have uh, actually, the same picture. The very first comment made by Dmitry Peskov, who is a spokesperson of Vladimir Putin, was we completely rule out that any government, I add with emphasis, any government organizations was behind this leak. So he made this special remark it's not about government organizations, but he didn't say it's not about us. Once again, they try to use the same line. We have some people, well, they might be engaged in this kind of operation, but it's not about, about the government. Uh, the same line was repeated by Putin personally in uh, September. He was interviewed by Bloomberg, and uh, it was a very funny um, interview. Uh, it lasted three hours, uh, and Putin was on his way to China, where he was to meet uh, President Obama. So he was asked about hacking, and uh, Putin enjoying, clearly enjoying himself, said, look, these hackers, they are so difficult to trace, they are so smart, it's absolutely impossible. And then it looks like he finally he thought, well, maybe I need to be more cautious. And uh, his, uh, and the uh, Bloomberg journalist already tried to move on to, to the next topic, but Putin stopped him and said, look, but first of all, we are not doing this on the federal level, which means the level of the government. So he, they tried to maintain this line from the beginning, and they still try to say that it's about some informal people who might be not directly connected to this. And I think it's, uh, the, that's, this is a problem. These people, I mean informal people, uh, and sometimes it's, they might be, it's not about what we need to understand. It's not about criminal hackers. It's about, sometimes it's about companies. IT companies approached by the government, the Ministry of Communications, for example, and ask you to do something. And we have these examples, we have the, the facts, how the Russian companies, really good companies, for example, companies uh, which provide uh, uh, prevention, uh, the protection against DDoS attacks, and they ask it by the government to help to launch DDoS attacks on Ukraine, for example. We know that for fact. The problem with, uh, well, of course, it's, um, it's all about context. It's not about the investigation of this particular attack. But what... Um, What's really interesting for us from the beginning is uh, this connection with Wikileaks, uh, this element, because to be honest, uh, we in Russia and lots of journalists in Russia were always a bit confused by the activities of Wikileaks uh, regarding Russia. We do not understand many things. We do not understand why Wikileaks, which is supposed to be against government, why, for some strange reasons, they decided to pick up to deal with Russia a guy who writes all, they st all his stuff in pro-Kremlin media. That really doesn't make sense. And his name is Israel Shamir, and he styled himself as a representative of Wikileaks in Russia. For some strange reasons, he published all his stuff in Komsomolskaya Pravda. And Komsomolskaya Pravda is a very pro-Kremlin media, and it is um, actually it's famous for publishing leaks from FSB, from the Russian Secret Services. 
This guy, Israel Shamir, he was compromised long time ago when he gave up lots of stuff uh, from cables to Belarusian officials and that actually that, that harmed a lot of people. Still, he maintained his access to WikiLeaks. These, I mean, uh, last year, in 2016, he published a lot of stories promising new leaks about Hillary Clinton, which for me was a clear sign that he was still in contact with the team of WikiLeaks. Why, why that happened, we don't know. Another thing which happened uh, started to me here in Perugia last year. Uh, there was a panel here, and Stefani was part of this panel, and Sarah Harrison, a chief of the investigative uh, team of WikiLeaks, was also here. And uh, it was a very strange moment, because Panama Papers was just published. Uh, it was at the beginning of April, and uh, WikiLeaks responded with uh, tweets attacking Panama Papers team. They said they questioned their credibility, their integrity, and finally they said these guys are funded by, by the US government. And that was really strange. As, and Putin personally, he picked up his argument, and when he had an, an interview, just a day before our panel here in, in Perugia, he said, I know now that Panama Papers, uh, it's a US government project because WikiLeaks said that. So I asked Sarah Harrison here, What's going on? I don't understand that. You are supposed to be all about leaks. And the principle promoted by uh, Julian Assange from the very beginning was if you believe that the information provided by a source is credible, you do not ask any questions about uh, the sources. That was the principle. So why now you decided with Panama Papers all of a sudden start questioning the source? That was really strange, and she said something about that you, you can't help me respons uh, responsible for Putin's uh, wars, but she repeated the same line. She said, yes, I believe it's very strange that Panama Papers uh, attacked firstly Vladimir Putin. And I can address the same question to WikiLeaks now. So why on earth, if you have all these leaks, why you decided to attack Hillary Clinton? Yeah, maybe... Stefania, do you want to say something? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, because this story of Israel Shamir goes back to the 2010. I mean, I never see <laughs> Israel Shamir around in eight years. Uh, never, never experience anything strange with uh, Israel Shamir. I think this goes back to the very beginning of WikiLeaks. Oh because no, 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 no! He's when? publishing his stuff now. Now? Now, now. I, as I said, in 2016, he published lots of articles in Com and Komsomolska Pravda, publishing some information from WikiLeaks and promising new leaks from WikiLeaks, well, saying, saying specifically about what's going on. Well, okay, but do you have any certainty that he has advanced access to this document? Because, you know, you can run an article just based on cutting and pasting information. Do you have, can you say that basically he has advanced access to these original documents? Because that's, that's the issue. I ha we have seen all sorts of people saying, oh, WikiLeaks is saying this according to WikiLeaks documents. Now, I mean, every time I, when I ask directly, could you please point me to the original documents you access to write this document? And they are unable to, to, to show what, which kind of documents did they have, did they access. I mean, that's why I'm wondering whether Israel Shamir has any access to original documents from the WikiLeaks. I never heard the story. I mean, I know that the story goes back to the 2010, and in the last eight years, I never heard that Israel Shamir had any access, any partnership, anything about with WikiLeaks. I can say only repeat my line that he promised in his stories that more I can promise more, more leaks Andrei. about Hillary Clinton <laughs> to come, and she specifically said what these leaks would be about. So I think it's uh, it's something quite accurate. You know, you know, Andre, I can claim whatever, but the the, the issue is whether he has access. Advance access to original documents. That's the real point because that's the access. 
to the WikiLeaks. That's the partnership, when you have advanced access to the documents. I can claim whatever. I can claim I work with Snowden, I work with... But if I don't have exclusive advanced access, well, that's different. Maybe to go uh, on the Shamir story itself, that I don't know how much uh, we should stick to it. Maybe I, I, w I, w I would like to ask you, do you think that there is a problem of perception in this moment of WikiLeaks being perceived too close to Russia? Yeah, there is a problem of perception because the, we, have, we see that basically this campaign against this, this information campaign against WikiLeaks is working. And this campaign will bring very serious consequences for WikiLeaks because they, the, since 2010, the US wanted to use the Espionage Act, which means 30 years in prison or even life sentence in prison, which is very serious, and they will do it. With this Russian conspiracy, they will do it. They will use the Espionage Act, I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure they will <clears throat> use this story for, um, for um, applying for using the Espionage Act as they did with Chelsea Manning, as they did with Edward Snowden, as they did with Thomas Drake, as they did with John Kiriakou. All these people have been persecuted using the Espionage Act. So I, I'm, sh I'm sure he, they will do it. And I'm, honestly, I'm shocked to see. I mean, it was really tragic, in my opinion, to see thousands of journalists reporting as factual evidence, something which is not factual evidence. Because if you take the 17 agent, intelligence agency uh, assessment, that's an assessment. Where, where are the evidence? Maybe we what can talk about What kind of evidence? Ju we journalists are not supposed to, to publish, you know, assessment. We are supposed to demand evidence. That's why I think I love of Glenn Greenwald. This was the only one in the US, US saying, we have to demand the evidence, because where's the evidence? Okay, so maybe, yeah, maybe we can talk about, about the evidence of, you know, so let's go back to the U.S., okay, and, mm -hmm. to the U.S.-Russia uh, hacking, leaking story, because, I mean, of course, there has been something that, uh, you know, the U.S. government attribution to Russia has been very strong. I mean, the, the way, the claim has been very strong in a, in a new way, and also there has been some analysis, some reports about it, you know, that uh, when you, I mean, attribution is a, is a tough thing to do, okay? We know that. But we know that there are some methods, some way to do it, uh, based on analysis of um, basically digital artifacts and digital traces and infrastructure, right? So there are security experts and companies doing this kind of work, which is uh, difficult, but, you know, there is a methodology in a way. So, let's go back to this. Uh, uh, Lorenzo, what do you think about this? Is the attribution uh, and the evidence showed by the U.S. government uh, um, enough, or at least is there a consensus among the uh, security researchers that uh, uh, there are, I don't know, enough evidence or maybe not enough, but uh, many circumstantial evidence. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe you, you can explain us. Yeah, I'll try to be yeah. short because we only have 10 minutes. But yeah. um, I mean, there's, there's two different things here. So the US government came out with the accusation, which is obviously very grave. And I agree, like, I would like to see more evidence. I would like to see how they, where they based this assessment on. But we also have to remember, and I'm not justifying it, but intelligence agencies don't want to tell you their secrets. You know, I'm not, I don't know if this is the case, but if they have like a phone interception of like, you know, Vladimir Putin or someone else admitting this, they're not going to release it to the public. I wish they did, but they're not going to do it. But this is one thing, and this, can, this comes in October, way later. Like before October, in the months leading up to it, there's a lot of public evidence coming, not just from American companies, but all kinds of security companies from Europe, um, independent academic researchers, people that have followed uh, these hacking groups for a decade saying this is the same group. And that's like, I think at this point, you know, I'm not a security researcher, but there's, I think that there's a 99% consensus among, in the security community that whoever was, that the people behind the DNC hack and, the, the, uh, and everything else was 
these two groups, Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, which are just code names, kind of stupid names, by the way. But anyway, uh, if you forget about the stupid nicknames, um, these are groups that have been known to many companies for years. And this means that they, um, what does this mean? These companies, th this means that uh, these companies have been followed their operations for years. This means that like they saw uh, actual attacks against their clients and customers and they were able to trace them back to this, this group because all groups have some sort of like signature, they leave behind traces, their techniques over time, they tend to repeat themselves because they're humans, they're just like us, right? I have a certain style of writing, they have a certain style of hacking and even though you can, in theory, fake it and you can pretend to be someone else, over time you just, it, you just can't and eventually you expose yourself. Now, does this mean that this group is, like Andre said, like, do they have a uniform? Do they go you know, to the Red Square and the Kremlin? Do they check in and work in the office from nine to five? That's, like, that's one step forward that we cannot say. But, but their targets are all interesting political targets for Russia. These are not like kids that want to make some money uh, putting ransomware or stealing bank data. These are people that like attack Russian journalists. They attack Ukrainian activists. They attack diplomats. These are like this is our spies. Uh, you know, they might not be uh, this might not be their full time job, but they're spies. And this is public evidence. And it goes back to like 2014, 2012. Like even at that point, like good, there was a report by Google that they didn't spell it out, but they said APT28. Oh, sorry, now their code name, but Fa Fancy Bear is part of the GRU. Like, I mean, they might be wrong. You know, it's impossible, but. This is like a consensus now. And saying that we haven't seen evidence is just not true. We have seen a lot of evidence already, more than almost in any other attack, actually. Yeah, maybe we, we could go on. Uh, not okay, okay. At the end, we, we can't really define in this panel who has been, who, who has done it. But maybe we could uh, um, uh, wonder a little bit about uh, the consequences for journalism uh, of this uh, new scenario. If we are entering, and this is a question for all because we don't have much time, and maybe there is, maybe we can ask also for questions. But if we are entering an era of uh, strategic hacking and leaking that may be done sometimes by state-sponsored actors, right? Uh, so is there the risk that, that you know, uh, Wikileaks or the media or the journalists, all of us, could be used in one way or another from one entity or another uh, in order to push an agenda or, you know, like... Uh, and so how journalists should behave in front of this scenario? Andrew. I think, I think uh, we, have, we are in a very dangerous situation. Uh, there was always a big definition between, a, a big line between, say, the Western approach to cybersecurity and Russian approach. And uh, the Russians always wanted to talk about so-called information warfare or information security. And the Americans and uh, Western Europeans were always wanted to talk about cybersecurity. What's the difference? The Russians wanted to talk about the content. That was from the very beginning, from the, at least from the 2000, uh, when we got the very first doctrine of, an, of information security. What does it mean? That the Russian generals, cyber generals, wanted to patrol the internet and to try to identify, given the content, and they tried to identify the content and then to judge who these guys and uh, these media were working for CIA or for some Western uh, hostile forces, etc. And I think it's a really big problem that all of a sudden, thanks to 2016 and DNC hack, we all sort of started talking with Russian language. We're all now talking about uh, information aggression, information warfare, we're talking about the content. And I think it's might be extremely dangerous. We already had a, uh, an example when the Washington Post uh, published a very strange article, uh, some findings of a very marky group, which listed websites critical of uh, the administration of the president, and they said, look, these guys might be puppets of the Kremlin. I think, I, I think it's really, it's a very Russian approach in a way. Uh, and I think we need to, to, be, to, be, to, to be very aware of this, of, this, of this danger, and maybe we need to remember that the thing is, the most important thing is not where you got your information, is the way how you check this information, how you write your story. 
Okay. Stefania, do you want to say something also about what yeah, the journalists, I mean, the, anyway, we don't know, we will, maybe we will never know for sure, for us, 100%, so how we should do as journalists. Yes. So first of all, I want to, I disagree with Lorenzo that we have enough the evidence. If you consider that the FBI was even unable to this day, unable to access the NC servers, this is widely reported. So the FBI basically was forced to rely on third party information, which means CrowdStrike assessment. CrowdStrike is the cybersecurity firm enrolled by the DNC. So how can you manage an independent investigation when you didn't have access to these servers? I think it's very, this is a very serious issue. I mean, CrowdStrike was paid by the DNC to, to do this investigation on the servers. And the, the FBI cannot access the DNC servers. This is a real problem. And I'm, I'm shocked by the, 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 how the press has behaved. I'm really shocked because I have seen Iraq. I have seen Iraq war. I, I know, <laughs> I mean, I think the uh, media, US media have tons of bloods, blood in their hands because of what they did with the Iraq war. And I hope not to see again what happened with the Iraq war, but we are seeing this again. They are just repeating whatever the intelligence agency is, uh, is saying, and they are running stories based on intelligence assessment, in intelligence confidence. Uh, these people don't never bring evidence. They don't ask for it. I understand that the intelligence, as Lorenzo said, may not provide evidence of interception of uh, the Russian government at the highest level. I understand this, but we journalists must remain skeptic, must say, well, I understand you cannot give me evidence, you cannot provide the evidence, you cannot make this evidence public, but I cannot believe you, because that's not what a journalist is supposed to do. He's not supposed to believe anyone. <laughs> You know, so I, I think we, the, the press coverage was a real shame, complete shame. Uh, I, I completely disagree with the press reports on this case. What about leaks? What about working on leaks? I mean, I think uh, it is a complex issue, of course. You have this problem of being used as a tool, not only with leaks. We journalists are always exposed to this risk of being used by uh, one actor or, an, or another. From this point of view, I don't see a big difference. I mean, I think it's quite usual. And it is important that we don't do this. We, we don't become the useful idiot for this or the other party. I mean, it's really important, but it's up to us, to our professionalism, and to our ethics, sure. you know? Sure. Question. Uh, any question? Yes. Uh, what was, uh, Stefania was saying, it's up to us, that's for sure, uh, but the point is that they're uh, working on uh, Ah, okay. No? Microphone? I was saying that I totally agree with you, it's up to us not be used. But when we talk about leaks, uh, WikiLeaks is our first uh, source because we, we are not you. So you cooperate with them since 2009. We have to wait for your work and for them to put the documents online. So my question for you is, do WikiLeaks vet their source or better? Do WikiLeaks ask himself, itself if the source has an agenda? Because I was in the United States in the last seven years. And during this campaign, this presidential campaign, it has been really frustrating. I felt like a puppy. Because of course, the DNC leaks, the Podesta leaks, was so important, you have to report about this, of course. But then I was like, yeah, very good. Nothing about Trump. Okay, nothing about Trump, but it's something frustrating. So do they ask the source, do they ask themselves if the source has an agenda? How? can be sure that we are not playing for Assange or for whoever. Thank yeah. you. Should I? Oh, yeah. okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, you, uh, first, very important thing, you have not to believe me. You don't believe anyone. <laughs> don't believe anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but in any case, don't believe anyone. You 
when it comes to WikiLeaks, they publish everything. They publish documents, original documents. Anyone can, everyone can access documents, check them, and see whether the journalist saying. Okay, I know. Let me come to your question. Why not about Mr. Trump? Well, <laughs> Yeah. Is this source uh, as this source an agenda? Okay. So that's the point. Yeah. Are you for them or not? So first of all, uh, you have to realize that WikiLeaks has a submission system to send material, secret documents and material sources want to re to send. So in many cases, WikiLeaks has no idea about its sources. They don't know the source identity. So, <laughs> I mean, it's quite difficult to understand the motivation, the, 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 uh, so it's not an issue for Assange. No, no, I mean, they don't, the wait, 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 I'm not saying this. I'm not saying they are not questioning uh, the, 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 what the source is doing. They don't know, often they don't know. They have no idea about the identity of the source because this submission system is completely anonymous and we know that it is anonymous because during the Manning trial, during the Manning trial, it was proved that basically this system provided pro protection to Manning. So we know this. But when you receive documents, so le let's have this situation. WikiLeaks receive thousands of DNC documents. They check, because they do check documents. I can tell you they, they seriously check documents. And we check documents. We partner do parallel checks because we don't trust anyone. Sorry. So maybe we can continue. Yeah, yeah. we check. Yeah. We, they check. But OK, but what should they, uh, they done? Not publishing information in the public interest? Maybe we can go on. Th thank you for being thank you very here. Much. Maybe we can go on. Uh, yeah, maybe we can meet outside if you want yeah. to continue talking.
speak, anyway, Andrew speaks perfect Italian. All Irish people speak Italian. It's a well-known fact. My dad speaks food Italian. Food, yeah, it's the best one. And the language of love. My my mum might come once her panel's finished. Oh, very good. What time does her panel finish? I don't know. Okay, I just have to do a little bit of work and then I can go. It's nice to be here again. Do you think I need to wear the... You can take it off if you want. Yeah. It's up to you. Yeah. I'm going to take another stab at actually trying to pour water out of this bottle. No, see? See, there's no way to do that that doesn't just spray water over it. There's no way to pour water out of this thing that doesn't spray water over it. So apologies if I end up showering you slightly with the... Okay. Okay, I think we will make a start because we're starting a little bit late and we have to wrap by 5 p.m. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for um, this session on collaboration through news literacy. I know it is a beautiful day outside and uh, appreciation appreciate you making your way indoors to join us. Um, I want to introduce first and foremost Max Wolf. Uh, you may have seen he's on the programme later for 5.45 on a session about communicating the news to young people. But he was kind enough uh, to join us for this panel because um, many of us have been discussing news literacy for months now and we find ourselves talking about this upcoming generation who, are, who isn't on the social platforms like Facebook yet and how can we be thinking about those future generations when it comes to literacy and trust and, and creating informed communities. So Max is 10 and he's going to keep us honest here today and tap us on the shoulder when we say something that he disagrees with or has something to say for himself. So thank you, Max. Um, beside Max, we have Charlie Beckett and uh, Charlie is a London School Economics Media Professor and also the Director of the Think Tank um, Polis. We have Dan Gilmore all the way from San Francisco and Dan is a lecturer in media literacy with the Walter Cronkite uh, School of Journalism in Arizona State University, so thank you to Dan. And we also have Miri Hamilton who is executive editor of audience with The Guardian. So hopefully we've got a good representative of people who think about this a lot, the likes of Mary, who is day-to-day -day in the newsroom, trying to build engagement around stories, getting people to trust in the journalism of The Guardian. And then Max, who, too young yet to be on Facebook, will, will have a lot of thoughts for us to think about. Where I wanted to start today is that I'm conscious from talking to a lot of you, uh, we've been talking about fake news for days, which has been wonderful in trying to kind of diagnose the problem and kind of come to some agreement. But I'm really hoping over the next 15 minutes, this is going to be a session about solutions and opportunities. Um, because in just a matter of weeks, um, I, Dan and I, back in December, had a conversation at Newsgeist in Phoenix, Arizona, around this whole topic of news literacy and what does it mean to create informed communities and build trust in journalism. And the point Dan made at the time was, yes, Facebook and I put my hand up and say we have work to do and we're taking our responsibilities seriously. But there are also bigger industrial things we can do across the news industry to solve for uh, some of the, the, the pain points that we've all experienced. And just about six, seven, eight weeks ago, uh, we held this working group in Arizona State University. We brought 50 people from all over the world from platforms, from universities, third-party organizations, academics, educators, to Arizona State University from Friday to Sunday. And we spent three days talking about the problems and solutions and action. And going away on the Sunday, there were five big themes that we all agreed on. And two of them, I'm really proud to say, in a matter of weeks, um, many of us have been able to action on. And the first ask coming away from Arizona State University that weekend was 
build a coalition of experts, people who think about this, who do journalism day in, day out, and get some money behind it. And hopefully most of you saw the announcement of the News Integrity Initiative this week, which is a collaboration with 25 funders and participants all over the world. But it's just the start, and I will mention the email throughout this session for those of you who hopefully are going to sit here today and go, I have an idea that you know, Max is talking about, or Mary, or Dan, or Charlie. I have an idea that's going to help action that. And you can access, there is 14 million US dollars in funding for research and projects to really help with news literacy and trust. Um, and the second thing that came out of ASU, and, and Dan and others will speak to this, was the idea of education and tips and tricks and information on Facebook. And this week we announced public service announcements that at the top of newsfeed when you come in there you will see you know, some ideas about how to go about sharing content in a responsible manner. So those are some of the things we'll touch on, but we really want this session to be one of optimism, getting to some ideas and solutions, and what action looks like coming out of here after a series of meetings in London and Berlin and Phoenix. So the first place I do want to start is just this term that we use, which is news literacy. And I'm sure for some of you sitting here today, that feels like a little bit of a, a foreign concept and maybe one that doesn't resonate day to day. So maybe starting with, with you, Charlie, you might explain to us what news literacy means to you and is that even the right phrase that we should be using? Yeah, I, I think that it is a, a good phrase to start from. Um, obviously, I work in a university, so I think that education is a good thing. It pays for, you know, pays for my beer. Um, but, of course, news literacy has got to be more than that. But it should start there, perhaps with people like Max. You know, in the UK, we've got a problem where the curriculum has been stuffed so full of other important things that the topic of citizenship, which used to include uh, a kind of media news literacy uh, learning, has dropped away. Um, so, certainly, we need to see more of uh, news education in schools, but I see it much more as a sort of lifelong thing. And it's got to be more than just uh, talking at people uh, in a kind of top-down way. News literacy has to be about creativity. It has to be about empowering people, not just to understand how the news works or how journalism works, but how they, especially because of social media and so on, uh, how they not can negotiate, just negotiate um, through the news, but can contribute to it and can be a critical thinking uh, when they are con consuming it. But beyond that, I think we ought to think of news literacy as part of a kind of uh, media citizenship. And so all the stakeholders involved in uh, news production and dissemination need to build in the idea of literacy into what they do, and that includes, um, you know, governments and corporations who produce content. They've got to make sure that it's accessible, that it's understandable, that it's accurate and reliable, and as I said, that it also empowers people, that people can share that information, they can interact uh, with that uh, information as well. And I think, of course, you know, the, the platforms like Facebook and Google and so on also have a responsibility to build in uh, literacy uh, into what they do. They have to have the kind of signals to help people negotiate the way through information. Uh, that also signals to people the quality of that information, for example, and the discoverability of it. Um, and beyond the platforms, of course, there's the journalists as well. And I think that you know, journalists would tend to sort of say, well, that's what we do. We make information that's intelligible and accessible. But, and of course there is, there's some fantastic work going on, mainly driven, of course, uh, by uh, the desire for survival. You know, trying to make business, trying to connect to audiences. But I think there's a lot more that uh, journalism can do to be more transparent, to be more interactive, uh, to think from the user perspective, first of all, in terms of, you know, what is relevant to people, what kind of information do they uh, need and want, and how can they best understand it and, and share it. So I think it's something that can be built into, in all sorts of ways that we can talk about, uh, into journalism itself. And in that sense, and it's a phrase we've sort of used a bit, you know, fake or false news, I think, is a 
a, a wonderful opportunity uh, for the news industry. And I think news literacy is a wonderful, uh, I see it more as a kind of relationship or a tool that journalists can build in and it has a kind of ethical public service value as well. Uh, and this all adds real value uh, and real connectivity with the audience. So it's not just a classroom thing. I think it's got to be uh, integral to, to whatever we do. Dan, do you want to pick that up? Uh, sure. I, uh, Charlie's covered most of the points I would have made here. Uh, let me make one or two further. We have a, a, a demand problem, not just a supply problem. And that's where I start when it comes to this notion of news literacy, which is a term I don't uh, object to. It, I wish I had a better one, but it, it, it'll, for now it's fine. Uh, it, the news literacy is a subset of what people have called media literacy in uh, the academic world for a long time. And it, these things basically mean uh, knowing how to uh, both consume and create with integrity and uh, at some level just know what we're talking about. We have a, the, the demand side of the uh, equation in the sort of the fabled marketplace of ideas is, has been underserved by everybody uh, for a long time and the three, uh, the three entities that I think should be the leaders in helping people be as Charlie put it, critical thinkers, which is really what this is about, uh, start with educators. And actually, uh, uh, the people who teach this would say that a good time to start in the schools is, is when someone is about Max's age, uh, or perhaps earlier, but that it never stops. And a second uh, institution that should be pr uh, leading the way, if we want to make this uh, scale beyond schools, uh, is the news industry itself, which uh, I, I should say that there are many ways that they can do it, starting with being transparent about what they do, why they do it, how they do it, uh, in any number of ways. But there are other things, and The Guardian is exemplary uh, compared to almost all other news organizations. And the final player in this has to be the, uh, the big technology platforms which are subsuming so much of the conversation and information and I'm glad to see them making steps uh, in the last couple of weeks. Great. Thank you, Dan. So, uh, Max, uh, Dan says there are three types of people who have to take responsibility for this. So there's people like me in Facebook. There's people like Mary in the Guardian newspaper, and then there's schools and teachers. So what do you think? Do you think this is something that would be useful to be taught in, in schools back yeah. in Birmingham? Um, I think that um, they, the kids need to understand that it's not like all shooting and fun. It's actually um, like really serious and that um, it's quite important important to know um, about what's ha what's going on in the world and what's happening whereas just like praying for the people who have died in like wars and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, so to be able to ask like really tough questions as well and understand who to trust and who not to and how yeah. to go and find somebody like Mary Hamilton yeah. when you're not so sure is there somebody I should trust. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Miri, picking that up, like, you know, we start from news literacy. I think you start from a different point of view uh, in the newsroom as somebody who, who thinks about elements of this day to day, but I think you would back up a little bit. So, do you want to kind of give us your approach to some of the things we're talking about? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that making sure that our news is accessible and that we're actually kind of telling people the stories that they most need is a crucial element of what every newsroom has to be thinking about now. Um, but I think that there's a broader issue, um, which is around accessibility and relevance. So there was an interesting study done uh, last year, um, and the study itself was around filter bubbles. The results are interesting. Um, but what's more interesting to me was the methodology by which that study was completed. So it used Bing toolbar users, which is a bit kind of eh, but it's, you know, at least you can tell that one toolbar user is probably one person. 
Um, and they started out with a pool of 1.2 million um, users. And they went through the top 20 US news sites and classified um, sections of those sites into, I guess, what you'd call hard news versus entertainment and versus opinion. Um, and the criteria for their study, they wanted people who'd read, um, I believe it was four hard news stories and two opinion pieces in the last two months. And that took their 1.2 their, their million users. 4% of that group had actually read that many news stories and opinion stories. Now, to me, that's actually a much larger issue than the issue of the people who are already engaged but perhaps don't know who to trust. The broader issue is the people who are not engaged, who maybe don't want to be engaged, who don't see why news is relevant to them, or who are having trouble accessing news that is relevant to them. And I think that, especially in the US, this is kind of concordant with some of the uh, deterioration in local news, um, which we're starting to see signs of in the UK as well, though with the BBC present, that does... So to some extent serve to, to shore that up. Um, so we kind of have multiple sort of, we have, we can't, we have a, a sort of nested doll of problems here. Firstly, there's the issue of how do you get people who just don't care to start to care about news sort of as more broadly? Secondly, how do, you, how do we as newsrooms create news that actually engages those people, helps them understand why news is relevant to them? Um, then you get into questions of people starting to understand what sorts of news are, what sorts of news they're reading, whether or not they can trust the sources that they're reading, and you even start getting into questions like, well, if I know I can trust the Guardian, do I, as a reader, understand whether or not I'm reading an opinion piece or a leader, which is the Guardian's sort of branded opinion versus a, a reported news story? Um, and do most readers not necessarily understand the difference between them? Um, so there's kind of a, a sort of a broader set of issues here than just um, just things that are accessible and, and, and deliverable through uh, through, in, through a newsroom sort of tweaking what we do. Um, I think the other thing I'd say is that schools is a kind of crucial element of engaging with news literacy. But my sense um, is that by the time Max, by the time you're old enough to vote, we might be delivering the news on voice interfaces through um, distributed sort of technology platforms that aren't accessible today. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what skills we can teach you now that you're going to be able to use in 10 years' time to, to accurately assess those new forms of delivery. I'm wondering if you guys have thoughts on that. It's not, teaching, it's not about teaching Max how to use any technology. It's about making sure Max is skeptical of everything he sees, uh, that which I think uh, a lot of younger people are, which is a good thing. They're not skeptical enough of their friends. That's the that's a problem. But it's good that they're getting skeptical. That, that's very helpful. Okay, so giving people access to content, one problem. I, you know, we've used the word trust a lot in the last few days. Like, are large pieces of literacy really, in fact, just about trust? Before we get to kind of solutions and action, is that Charlie or Dan? Some of the is that one of the biggest problems here that we have to tackle for first and only by solving for trust can we get to solutions then around literacy and access? And Miri talks about labelling and branding. Yeah, and I think trust is another one of those words which we use, and we should always use it in a sort of qualified way. That trust is never absolute. It's not that um, it's, you know one particular source or one particular news brand is entirely trustworthy and others are not. Uh, and any given bit of content, you know, it's always uh, arguable. And that's, again, what we mean about this idea of critical thinking. But again, uh, it, it, it seems to me blatantly obvious that to, for people to understand how they might trust uh, a piece of content or a source, then we, we should get, they should have tools in the same way uh, that we do when we you know, drive a car. We expect to have a map. We expect the engine to work in certain ways and the buttons to have you know, certain effects. And we, we learn how to drive. Where you take that car still depends upon you. And I think literacy is a bit like that. Mm -hmm. you know, that uh, and, the, and the trust is, if you like, to pursue this metaphor to death, uh, the trust is a bit like the fuel in the car. You know, um, it, it's it's a, a means to understand and um, and evaluate content. It's not a given. It's not a, there's not going to be a trust button, I hope, anyway, on Facebook that tells you that this is good and this other stuff is not trustworthy. It's much more about a relationship. And, of course, you know, what Mary's been talking about, it, it, this is already 
this is already happening to a degree, but I think we can tell, you know, the fake news, so-called, is a bit of a kind of wake-up call. It's, a, it's more of a symptom of a wider sense that people feel this overwhelming. It's partly about scale of information. There's so much information. And somebody like Max, quite different to, you know, the dark ages when I was your age, um, where there was a scarcity of information, but Max, if he's anywhere near the internet, there's going to be news somewhere whether he, you know, whether he chooses to have it or not. And I bet your generation is much more exposed to news, even if you don't go looking for it, uh, than anyone else. So this isn't some sort of option. It, it's a tool for living. Right. Okay. So, Max, you were telling us earlier that you like The Guardian. I'm not sure that was just because Mary <laughs> happened to be standing beside that, you. <laughs> <laughs> but why is it that you like looking at The Guardian and... So tell me the answer to that. But if you were to bring the Guardian newspaper into your classroom and your teacher was to, to start teaching your, your classroom about the Guardian, what are the, some of the things you would like if this, this was a special class about what, what sources, what news to trust, what do you think would your friends be interested in learning? How would your teacher need to go about ensuring that by the end of the class they know some questions to ask. So what do you think would be useful to people your age in a classroom? I think more on some of the elections that are going around in the world and a bit more on this country than other countries around the world. Um, so understanding think, how yeah. politics and elections yeah. work... Okay, so getting to the who and the what and the where and the how and the why, which are all the things that journalists think about every day. Yeah. So having kids kind of think about those questions. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Dan, this is something you've given a lot of thought to, is the classroom situation. So going back to mo big moonshot ideas, and we all know from coming to conferences like this, there is funding, there are big ideas. What are some of the things that you feel really passionate about and that the time is finally here to come and ex execute on to action? I uh, wouldn't know where to start. The, uh, I did want to quickly uh, say something about what Charlie and, had said about trust. The, uh, there are tens of millions of people in the United States who trust, uh, in the United States, who trust everything Donald Trump says and that Breitbart puts on its website and that Fox News plays every evening on its commentary shows. Uh, so I'm, like Charlie, wary of the word trust. Uh, I'm not sure what, what it means if it, it's, I think we want to trust things that are true. That would be a, that would be a good start. But some of, the, some of the things that came out of that meeting we had uh, that I thought were pretty interesting ideas, uh, some years ago in the United States, there was a campaign against tobacco, basically, against smoking cigarettes. And through lots of public information and uh, uh, advertising and other campaigning uh, and uh, propaganda, outright propaganda in search of truth in, the, in this case, People were persuaded, younger people in particular, were largely persuaded that smoking was kind of disgusting and a bad thing. Maybe we could persuade the world uh, in, a, in an analogous way that spreading uh, lies is a bad thing. I don't know if that's possible, but it's a big idea that a couple of people had. Uh, uh, things vary by country. I don't know exactly what happens in UK schools, so I, I wouldn't extrapolate ideas from the US system, which is very haphazard uh, in educating people on any of this stuff. But uh, there's, there, there were you know, people saying, let's, let's make sure we get every single 12-year-old in America uh, to understand how to be a critical thinker and to understand the difference between what's true and what's not. I would probably add to that based on what Mary is saying. How do we get them to care about what citizenship is all about, which is not just voting, but participation, and, and many other things. So we have a list. Mary. <laughs> so I think 
on that on that trust point. Um, trust is about is it, at its heart is about trusting the motives of other people, um, and this is something that has keep, that keeps sort of coming up in discussions that we're we're having here and elsewhere. Um, if basically fundamentally, if you are able to believe that the motives of the people that you're arguing with or of the organization's work that you're reading, if you, if you trust that their motives are good or aligned with yours, then you can get somewhere. And if you believe that their motives are not aligned with yours or they are somehow underhand, then you're never going to trust what they say, even if what they say accords beautifully with what you personally believe. And we're in a universe now where the mainstream media or the MSM, which is the acronym that gets used um, certainly in UK circles, is actively distrusted by a lot of people. People. And it's, it, you, it's gotten to the point now where that belief that the mainstream media is not trustworthy is self-reinforcing to the point where you can see people tweeting things like, the, no, the MSM won't tell you about this story and the link will be to like the, the Telegraph or the Guardian or the BBC, which is probably as close to being mainstream media as you can realistically get. Um, but people are just that there is, there is a disconnect in, um, in a lot of public discourse between this idea of media I can trust, i.e. media where I believe and I, I am in accordance with the motives of, and the mainstream media. So there's a real task and a real challenge for us there about how we become more transparent about who owns us, why we act the way we do, what the decisions we make, and why we make those decisions. So at The Guardian, you know, we're, we're doing several things around that. We're looking at... Um, how we better signpost our ownership structure. So for those who don't know, The Guardian is owned by a trust. We um, are not owned by um, a sort of single kind of proprietors. Um, how we are transparent about our ownership structure, how we say that actually we're owned by a group of people whose job is to promote and sustain our journalism, and that's their only job. There is no sort of grand profit-making enterprise. There are no shareholders that are making bank. We're not owned by um, you know, individuals who are trying to use the organisation to gain political power. Um, and when people find that out, we discover that they tend to trust us much more. The problem is how we tell them that in a way that doesn't just sound like kind of grabbing them by the throat and saying, hey, you should trust us. Because the minute you sort of aggressively try to push that, that puts people off. So there's a kind of very sort of complicated and dance that you have to do around explaining to people some of the motive forces behind what they're seeing without making them feel like you're aggressively trying to persuade them to trust you because one of the worst things you can do in order if you want to be trusted is demand that somebody trusts you They're because immediately people get suspicious. It's a really kind of messy, complicated space. What does transparency look like on a practical level? Like, is it showing people like Max and everyone here how the sausage is made? You know, you know what did the journalists do to verify their sources and the location and, and the date? So giving more of kind of almost the metadata data behind the story like do you think th that would be helpful signposting as well and is that something across platforms and publishers that we need to be thinking about is some kind of universal context that we give the audience that will one help with trust and two help them make a decision about is this informing me is this something I've now reached my own uh, decision on that I feel comfortable sharing with my friends and family I think, honestly, I think that's part of it. I think there's a great deal that we, we, could, we already signal a lot, of, a lot of this stuff in news stories. We already sort of, you know, when we use quotes, um, there's specific kinds of language that we'll use around those quotes. Um, or around bylines, for example, we might, say, we might include datelines to indicate that there is actually a reporter on the ground doing reporting physically present. Um, on opinion pieces, we might include in the byline two, two sentences that explain why somebody was asked to write about this particular topic. Are they an expert? Are they someone who has an opinion that we believe needs to be taken more seriously? Um, and I think, you know, I think the Trust Project um, has looked at a whole sort of range of different uh, elements that go into uh, making a news story that is as... as Truth is complicated, right? But a verified news story where a journalist has been involved, has gone out and gotten quotes. It's not a rewrite of somebody else's story. It contains original reporting. I think there's elements around that that we could start to surface um, across platform in a way that would be helpful algorithmically to platforms as well when it comes to deciding um, sort of what signals to look for um, in the content that gets promoted. Right. Are there, and throw this open, Charlie or Dan or Max, but like, are there innovative 
things that we should be thinking about that redefine journalism and make it more relevant to people now, that we almost need to go back and think about how to make information and news cool. Like, there's almost, you know, there's going to be no one solution here, but it's thinking about how people relate to news and to stories. And what does that look like? Well, I don't know about making it cool, but in, in a funny kind of way, you know, news is already highly in demand. People consume more news than ever before, especially when you do a, a, defini- a broader definition, and they may not call it news. One of the things we've discovered is that people consume a lot of news without thinking of it as news, and that's partly because, of course, you know, it pops up in your so-called news feed uh, on Facebook or whatever, alongside a whole bunch of other stuff that may be personal, entertainment, whatever, and so it kind of gets mixed up. And then if you, if you turn that one around, uh, I think Mary sort of said it's interesting about uh, sort of algorithms. I'm interested partly in, if you like, the news literacy of the journalists in the sense of trying to understand what is it that people are interested in. I don't just mean that you're going to do whatever they want just to get clickbait, but that we actually don't understand much about the conversations uh, that people are having out there. And one of the things that I hope will emerge over the next uh, year or two is better understanding of and uh, usage of things, artificial intelligence, uh, of data analysis that will tell us more about what is already happening in the sort of information ecosystem out there. What are people talking about? What interests them? And where the gaps are as well, as Mary said, where are the gaps where people uh, aren't getting uh, information or good information. So I think there's a lot that we can find out more. So not just data analytics, analytics about you know, how many people click on your website or how many people read the story, but actually trying to discover more. And I think that is a kind of uh, literacy about news or about the public for news people. And some, something that we've been um, working on or started to work on fairly recently um, is explicitly asking readers um, in, on some stories around some topics, what would you like to know more about? What, what don't you understand? Uh, we tried this with um, exactly. the uh, conflict in Yemen um, and discovered quite quickly that there were sort of consistent, A, that there's an enormous appetite from readers to have some basic questions answered, mm. and B, that those questions are not always questions that we, the questions that we are expecting um, readers to, uh, to have. So that's kind of, I think we're still kind of at the beginning of a process of understanding what we do with that knowledge and how we disseminate it. But of course, that's only something that we can really achieve on our own platform. And, you know, I know we've, various people in other panels have sort of discussed the, the, the data issue. Um, but there's a real question mark for us. If, what, if we see as part of our public uh, mission is getting news out to communities where historically or, or sort of demographically, we don't think news is being read or being understood. We have very few methods digitally of understanding um, whether or not we're being effective at that. And that's something that, you know, platforms like Facebook absolutely have the data store to be able to help us to understand and yep. to see that. Um, and I think that'd be an, a, a very interesting place for collaboration. Yeah, like that question of data is one that has come up uh, in all of our travels in recent weeks at workshops and roundtables. And um, and for those of you who saw Adam Masseri's keynote yesterday, this was something that Jeff Jarvis asked about. And I think Adam gave a commitment there that this is something we're hearing and we'll go back inside and, and look at seeing what are the opportunities around that because it's, it's definitely something that's been represented by journalists world over at the moment. Max, I want to ask you about a, 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 the example that, that Miri gave there, that you know, journalists publish a story, and at the bottom there is, what more would you like to know? Have, have we done a good job at explaining this story to you? Do you think that, that journalists and editors do a good job of asking readers and the public, have we told you everything you need to know? Do you think they do a good job of communicating complex issues to, to children? Um, I think that for kids' news programs, they kind of look down on us and think we need really easy stuff that to get our hands on. But I think they look down on us too much, and then it gets confusing for the kids, and they put in less detail than we want them to. So I think adult news programs programs like CNN and BBC are more 
appropriate than the actual ones that are made for kids. Okay, that, that's interesting. Hopefully everybody will take that point on board going back to your newsrooms next week. Um, I throw this question out to each of you, um, which is that, you know, Aaron Pilhofer um, has often asked this question of what would news organisations look like if they optimise for trust? So we're coming back to this again. This has been a question that has come up at a lot of conferences in recent years and in discussions with journalists. Uh, we now have the ability, if we need to, to go and do research. We have the ability to tap into funding, probably like never before. It's pretty unprecedented. So now that there is this opportunity, Charlie, Mary, Dan, um, to build newsrooms, optimise for trust, for creating informed communities, for improving literacy, what is that going to look like in 2017? That's my final question before we throw it out to the audience to see are there some tangible ideas that the News Integrity Initiative should be thinking about. God. <laughs> Um, very quickly, just what well, I think is partly it's going to be about continued experimentation. I always think, for example, about you know the Guardian a few years ago, as a you know pioneer of transparency. You did that thing where you they published their news list every day, so the public could see what the journalists were thinking about. Um, and I think it died a death, didn't it? Because nobody bothered looking at it after a while, because it, it was a bit dull. Um, and, of course, the exciting thing is to be in the newsroom talking about it. And I know you sort of wanted people to do that. And I think the lesson of that is very much that um, these initiatives should start from the user point of view. And as Mary said, news organisations know quite a bit about the people who already use their news, although as you said with that last great example, you, you, you can still find out much more about how you can add value to that relationship. So I, I, I think that, that it's not just about this business of having widgets or badges on the content. It really is about trying to discover more. And we do now have, we have the technology increasingly. Uh, I mean, Jonathan Albright's fantastic presentation about fake news was hugely alarming and disturbing. But that same kind of analysis might be able to tell us other things about what people are talking about, what they're interested in. And so we might be able to use that kind of uh, information to inform uh, the way we make our journalism. When you, Charlie, think to research, though, where do you feel, before we go spending money on it, um, coming in and commissioning projects and, and ideas, stepping back for a moment, though, where for you... Is somebody who's passionate about research and applied research, where do we need to start? Like, where are some of the gaps right now in our understanding that we quickly have to get to grips to with if collectively platforms, <coughs> publishers, educators, schools are going to actually spend money in meaningful ways? I mean, I could, I could list you 10 very fundable research projects that we could do tomorrow. But I think one of them, for example, it would be partly to road test some of the assumptions we now make so, for example, when we have that conversation about uh, false news and filter bubbles, we often start s citing behavioural science. And most of us know nothing about behavioural science, but we start citing it in quite a sort of deterministic way. We say, human beings are hardwired to only believe stuff that they agree with. I'm not so sure that that very simple statement is an adequate way to think about people's relationship to truth and information. So I would, for example, like to do much more work on, you know, how news is situated in people's lives. It's almost like an anthropology thing, so it's not really my department. Um, but that idea of really going to how people, the relevance of news literally uh, in people's lives, and often the paradoxical and contradictory relationships that they have news. We tend to make kind of rational assumptions. I don't know why. People aren't, they're human, they're not rational. Um, so there's lots of research that isn't just about the algorithm and, and the numbers. It is a kind of behavioural uh, a question, I think, as well. Dan or Mary, anything you want to pick up there? Well, I think there's something, I think something interesting about this idea of sort of news organisations optimising for trust, because... An individual organisation optimising for trust is sort of all well, and, all well and good, but the entire industry is never going to do that. There are organisations that are not interested in optimising for being trusted or in optimising for truth. And I think we have to, you know, actually accept as an industry that that is the case. Um, and that functionally, the Guardian article and a Breitbart article may be 
indistinguishable to the average reader, um, in part by design and in part through, you know, if we're all on instant articles, it all looks the same anyway, and it's actually very difficult to tell where the source is coming from. Secondly, certainly within Facebook's ecosystem, and I think in other ecosystems as well, we know that users trust the person who shares, not necessarily the source. The vast majority of sort of trust in that network is owned by the individuals, not by brands. And Facebook's algorithm prioritizes, you know, information that your friends and family have shared over and above the tr trustworthiness or um, truthfulness of any given source. So actually, The Guardian could optimise every single element of its processes for truth tomorrow and probably be sitting exactly where we are now, having had no meaningful impact on the broader media ecosystem. So I'd like to kind of throw that question back and say, what would Facebook look like? What would platforms look like if they were optimised for trust? <laughs> yeah, great question. So <laughs> the, the question of not knowing who your source is sometimes um, when, when something is pushed out from friends and family. This, again, is something that's been coming up, particularly the last few weeks, that idea of can Facebook help to amplify the Guardian brand more so that somebody doesn't just turn around and say, I saw it on Facebook, and instead they say, I saw it from the Guardian on Facebook. And that's definitely something we're giving thought to. How can we better amplify the Guardian, for example, as a brand? Um, one of the other things we're giving a lot of thought to, there's been this huge debate about polarization. Um, and so one of the things that we're giving a lot of thought to is how can we serve up more content? And rather than, you know, let's say you read a right-wing point of view or a left-wing point of view, rather than just serve you up an alternative one point of view, we have found through our research that that actually tends to make people more entrenched in their original point of view. So one of the things that we're looking at is, can we serve up instead a suite of different perspectives? So maybe you see four or five different content pieces so you can see where exactly your opinion currently falls and that maybe by seeing a, a selection of four or five articles that's going to help you build a more complete picture and that's something we really do want to get to for for those of you who saw Mark Zuckerberg's 6,000 word letter some weeks back um, that was one of the core goals in there is that you know polarization you know the the idea of unconscious biases that has existed for a long time how through a platform like Facebook, which is unprecedented in its 1.8 billion community, how can it be a place where you come to find the complete picture? And it's something we're giving a lot of thought to, Mary, and I really hope we'll be able to come back here this time next year and really demonstrate that we've taken feedback like that on board. So, Can I just, yeah. just say, I, I, I agree with you know, Mary's call for you, know, you to think a lot, or sorry, not you personally, I mean, but, um, but <laughs> face, Facebook and the others, you know, everyone else. Uh, uh, Facebook is still not the whole world, we, we should remind ourselves. But I think it's important that we don't think of, of, especially with news literacy, that we don't think of this as a solution or the solution. Yeah. You know, this is a process, and we don't actually want to have a one um, standard. I think we want a kind of diversity um, in news literacy, a diversity in trust, uh, if you like, a kind of competition of trust. The useful thing is for people to have the literacy to make the choices. But, you know, I, I, I don't want to even, I certainly don't want Facebook to decide, yep, you know, the Guardian is approved, stamp, mm -hmm. you know, because you can't. Some of the Guardian stuff is dreadful, <laughs> you know, and should not be trusted. Very little, of course, but most of it's <laughs> magnificent. But, you know, so, so I'm very loath yeah. to start having, um, you know, rigid codes. Um, and I'm loath to have, especially dominant mm -hmm. uh, platforms, making absolute decisions, which I know you weren't talking yeah. about. You were talking about a, a, a range, you know, and I think it's the best. Yeah, and I, I think on that, um, like Facebook does not want to be the arbiters of truth, and I'm sure many of you would, would agree to that. But we do have a responsibility for how people use our platform and the conversations that they have there. And hopefully a lot of you have learned in the last few days about how we are taking those responsibilities seriously, particularly when it comes to false news and um, attaching trusted sources. So like, very quickly, for those of you who haven't seen it, we do have this program around uh, false news and misinformation where our community are flagging what they believe to be suspicious content. Third-party fact-checking organizations are working on that content when more than one of them agrees that this is hoax, this is not something to be trusted. They can put a flag on it for the Facebook community that says, 
This has been disputed by third-party fact-checking organisations. You should consider whether you really want to share this. And that can potentially be downranked in Facebook. You can't put ads to it. So there's a lot of work like that happening on Facebook as part of just wider solutions. And I think that's an important point. I, for one, would not sit here today and say news literacy is the only solution. It's one of a myriad of things that we have to do as a platform, but also in collaboration with the industry. This is a, is a problem that is ultimately bigger than Facebook, and we have to work with the industry uh, to address it. Um, okay, throwing it out to the floor with the few minutes that we have left, who would like to go first with a question okay, here at the front? Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to share a thought with the panel. In the old day, people used to say, oh, I've seen that news on TV, therefore it's true. Now it's, I've seen that news online, therefore it's, it's true. And I agree, it's our role at the school, at the community level, to build uh, uh, people critical thinking so that they are skeptical of what they are presented. My, conce my concern is how to find the right balance uh, to find the middle way bet between being skeptical with uh, what we are presented, especially when it comes from our government and the authorities, uh, and to not fall into not believing uh, what we are presented or into all the conspiracy theory that are uh, polluting the internet. Just to give an example, like uh, a few years ago in the US uh, with the uh, Obama birth certificate story that Trump kept uh, hanging that, oh, it's a fake, and uh, even all the hard facts, he, ke he kept saying that it's uh, the birth certificate presented by Obama, it's a fake, and uh, we should not believe in it. And um, so my, question, my question is, like, uh, as much uh, hard fact and well-checked uh, information you can present it, you will always find someone who will say the op opposite. And with now uh, the open uh, source on the internet, it, it takes you a few seconds to find the opposite. So um, I agree that uh, news literacy is important, but uh, maybe we should bring into the conversation also accountability to hold accountable people who are spreading uh, fake news and who are damaging our democracy. And um, maybe sometimes we focus too much on tools. We want a tools, we want a technique, but uh, maybe it's much more complex than that. And how to hold accountable people who are uh, spread fake news. I don't know if we should like shut uh, uh, Trump uh, um, uh, Twitter account. <laughs> um, just like holding ac accountable people uh, who spread uh, fake news. Who would like to take that first? So I think I'm going to try and summarize your question, but it's trying to kind of get that balance between being skeptical but not buying into every conspiracy theory. So that's one part of your question. And the second part of your question, I think, is how do you maybe reward people who share accurate, trustworthy information and how do you maybe hold people accountable who share faults and, and misinformation? Anyone want to pick up those kind of two strands of the question? I mean, all I would say... Do you want to? No, no, Thank you. Um, I, I was just going to say that, uh, yes, but I, I, I sort of believe in a kind of um, marketplace of ideas and I'm a bit uncomfortable if you're going to start, if you're going to turn accountability into prescription or even regulation. You know, I think that you could, the idea of news literacy is you encourage people to be uh, critical, not cynical, um, but I don't think you should sort of punish people for being stupid or evil in that sense. Um, I think it is much more that you are, uh, the, the reward can often be that you know, do you really want to um, do you do want to be seen as untrustworthy yourself? You know, and I think news literacy kind of nudge people into understanding better that if they are sharing stuff that's nonsense, then if they do share it, then the other person might know it's nonsense as well. So you don't look so clever. I prefer that kind of behavioural, um, whatever the word is, sanctions, rather than you know, banning people from Facebook for a week if they've shared something from Breitbart, you know. 
Um, Anyone else want to add to that? I think, I think there's a key element to addressing both things, which is asking the question why. So with your second sort of question about how to help how to how we can hold people accountable i think that that's about about community standards as much as it, as much as anything as much as anything anything else and i think if you're in a an environment where you're seeing somebody sharing something and you're not sure why they're sharing it or whether they actually believe it's true then asking that question why do you think that's true what is it that what is it about that that you feel is is relevant or appropriate asking that why question can be a kind of crucial way to not call people out in a way that, that forces them to sort of get entrenched in their views and back themselves up for fear of looking stupid. But that curiosity can be a way to help people open up a little bit to the idea that what they've shared might not be right, but there might be something else out there that they can stand by and they can pull out the nugget that they actually want to talk about and talk about that instead. Do you want to I'll, I'll. Okay. On, on this subject... Don't you, don't you uh, think that it is important to uh, involve people in the process more than uh, every other thing? It's because uh, I think that the, the answer is, the, is bad. I, I think that the, the, the most important people that uh, uh, the most important uh, thing is that people is uh, the people are. Um, How to say? Um, uh, I, I'm searching the word. Um, uh, that, that, that people is um, are uh, um, uh, concentrate about uh, the questions, not the answers. It's because uh, probably they are. We are too. Um, uh, but that's that's it. Anyone on that involving people in the process? I think what you're getting at is uh, that this should all be conversation and not lecturing, and that we're uh, journalists don't don't do that uh, very well. Uh, and you, you know, there's all kinds of things related to that. But the, the first rule of a conversation is uh, to listen. I think so. Um, one of the most interesting pieces, the most interesting pieces of work that we've done recently, um, a journalist uh, called Gary Young, who works at the Guardian, went out to uh, Muncie in the U.S. to cover the election there, um, and he went out and uh, explicitly said, "You know, I don't know what it is that I need to be writing about. Please tell me, um, talk to me." Um, and we ran that project for several weeks, um, with Gary being very active in the comment threads under his articles, um, also sort of explicitly asking for, um, for tips, for knowledge, for information, for, for those who were reading that series to say where they thought the stories were, what they felt about various different issues, um, and to help to sort of bring to life the, the, the political reality of what was going on in that town. Um, and those were some incredibly, incredibly uh, well-trusted pieces of journalism, in part because they didn't start from a position of the journalist as the, the expert parachuting in to explain to Muncie what Muncie was about. It started from the journalist in a position of ignorance, saying, I don't know what I'm going to find here. I don't know what the story is. Please tell me. And that's a very old journalistic tactic. That's, that's old-school journalism using new-school tools. Um, and I think we absolutely have to run projects like that in that way consistently. Um, otherwise, we lose any capacity to claim that we are, we are effectively reporting on the communities that we claim to serve. Okay, great. Thank you. We are out of time. I want to give a huge thank you to Miri, Dan, Charlie, and of course, Max, who brought an invaluable perspective. Thank you, Max. You can hear more from Max at 5.45. He's going to be on a panel with uh, Matthew Ingram, Jeff Jarvis, Lucy Marcus. So thank you, everyone, for your attention, and uh, we'll talk to you shortly. Thank you. Well done. Well done, Max. Thanks. Do you have, um, do you have a phone now? Uh, yeah. Um, there is a very small little thank you. It's a Mophie. Have, have you got one of those for charging your phone when it uh, runs out of power? Uh, preghiamo, preghiamo. <laughs> Tutte le persone di lasciare la sala per poter dare spazio al nuovo panel. Grazie.
me da fe. E, 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 e. Prova, prova, ok. I can't remember if I told you right, uh, already, but uh, at 10 to 6, I will come telling you that you have 10 minutes left, then okay. 5, and then you have to close, please. Okay. All right? We'll be okay. I'm going to try, I'm going to keep an eye on the time. Too. Yeah, and I'm sitting right next to Lenny, so I can fly. They'll be great.
Okay, I think most people have seats, so we're going to get started. Um, okay, so welcome. Um, today we're going to be talking about engagement strategies on Facebook. So how to grow your audience, how to look at new formats that might be better for engaging your audience, um, and then some tips and tricks. <laughs> So to introduce myself, my name is Francesca Sacasa. I have an Italian name, but I'm not Italian. <laughs> so English, please. <laughs> um, but I'm really excited to be here. I'm on the Media Partnerships team um, based in London. And we work with journalists and news publishers to help them use Facebook better. Um, and any questions you have, uh, you can always come and ask me and my team, and we have help desks afterwards, so I'll tell you more about those as well. So we have a lot to cover today. I'm going to go through a lot of different things, and these are the tools and um, in the weeds things you need to know if you're managing a page on Facebook. Um, so this is our agenda, and I'll do my best to get through everything and leave plenty of time for questions. So, starting off with instant articles, um, and I'm going to start off with this because it's, uh, it's a really exciting product, and we have some cool announcements around instant articles, but also because it ties into the general theme of engagement, because we found that instant articles are a really engaging type of content. So why did we build instant articles to begin with? We were seeing that on average, web articles were taking eight seconds to load. And that might not sound like a very long time, but it can be a, a forever, eternity, when you're waiting for an article to load and nothing is happening. And this was not a great user experience. People were getting frustrated and they were bouncing back. They didn't want to wait. It wasn't a great experience. And we thought that we could figure out a solution to fix it. So we came up with instant articles. The first reason is to tackle that problem of things taking so long to load. But the second reason was because we wanted to offer a more immersive and native experience. So we launched Instant Articles uh, almost two years ago. And in that time, we've seen pretty compelling data that shows it really is a more immersive experience and that the engagement is higher. So here are some of the numbers that we've seen. On average, Instant Articles are getting 30% more clicks. Um, people are 70% less likely to abandon the article. And they're getting 30% more shares compared to link shares. We've also seen that they load a lot faster. So this is actually, this is my favorite slide. Um, but we did a speed test where we tested instant articles on a 2G, phone, a 2G network on a six-year-old Android phone in India compared to the mobile web on a brand new, at the time, 6S iPhone on a 3G network in the USA. And so with the instant articles, we see it takes a little le over half a second to load, which is pretty cool. And then you can scroll. It's very immersive. You can look around in the photos. It's a really nice experience. So now we go to the mobile web, brand new phone, best network. <laughs> and that's not even eight seconds. That was barely five, but it felt like a really long time, no? Um, so in general, you see that this is not quite, uh, well, it doesn't load as fast, but it's also not as native an experience, right? The links don't look as good. The images aren't full bleed. You can't lose yourself in an article in the same way that you can with an instant article. <clears throat> so if those of you who are not yet on instant articles want to learn more, I encourage you to come and visit our help desks. We have a lot of different options on how to integrate them. If you use WordPress or Drupal, it's really, really easy. There's a plugin. Um, you can also build your own API integration or RSS feed. And then we've partnered with a bunch of different uh, third parties to bring you analytics, whether it's on Google Analytics or Omniture, 
chart beat, all of that. But none of this gets us anywhere unless it's good for your business. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we could make this a really valuable product for publishers. Um, so we've got a number of different monetization options that I wanted to talk through kind of quickly. Um, the first one is direct sold ads. So here, if you're a publisher and you have your own sales team and you have your own clients, then you can serve ads directly into Instant Articles. You keep 100% of the revenue. Everything is between you and your clients. We also have a programmatic option called Audience Network. Um, and with this, you don't really have to do anything. Um, we fill the ads. We give you a revenue share. Um, and it's pretty straightforward and simple, especially for publishers, maybe if you have a smaller sales team. Um, this one can be very turnkey and very easy. You can also do a combination of the two. So if you wanted to do part uh, direct sold and then do, uh, do all of the remnant space with instant articles, that's an option too. We also offer branded content, which I'm not going to go into too much because I'll talk about it more in a little bit. But this is an option if you're doing sponsored content where you can leverage different style options to show that something is branded. So you can include the sponsor logo, it can have a different look and feel, and that way you can signal to your readers that something has been paid for or sponsored. And lastly, we have what we call a CTA, which stands for call to action. And I'll talk about a bit more about this in a second, but CTAs, are a way to develop a more direct relationship with your readers. So in this example, uh, the Washington Post was testing out our CTA to get newsletter subscribers. So um, we've actually made some recent updates that I wanted to let everybody know about. In terms of the monetization and with the ads, uh, we announced, I think a week ago now, um, that you can now feature ads every 250 words, 350 words, or 500 words. And so this gives you more options to decide how many ads you want to have. Um, it also gives you more options to make money off of your content. Um, we're also doing a test um, in the bottom of an article where there's an option for related articles, and we're testing placing ads there since we've gotten feedback from publishers that that's something that they would like to see. And this is brand new um, with these call to action units. We actually announced last night that we're opening it up to everybody on Instant Articles. So now you have the option to include one of these in your articles where you can either prompt people to like your page or you can prompt them to enter their email and sign up for a newsletter. So again, we wanted to give people more options to engage directly with their readers and develop that relationship. And so far, the data we've seen has been super positive. Some of our partners um, have said that between 30 and 40% of their newsletter signups have come from this unit in Instant Articles, and that those readers are just as loyal as the readers coming from their own sites. So, that's it for Instant Articles, but as I said, if you've got questions, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards. Now I'm going to go into some best practices. Whether you're posting directly to your page or via Instant Articles, these kind of apply across the board. So backing up a second, um, we've talked quite a bit about news feed um, during the course of the festival. Hopefully many of you went to go see Adam Mosseri speak. Um, and I just want to kind of reiterate how some of that works and how your content finds the right audience. And so there are a couple of different signals that we look at. The first is who's posting the content? What's your connection to that page or that profile? Is it your mother? Is it your best friend? Or is it somebody you met at a journalism conference two years ago and you've never spoken to since? Um, all of that is going to be a signal for how likely you are to engage with that content. The second is what kind of content is it? Is it a video? Do you watch videos all the time? Or maybe you're like me and you click a lot of links. So if you go to my newsfeed, I see a lot of links because that's a type of content that I really like. 
And the third is, how is that post performing? What kind of engagement is it getting? Is it getting a ton of likes and shares and comments? Are people interacting with it? That's another really powerful signal that tells us that you might want to see that piece of content. And this example over here um, is actually quite old, but it's a pretty good example of all of this at play. So this was a post from my personal newsfeed where a friend of mine posted a New York Times article. And I follow the New York Times. I'm from New York. Um, and so I saw this when the New York Times posted it, but I think I was busy and I didn't click on it. And then my friend shared it. And so I saw it again, and I saw that he had written a comment on it and he had said something about it. And I think I was also busy or maybe going into a meeting or something, and I didn't read it then. And then he commented on his share, and I saw it a third time. And so that time I went and I read the article because that was one more very powerful signal saying, hey, you should read this article. So when you can think about when you're posting to try to make that type of thing happen, to get people to connect with something or share it with their audience, that's going to be a very powerful thing. Which takes us to a couple of best practices. So these are things that in working with many different partners, many different publishers, um, things that I've noticed uh, and my general advice. The first is there is no magic number. So usually I talk to people and they ask me, how often should I post? And then I ask them a bunch of questions. Well, how much content do you have? What kind of page do you have? And what's always really funny is, for some reason, people have decided that there's a number that they're going to post every single day. Maybe it's two posts a day. Maybe it's 15, but they decided on this number. They don't know why. They're not going to change it. And the truth is, there's no magic number. It's not a formula. It depends on your content. It depends on what you have to say. Um, and it's really personalized. So the best thing to do is instead of deciding on a number out of nowhere, think about what makes sense for you and experiment. Try posting a little bit more, try posting a little bit less, see what happens. And usually when people post more, they see reach and engagement also go up. Uh, the second one I sort of touched on before, but post a mix of content types. Uh, if you're only posting links all day, every day, and I happen to really love video, then I might not see your links very much, even if I like your page, um, or the other way around. So you want to make sure you're posting enough different types of content that you're going to be able to reach as wide an audience as possible. And there are a lot of different ways to tell stories. And so you want to think about what way is going to make the most sense for that story. Um, think about how shareable the content is. And when you're posting or writing your headline, think about how can you phrase this that's going to make somebody want to share it. Because we think a lot about engagement on Facebook, um, and all of those signals are really important, likes, shares, comments. But if you think about it, uh, a like is pretty, pretty easy, right? It's a little bit lightweight, doesn't take very much effort on your side. A comment, a little bit more effort. I have to decide I have something to say about this. But if you're going to share something, that's a very, very powerful signal. Because that's saying, I feel so strongly about this, or so connected to this piece of content, or I have an opinion about it, that I need my whole network to also see this. Um, and if you can pin down something in your article that's going to make somebody connect to it and want to share it, that's a really powerful thing and a very powerful signal. And then, uh, just in thinking about how to increase your distribution, it's always good to tag people, places, and things. So when you tag other pages or um, the people that might be involved in a story, it makes that piece of content eligible to be seen by everybody that's connected to that page. And think about it like, it kind of works, um, you know, if you see a photo posted by somebody you don't know, but it's a photo of your friend, and you see it in your newsfeed. Um, it's a similar type of thing. And if you happen to be connected to both that page and the page that's tagged, then that's two signals that's going to say that you should see that content. 
So it's another really good organic way to grow your audience. Um, and then think about hashtags and keywords. These are important tools that people use to find content and to tap into the conversation. So I wouldn't recommend just making up hashtags or you know, throwing in 50 hashtags per post. But I would think about if there's something trending, if there is a conversation happening around a hashtag, think about how you can tap into that. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about video. Um, although this isn't exclusive to video. So here we talk a lot about something called the three second audition. And the idea here is that as you're scrolling through your newsfeed and moving very quickly, you have three seconds to get somebody's attention. And I actually think it's probably closer to one second, but you have to make the most of the first few images, the first few frames, so that they know what they're looking at and why they should stop and watch the rest of the video. And so we talk a lot about this with videos, but it's also true for headlines, right? If I have a link and a headline that is super long and I don't know what it's saying and I can't understand what this story is about, then I'm probably not going to stop and pause on that story or click on that link. And so it's about, and there's an art to this, and I think most of you as journalists know about the art of trying to write the perfect headline, but you wanna think about what can you do in those first few seconds that's going to grab somebody's attention. Um, so pay a lot of attention to the images and the headlines. Again, with an image that you choose, you want it to be something that's going to get somebody's attention. And you also wanna think about mobile, right? Somebody is going to look at this on a small screen. So if it's very, very zoomed out and they can't tell what they're looking at, it's going to be hard for them to get, uh, to pay attention and be interested in the story. Um, and then lastly with Facebook, you know, most people are viewing videos with sound off, although this is starting to change. So you do want to think about that sound off experience and you want to think about autoplay. So again, those first few frames, um, if you're putting a logo or a title card at the beginning, you're missing an opportunity with that first frame. Um, and more than anything, the thing that I emphasize the most is to really be authentic. Bring your personality to Facebook. Um, connect with your audience. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity with Facebook in particular for it to be more of a dialogue. It's not one way. So you want to engage with your audience and you want to show your expertise and your personality and your viewpoint. Okay, so now I'm going to go into some of the different tools that you can use every day as you're posting to Facebook. The first one is targeting. And we have two kinds of targeting. So the first one here is audience restrictions. And what this one will do is it will make your audience smaller. So you can choose to restrict your audience by age, by location, by language. Um, and even though it will make your audience smaller, in some cases you can use this to increase your engagement. Um, it's also very helpful if you have rights, for instance, in just a certain location, then you would want to geo-target so that you're only showing a piece of content in that location. Um, but you could also, for instance, customize headlines. So you might have one version of a headline uh, about millennials. You might have one version for teens and one for older people. Or you might have one version of a headline for men and one for women. Um, and it's a way to play around with customizing things and segmenting them to more targeted audiences. The other type of targeting that we have is called preferred audience. And with this one, um, we built this realizing that Facebook does a pretty good job of guessing what your content is about. Um, we can look at keywords, we can look at a bunch of different signals, but we wanted to give journalists, publishers, the opportunity to tell us what your content is about, because you know better than anybody. So here, you can basically pick a bunch of tags and tell us who would be most interested in your content. Um, you can choose very broad topics, uh, for instance, entertainment, 
or you could choose narrower topics, a film or a specific film or a specific set of actors, for instance. And this will, again, help your content find the most relevant audience. So now I'm going to move on to cross-posting. And this one is uh, very useful if you're doing a lot with video and you have multiple pages. So cross-posting um, is something that we've rolled out for videos that allows you to post the same video across multiple pages. And this is different than sharing a video. What this does is allow you to post across multiple pages, but it looks like a native video post. It doesn't appear as a share. Um, so it's a way to share assets across your pages or partner pages without having to download the video and re-upload it. So you could do this if you have many different pages. This can be a really helpful tool. It can also be a helpful tool if you've worked with partners on something. It's an easy way to share those assets. And then each page can customize the headline. Um, they can target however they want. And it looks like a native video post directly to their page. The other really helpful thing is that you can see shared insights on cross-posted videos. So the original person who uploaded the video will see aggregated insights for all of the, all of the videos and all of the cross-posted videos while each individual page will just see their own insights. So again, it's a really good tool if you're working with other pages on partnerships or if you manage a bunch of different pages. We also have rolled out a tool, extremely helpful for video, called Rights Manager. So with this, I'm gonna back up for a second and just talk about intellectual property um, and copyright in general. So with intellectual property, with copyright, we take this very seriously at Facebook. And if something gets reported, uh, what happens is that the report comes through and we look at it. And then if it's found to be violating, then we will notify all of the admins of that page. And we will also notify the person that posted the video and we'll tell them who reported it and we'll give you their contact email. And this is important because if that happens to you and it's a mistake, then you wanna reach out to the person that reported it and have them take back the report. Another really helpful way to manage your own copyright is with this tool called Rights Manager. And Rights Manager, basically allows you to upload a reference library. So when you upload a video, you can put it in your reference library, and what will happen is it will scan videos across Facebook and detect if there's a match. And then it will surface the matches for you. And once you have all of the matches, you can decide if you want to leave them up or if you want to take them down. Um, so for those who are producing a lot of videos, this can be a very helpful tool to manage your own copyright. You can also whitelist specific pages um, if you want, or uh, in that case, you know, if you have many different pages, or if you've worked with a partner, or if you've licensed a video out. So there are various tools for managing your assets using Rights Manager. And again, if you want to know more, come find us afterwards. Okay, working through like a lot of information, but now we're on branded content. So with branded content, um, this is called different things depending on the company that you work in, but it's branded content or sponsored content. Um, sometimes people call it native advertising. Um, essentially, this is when you're posting some kind of general editorial content that has been paid for by an advertiser. And we developed a tool on Facebook uh, that allows you to tag the advertiser. And so the idea here, um, and you can see in this example, this is uh, the Sun football page with Gillette. Um, the idea here is that the deals are completely between you and your advertisers. We don't want any part of that, but we do want to create a transparent experience for readers so that they know when something has been sponsored. So what happens is there's this little with 
tag that tags the sponsor. It's pretty subtle. It's not like neon flashing lights that something has been paid for. Um, but it does give that signal. And you can find this when you go to post. So when you go to create a post on your Facebook page, there is a little icon that looks like a handshake. And when you click on that, then you'll have the option to search for your advertiser and tag them in your post. And this works for all kinds of content. So whether it's live or 360 or instant articles, it doesn't matter. This uh, option is available no matter what. But we've made some updates recently. Um, so I wanted to let you guys know about them. Originally, branded content was only available for verified pages. Um, and we announced recently that it's now open to all pages. Um, you can apply, and we have uh, an announcement in our media blog, which is this media.fb.com. So you can apply there, and then you'll have access to that tool. Um, and then we've also made a couple of updates to how it looks. So now, you still have that width, but we also have in the metadata this little um, paid signal there. Um, again, because we just want to be very transparent that there's an exchange of value happening between an advertiser and a publisher. We have also made a couple of changes to our different guidelines. So with branded content, there's a lot that you can do. Um, you can tag your sponsor, you can do product placement, you can include end cards um, if it's a video. Um, and now, you can also include a watermark or logo, um, and you can have graphical overlays. You can't do everything, so you still uh, can't run pre-roll, uh, post-roll, or mid-roll, um, or banner ads. Um, but we are trying to make it more flexible and open so that you can find solutions that will work with your clients. Um, and the idea here is, is mostly that we want to preserve a good user experience. So we don't want it to be really spammy with tons of ads flying at you um, while still giving you the flexibility to uh, showcase your, spon your sponsor's logo or the brand that you're working with. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit um, just for those who are managing pages kind of day to day. Um, and just some general tips for how you can manage the page, how you can look at comments on the page, um, and make sure that you're building the right community on your page. So, first of all, um, if you have a page, uh, it's good to take a look at the page roles. Um, so, sometimes, especially when pages have been around for a while, you'll go and take a look and there are like, 35 admins on a page. That's generally not a great idea. Um, you want people to have the lowest permissions necessary to do their job. Although I would recommend having more than one admin because if somebody leaves your company or something happens, you don't want all of the keys to the castle with just one person. Um, you can also, in your settings, there's a number of different options to limit what other people can do on your page. So these are some that I wanted to point out. The first is you can limit tagging. Um, so this is helpful whether you're a person or a publication. Um, you can limit what other people can tag you in and what will show up on your page. Um, you can turn it off completely. You can also make it so that you review that before it goes up. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of is comment ranking. So with comment ranking, rather than showing comments in chronological order, just all of the comments, it will take into account signals that pull in high quality comments and surface those to the top. So the comments that are getting the most engagement um, will surface to the top. Comment ranking will also filter out spam. Um, and so that also helps make the level of conversation happening on your page um, higher and more engaging. There's also a couple of different filters you can do when it comes to profanity. 
So we have a general profanity filter that you can turn on and off on your page. Um, and this takes into kind of takes into account all of the worst words and the, the ones that you know you would think of. Um, and you can set that to three levels. So it's basically low, medium, high, um, or maybe strong, medium, weak. Uh, you can also create custom filters. So this is really helpful, especially if there is a specific, maybe not a bad word, but there's a specific trend or topic or hashtag or something that's surfacing and causing problematic comments on your page then you can use the custom filter to weed those out. And what happens is when somebody posts with a word that, has, that is in your filter, they will still see their comment, but nobody else will. So it's a very like, easy experience where somebody isn't showing up as automatically blocked. To them, it looks fine and normal, but it prevents everybody else from being able to see it. Um, and then lastly, you can always report and delete comments on your page. So as the admin of the page, you have the power to delete any comments that appear there, and you can manage your community however you want. Um, you can also report them, which is a good practice because it notifies our team that maybe somebody is violating our community standards, and that's something that we need to look at. You can also ban repeat offenders. So if people are doing this consistently all the time, then you also have controls to manage those. And in that case, you could ban somebody from commenting on your page. And once again, the banned users don't know that they've been banned. So it's not a very, um, there's not a lot of friction. It's not a very harsh thing that happens. They just no longer, uh, their posts aren't seen by anybody else. Okay, so lastly, I'm gonna leave you with a few resources. Um, so, a couple of ways to stay in touch with us, because obviously it's been great being here all week and speaking with you, and we'll be around afterwards. Um, but, so that you can stay in touch even beyond this week, we have a couple of ways to do that. So the first is uh, a newsletter that my team puts out every week. Um, and you can find it and sign up at facebook.com slash newsletter. Um, unfortunately, it's just in English at the moment. Um, but here we basically pull all of the latest product updates, all of the announcements that might be interesting to any of our partners. Um, and we also uh, compile good examples of content from our partners. So when we see one of our partners doing something cool, we'll include that in there as well. So to try to give you ideas or some interesting things to look at. And we also have a media blog. Um, and here, again, there's a lot of announcements. Um, there's updates on new products, but we also include case studies that can be really helpful. So we have case studies on live, on instant articles. Um, we publish uh, uh, some best practices, practices yes, and how-to guides here as well. Um, and it's also a good place to get general support. So a few takeaways, um, just to sum up, because I know I covered a lot of different things. Um, but the first, with instant articles, if it's not something that you're using, um, consider it. It's an incredibly engaging format for content and we've seen really strong data to support that. Um, we've also had some great announcements recently, especially those call to actions, which enable you to create more direct relationships with your readers. Um, think about your headlines um, and your post frequency, and don't forget about the um, three second audition. Don't be afraid to experiment more than anything. Um, explore different ways to monetize with branded content, and we have some new tools there. And now that's gonna be available to everybody. So if you're interested, I encourage you to check out that media blog, um, and you'll be able to sign up and request access there. And lastly, stay in touch, sign up for our newsletter, check out that blog that I just mentioned. Um, and if there's anything else, because I know there's a ton of information, <laughs> 
Um, you can find us where we have a room at the Bar Bella Vista um, and a bunch of people from my team are here to talk more one-on-one -on -one about any of these things. Um, so that was a lot of information. <laughs> um, with that, I'm going to open it to questions if anybody has any. Yeah? Sure. Uh, my question, I'm from Turkey, Hürriyet newspaper, uh, one of the largest uh, newspapers in uh, Europe actually. We have uh, problems with uh, instant articles. Um, the, you know, in the West, in, uh, in the United States, uh, by the way, we are from the first day we've been in, uh, in the United States, some, some American newspapers, as you showed, a lot of good engagement, better, better metrics in almost every count they had. Uh, when we applied it, we didn't see a rise that much. So we decided not to continue. But actually, we want. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can help us with it, we are, by the way, in uh, always talking with Guido uh, from Germany. <laughs> so he is also helping us with it. Uh, but at some point, we stopped doing it. And we, I would like to reintroduce it, uh, if possible. Um, so the question was about instant articles um, in that, you know, we've seen great numbers on engagement, but in this case, you didn't see those right away. Um, so a couple of things. In general, we've seen the best metrics when people really fully commit to instant articles. So I don't know about your specific case, but in, in some case, we see partners kind of dipping a toe or trying out a couple here and there. And with that, it's very hard to get a good sense of how they're actually doing. Um, on top of that, we've also, I mean, we've made a lot of updates, especially to the monetization, um, but we're continuing to improve the product. So especially if you tried maybe a year ago, I would encourage maybe trying another test and seeing if there's a increased engagement from that. But it is going to vary from publisher to publisher. So those are kind of the average numbers that we've seen. In some markets, it's actually been way higher, and in some, a little bit lower. Um, so we can talk more specifically maybe after this, but I would definitely recommend maybe trying another test, especially if it was a while ago. Yeah. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, no, just one quick question, because I didn't use instant articles anymore, um, but in the past I used a lot of the Canvas model. Mm -hmm. But, you know, since you didn't spoke about the Canvas model, I don't know if you can answer about this, but there are many differences between Canvas model for brand or you suggest to use instant articles. So Canvas is one of our um, paid marketing products. So we're seeing it used more with advertisers, whereas Instant Articles is built more specifically for publishers. Um, and it's not a paid product. It's open to anybody. Um, so in that sense, you know, for a specific campaign where you're looking to get a conversion or get some, you know, maybe uh, somebody to buy something, anything like that, then Canvas might be the best option. But for just a general reading experience, um, I, I would probably recommend Instant Articles because it's made more specifically for publishers. And it has things like that call to action button that Canvas doesn't have. Um, so it has certain features that are specific to trying to engage with your readers, trying to help you establish that connection to your audience, that Canvas has a little bit of a different use case. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, we are using f instant articles. Uh, when I learned about your new call to action you know, functionality yesterday, I wanted to try it. So, so I, I wanted to try it today in the morning and it wasn't there still. So, so is it you know, US only or it's rolling out in next weeks or, you know? Sorry, and thank you. That's a good reminder. I should have mentioned that. Um, it's rolling out globally, but starting next week. So, so we announced it last night, and you're very quick to, to action. Um, but it's going to be rolling out starting next week. So I would, I would check back then. And, and it will be global, but it will take time to roll out to 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. 
Uh, I would like to know if uh, you still recommend the use of subtitles in video. Uh, if we should expect that Facebook don't promote our videos if we don't do it, and if we should forget about the idea of square videos. Okay, so a couple of different questions in there. <laughs> um, so the first is with the subtitles in videos. Um, I think that from my perspective, those can still be a really powerful way to engage your audience. And it's because of that autoplay experience and that three second audition that we were talking about. Because what the subtitles do very well is they tell you immediately what something is about. And you don't need to work to try to figure it out. That being said, that's not the only way to do it, right? If you have enough going on in the action and the video itself where you can understand what's happening and get pulled in, then the subtitles aren't necessary. Um, we have also been testing um, with the sound on. So if you have the sound turned on on your phone, then as you're scrolling through newsfeed, you'll see videos play with sound on. Um, and I think that that's still early enough that we don't have great like best practices or data around that yet, but I would encourage people to experiment with videos that might work more for that environment. Um, because I think you'll probably get to, um, we'll probably see more and more people experiencing videos with sound on as they become used to that experience. Um, and then the other thing with square videos is uh, when it comes to the format and how you're recording videos, it's kind of up to you and both how you're recording it, so what equipment that you're using, um, and then also how, how your audience is going to experience it. So most on Facebook, most videos are being consumed on mobile. So because of that, the vertical video is very immersive because it takes up the whole screen. Um, and so we've seen that doing quite well. But that doesn't mean that horizontal or square videos are not working well anymore. Um, so I think it's something that it kind of, it depends on what the, what the video is, because if something is so immersive and so interesting, people will flip their phone, they'll, they'll get involved in it no matter what. Um, but I would say, you know, you want to optimize for mobile, and so because of that, a lot of times that vertical video can be a better format. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Any, we have a couple of more minutes, but are there any other questions? <laughs> we got one more? Okay. Uh, this is about mid-roll. We also wanted to try the live video mid-roll. It was for a limited number of uh, partners, publisher partners. When, it, when will it be available? Because it's been a very long time, actually. It's been on trial. Um, so the question is about mid-roll ads. Um, and we are currently testing this out with a small number of partners um, in the US, um, but starting to roll out more broadly. Um, I think so far the data that we've seen is very promising. Um, we're trying to come up with a monetization plan that's gonna work well for our partners and enable you to make money off of video. Um, but that being said, this is new. So we're being careful about how quickly we roll it out um, and making sure that we can optimize both for the advertisers, but also for the publishers who are posting the videos, and then also for the people watching the videos. Um, and we're still learning things about how that works. So I think you will see it rolling out more internationally in the coming months, and it's definitely something that we're working on. But it's not because it's quite a new thing and quite a big change, it's not going to be the type of thing where it flips 100% one day. Um, I think we want to be very conscious about how we're rolling this out and making sure that we're doing it right sense. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Thank you all very, very much. And
Ja, ja, oké. Okay. Dus we willen heel gauw naar de vraag gaan. Oh, we're not starting yet. Maar laten we dan ook snel naar de vraag gaan. Ja, dat ga ik ook doen. Ja, ja, ja. ja. Ik vraag je allemaal om eventjes iets te zeggen. Dat weet ik. Dat staat in de Ja, ik weet ja, 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 het niet. Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, ik heb het gelezen. Ik ga het niet voorlezen, dat is heel slecht. Maar ik schrijf altijd wat je zegt. Echt? Ja, ik weet dat het heel slecht is, maar ik, ik, ik kom gewoon echt lekkerder als ik het gewoon voorlees. Ja? ja. Dat is wel, dat, maar dat, dat ligt, ja, dan moet je gewoon een paar keer niet doen en dan ben je er vanaf. Het is een beetje zoals roken. Zal ik het dan nu proberen? Dan ja. heel hard op het begin? Ja. 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 Daar ben ik graag bij. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah, it's two minutes, I think. Until the end? Yeah. All right. All right. Is speaking the microphone because we are recording everything, so we can see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Hello, hi, Rob. So what, what Hello, uh, Rob. Uh, I'm nice to meet you. Hello. Yeah, that's good. Oh. Is it time to start? Good thing. All right, thank you, everybody, so much for being here. I know that um, there were a couple of uh, competitors, the CEO of the New York Times, the Sun. Um, so, you know, the bar. The bar. Um, <laughs> A CC is close as well. So thank you so much for being here with us at six on Saturday uh, of uh, a, a very intense and full uh, festival. Um, I am Nienke Venema. I am the director of the Democracy and Media Foundation, Stichting Democratie and Media. Uh, this is a Dutch foundation based in Amsterdam. And a little bit about us. We were founded during the Second World War. Um, to be the sole owner of one of the resistance newspapers after the war would end uh, because um, the people that founded this newspaper didn't believe in commercial ownership of media, so they wanted it to be um, owned by a foundation instead. Now, 70 years later, a loss has happened, but we're still a shareholder of a couple of dailies in the Netherlands, and we also fund uh, journalism and we fund media organizations. Um, I wrote to the Journalism Festival about the possibility of hosting this panel because since I have been working at the Democracy and Media Foundation, before that I was applying for grants, not as a journalist, um, I've noticed that there isn't a whole lot of exchange between uh, media and philanthropy on mutual needs and expectations. How many of you are journalists in the room? Okay, good. How many of you are funders of journalism in the room? All right. All right, well, that, I'm happy to see some hands go up. That's good. Um, because it should be an exchange rather than just me talking at you or us talking at you. Um, nor is there really an ongoing conversation about, amongst funders themselves about the ins and outs and do's and don'ts of funding media. Um, nevertheless, this relationship is becoming increasingly relevant. The financial difficulties facing media, I don't need to elaborate on those. And it shows no signs of, uh, of slowing down. So, therefore, this panel here today... Um, I have the honor of introducing the various panelists to you. Uh, Rob Weinberg, next to me, is the founder and editor-in-chief of The Correspondent, and more recently, The Correspondent. Uh, I hope you've all heard that they're, that they're expanding to the United States together with Jay Rosen. It's a relatively young online journalism platform, media platform, uh, well known for having crowdfunded its origins and being one of relatively few startups um, running on a successful business model based on subscriptions and no advertising. However, it also started off, um, aside from that very successful uh, beginning, there was also a grant uh, from us, so I'll be transparent about that, um, <laughs> uh, which in part also allowed it to develop. So, and, and you also do sometimes apply for funds to do extra projects. Um, Next to Rob is Maria Teresa Ronderos, the director of the OSF program on independent journalism, and one of two people from Latin America at this festival uh, this week. Um, formerly an award-winning journalist in Colombia, uh, Maria Teresa now invests in journalism as well as in the protection of the safety of journalists, uh, supports um, initiatives led by in individuals or collectives that strive to improve their journalism under difficult circumstances and prioritizes initiatives, and not just that, also seek to further engage their audiences, experiment with storytelling, and develop new sources of revenue, a media funding uh, program. OSF, 
um, is, is well known uh, for many other things, but this is also a large part of their uh, mission statement. Next to Maria Teresa, Maggie O'Kane. Maggie O'Kane, currently multimedia editor investigations at The Guardian, but will leave The Guardian after 25 years next week uh, to be full-time on the global media campaign to end female genital mutilation. She's a former foreign correspondent, the founder of The Guardian Films, um, and also the future chair of the European Press Prize. Uh, the Guardian, of course, we all know how they, you know, how they work, but they also do sometimes take grants from various foundations. And then the last person on this panel uh, is not in philanthropy, and he will tell you that, um, I think, perhaps, at least that's what he told me, but he is the director of the, of the digital news initiative that was uh, started by Google and a couple of other uh, partners. Um, he funds project. He's a former editor-in-chief of Liberation France and also a Neiman Fellow and also many other things, uh, and I know I'm talking too long. Um, but the DNI is a partnership between Google and news publisher in Europe to support high quality journalism through technology and innovation, gives out grants, but also invests in training and research amongst other things. Uh, since it was founded in 2015, uh, 2015, it has awarded more than 50 million euros to more than 250 projects. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how that's been going uh, for you. But first of all, if you could all perhaps just very briefly elaborate on um, what your relationship is to this subject and what the first thing is that comes to mind when you talk about media and philanthropy. Rob, will you start? Oh, uh, do I have to start? Okay, I so. okay. Yeah. I'm first in line. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Nike. Um, what what does uh, what what comes to mind in this uh, subject? Uh, well, uh, first of all, the um, what comes to mind is this stressed relationship between uh, uh, foundations and uh, journalists in general. There's, uh, um, uh, I experience a lot of distrust over and um, uh, between those parties, uh, especially amongst journalists, of course, because um, journalists feel um, any kind of uh, funding uh, um, uh, coming from foundations or, or other parties, maybe like uh, Google, uh, uh, could hurt their independence. Um, and there are many reasons um, um, to think so. Uh, my experience has been that um, there can also be very good relationships between foundations and um, uh, uh, journalists. Uh, we have had uh, many of those relationships. One is uh, sitting next to me. Uh, others are for smaller uh, projects that are funded by um, uh, outside money. Um, and basically, we have a couple of rules uh, uh, in place um, uh, for accepting grant money or applying for grant money. Uh, um, the first one is very, very, very simple. There has to be no editorial uh, control whatsoever or no editorial uh, demands whatsoever. Um, if that's not uh, granted, then we won't accept any money um, at all. Second, uh, uh, and that's uh, the, 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 the hardest part, is there has not only to be like official independence between the, um, the, the grantee and um, uh, the grantor, but um, uh, also the appearance of independence. So I, we always ask ourselves the question, would we want to advertise this, this relationship between the foundation uh, and us or the other way around? Would, would we like them to advertise their support of us? And um, uh, if the answer is no, we would um, not like to have that because there would be a uh, um, uh, seemingly uh, conflict of interest or we would be associated with uh, like political agendas a foundation might have. Um, then we, we would not accept uh, such uh, grants. Um, that's one of the reasons probably why we usually only work with uh, foundations that, are, uh, uh, that support journalism as such. So you have a m m many foundations that support all kinds of political causes, uh, whether it's um, renewable energy or um, uh, uh, conflict, uh, uh, conflicts in... Um, uh, third world countries, um, uh, uh, and they m might support media as well. We usually do not um, uh, work together with those kinds of foundations. We, we work together uh, uh, most closely with foundations that support journalism um, uh, in, in general. Uh, and it has been very fruitful. Uh, 
there have many there have been many misunderstandings as well um, so one misunderstanding we keep um, uh, uh, getting is uh, um, the, the views on the role of technology in journalism so um, technology has always been uh, and still is seen as a very expensive like side thing for journalists it's uh, usually the journalism itself that is m considered most important but not the technology that is behind it so that's always a constant struggle to try to explain why technology in a digital era is important as well and needs funding as well um, but uh, um, for the most part, uh, uh, we found that um, uh, 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 working together with foundations that support independent journalism has been, uh, has been uh, very fruitful to us. Um, the only thing, and that um, might be my, my call out to funders, and there are, I saw four of them uh, uh, sitting right here, is that usually the logic in, um, with funders is that if something that is funded is successful and can manage on its own, then that's a reason to stop funding it because it's independent now, it can uh, make its own money or stuff like that, um, uh, which is an, an understandable reasoning, but um, it's also, it has its dis disadvantages because uh, uh, right at the moment that something is becoming successful and can stand on its own, it might be uh, uh, um, there might be even more reasons to fund it more uh, and accelerate growth, for example, and think more business-like about uh, uh, funding such projects instead of thinking, uh, okay, this worked, let's move on to something that needs our help uh, uh, next. So um, thinking um, uh, like like business-wise uh, in, in, in granting money to... Um, to, for example, startups like, like ours, uh, would be a smart thing, I think. Thank you. Maria Teresa? Okay, thank you, Ninky, for, for inviting me here. Um, so, oh, oh. what we do in, um, so this program that I direct uh, of the Open Society Foundations is based in London, and we fund three, basically three big things. One is protection of journalists and safety and how to keep journalists, especially those who are doing the most dangerous work, protected. And we don't do it directly, of course, because we're just funders, so we just try to support organizations that do that very well, whether some of them are global, but we are trying more and more to find really key local or regional players that need to become stronger. So that's one thing. The other thing is we try to fund ideas, and this is very, very difficult. Ideas of people in places where things are very difficult, when there's little uh, competition in terms of, because it's so difficult to produce really independent information. There's lots of information, but not very independent. And so people really want to develop something that's really, truly independent in a place where information is very scarce. And we, so we we do fund very carefully some startups and in some cases some uh, more mature organizations that, are, that want to do a specific development because they need support, as you were saying, in their technology or because they need to really put together their advertising department or just simply because they want to cover a region that's completely costly to cover for a while and there is a reason that they want to develop that part. And we also fund experimentation. So sometimes to experiment for a small uh, startup <laughs> company or for a small digital company can be very costly and it could go down the tube, I mean down the drain if it fails in the experimentation. So we, we try and say, okay, you experiment with donors funding because if you lose it, it's not going to be the end of the organization. It's, it, again, it's a very difficult thing to decide. Now, um, so uh, the third bucket that we support is investigative journalism, mostly networking, the collaboration between different investigative journalists, trying to work together, trying to add value and pull resources, 
Why? Because we think that all the big evils of the world are now working globally. So crime, money laundering, um, uh, tax evasions, all of these things are working beyond our country. So to really do good investigative journalism, you need to be working and also um, uh, beyond the country. Uh, so this is my daily bread. This is what I've been doing for the last what, two and a half years. Uh, before that, I was a, a journalist with an independent project that was looking for funders to get me funding. <laughs> so I know very well how it feels. To, I, I hope I don't forget, and probably um, uh, this is something really important not to forget. Uh, so what, what have we tried to do? And what, I, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about what are the issues that I deal with every day, very, very shortly about the power dynamics. Of course you're a funder. Of course you want and you go to an NGO and you ask them, what would you like to do? And that, what would you like me to fund? And immediately they're going to try and fit your agenda. And it's very difficult to have an honest conversation because of course they're trying to say, what do you do first? And then I'll tell you what I'll do. And if you tell them I fund safety, then they'll say, I do safety. And that's a big mistake of a lot of, of, and I see it as a mistake. The other thing is the transparency. Okay, so I'm really all for transparency. I think it has a lot to do with the credibility of a media that they say out loud who funds them. But in some countries, this costs you your life. So if you say you are being funded, especially by the Open Society Foundations, not the most popular funder in the world right now it, for many governments, so it's going to be hard for this. So yes, we want to be transparent. We are transparent, but only as far as the grantees want to, us to be transparent. If they don't want us to be transparent because it, it depends their survival on it, we will not be. And there are the issues of impact, influence, results. A lot of funders go and say, I need to see results. So that's another big issue we handle, we sort of grapple with every day. Uh, if you have problems convincing funders that technology is important, we have problems convincing grantees that technology is important. <laughs> and that you cannot be a journalist today if you don't understand your audiences. You cannot think that you have a superb side, that you're producing the best journalism possible if you don't know who's reading it and why and what, how does it connect. And, the, and you're not using the amount of technology there is to, uh, to be able to engage this, this journalist. Journalism is not, not anymore, uh, it's, it's a conversation, it's not a lecture anymore. And then the last thing is, um, how long? So you said uh, you shouldn't drop somebody the next day, but it's true. But when, when I arrived to, my, to this place that we were funding uh, people for 17 years. So if you fund somebody from 17 years, probably you're not doing them a favor. Or, or at least if you, fund, if you keep the funding at the same level, because you're not actually helping them become entrepreneurial, or as Nimke said in her little document, you, you're not, you don't leave them their, their wings to fly. So I think they have to be independent from us. And the best thing, the best story that I will end with is, I went to a, one of the grantees' um, door one day in Nepal, and she had a little sign in her door that say, a, a dollar a day keeps the donor away. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, yes. Maggie, um, so I'm looking at everybody in this audience and thinking, I don't know how you are all still here. So I, I am going to talk very, very briefly from just personal experience um, and just tell you what I've learned about um, journalism and funding. And um, I just want to say that I used to be a foreign correspondent in the days when they said, go to Bosnia and here's a whole load of money and come back whenever you're done. And money really wasn't an issue in those days, certainly for us at The Guardian. Um, and then I moved into the world of, of films and making films, which is a much more expensive proposition, and realized that you had to go out there and actually pitch for funding. 
And in the last 10 years, I've realized that actually now you have to go out there and pitch for funding for journalism that matters because the things that slide off the end are the things like investigative journalism, are the issues like slavery, are the issues like women's issues. So we have to really fight to keep those on the media agenda and we desperately not desperate, I don't want to sound desperate, but there's a reality here that unless philanthropists and unless funders fund those issues, then they are not going to be covered in the modern day newspaper. And you're looking at one of the most successful media organizations in the world that's losing 40 million a year, that's The Guardian, and is looking around saying, well, where can we cut, what can we do? The first thing that, that gets cut are issues like FGM, are issues like women's rights. So unless we have the funders who can come in and, and support that, then there's a really serious problem for, for modern day journalism to keep doing things that matters. Now I'm just going to show you a very, very tiny clip and I was kind of a bit ambivalent about whether or not I should, I should show this because it's sort of, isn't the Guardian great, look at all the coverage, but this is a very short film about, it's called Supermarket Slave Trade and it's about the impact that that had and it's about finding out the prawns that you eat on your table, where did they come from, and the fact that men are held as slaves for three or four years on a boat to feed those cheap prawns to your supermarkets. That's an issue that's very, very important to journalism. We would not have been able to tell that if Humanity United hadn't come along and said, we want to do slavery. Um, and once they said that, we said, okay, we'll go and find the stories that will make the front page. And that's the important thing. The, the funder has to come, it can come with a big picture and say we want to do slavery, but then it has to say to the journalist, okay, you go off and you decide what are the stories that are going to really matter. So this very short clip is just about the, the, the impact that $30,000 had on the issue of modern day slavery and why philanthropists are so important. Qatar is a slave state. That's a extreme thing to say, I know, in the 21st century, but that's the reality. Well, with me is Bhagavad Yogi from the BBC's Nepalese service. And Bhagavad, what exactly are they alleging? Well, this is the first time that a major British newspaper has uh, reported on this issue and brought it uh, to the international audience. We were really excited about the partnership with The Guardian. Through this partnership, we really wanted to reach a global audience. We wanted to change people's perceptions about the face of modern slavery across the globe from the plight of Nepalese workers to the plight of workers enslaved on Thai fishing vessels. The shrimp on our tabletops could have gotten there thanks to slave labor. The Guardian finding men working on Thai fishing boats bought and sold for some $400. Guardian, the c'est quotidien britannique, le Guardian, qui l'a révélé au terme d'une longue enquête sur les bateaux où torturent et où tuent. This is the story of globalized slavery. Our giant international supermarkets like Walmart, Tesco, Carrefour, Morrison's and Iceland are selling prawns fed by slave labor. Joining us now is Felicity Lawrence, who was one of the reporters on the Guardian investigation. It took us nearly six months to prove all the links. Uh, we followed catches from boats where we knew there were people who were enslaved in the most appalling conditions. And Mark Legon, former ambassador for the State Department's office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. The Guardian has done a great service of taking studies that were done by the International Organization for Migration, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, and others, and really gotten into the details of the evidence. Well, there are four nations that were on this so-called tier two watch list and have been moved down to tier three, really the most serious offenders. The lowest category among 23 countries that the United States says are not meeting minimum standards to address modern slavery. This is not just a book. It's not just a report. This is a call to action. I think this is excellent journalism by The Guardian because if you're going to stop this or if you're going to stop the abuse of textile workers in Bangladesh, yes, whatever it may be, at the end of the day, there are only two agents that can do this. It is the massive buying power of the big supermarkets in the Western world. And secondly, it's you and me. Millions of people have come to the side and have consumed the content. 
we believe in many respects that it's investigative reporting like this and stories like this that could be the real catalyst for change for migrant workers and for modern slaves around the globe. So that wouldn't have happened. There's no way that a foreign editor in The Guardian could have put six months into that story. So that's, that's the reality of where we're at. So just in terms of practicalities, because I think we've got to be practical here, we, we, we were in Turin talking about you know, funding and journalism. What I really realised was that the, 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 it was like a kind of unhappy courtship, an unhappy love affair. Nobody really knew quite what to say and how to do it. And I just think... There needs to be sort of clear, clear, clearer um, rules in terms, not rules, but just, you know, clarity that actually funders are looking for good ideas. They're looking for good stories. Journalists, you have to be more than just journalists now. You have to actually say, okay, I'm going to pitch this. I'm going to sell this. I'm going to sell it internally in my media organization and say this is important. Uh, and if, or if I'm a freelancer, I'm going to go to people like the European uh, Fund for Journalism and say this is important. So you have to go from being the journalist who said, oh, I don't get involved in all this commercial stuff to being sales people if you really want it to do those stories that matter. And the last thing I would say to the funders is, find, you have to become journalists almost, you find the people who care. If you want to do something, you look at the media organisations and say, who is the person who's been writing about this for 10 years, because they will care. And then you sit down with them and say, okay, how do we do this? And when you've worked out your plan, then you go back to the media organisation and say, this is what I would like to do. So there's my two top tips, and um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. And Ludovic? Will you take the honor of being the last? <laughs> okay. So um, find the people who care. I think that's really important because those stories should absolutely happen. And we sh the news ecosystem, the media are today struggling a lot. Um, the economics are complicated. Uh, finding new ways to diversify the revenue stream, those are uh, really big issues. We are not funding through the DNA Innovation Fund content. What we are funding is projects. When I talk about projects, what I'm talking about? Uh, I spent more than 15 years in newsroom. I was a journalist, I was editor-in-chief, but also CDO. So I would say I was on both the content side and uh, the most product slash business side. Um, what is very difficult to figure out is how to come with solution or at least with idea to follow the new way people are consuming the news, to engage with the readers, to find new recipes in order to diversify the revenue. And we know that there are no single recipes anymore. So what was lacking really, I mean, I, I felt that deeply and the more I'm talking with people within the ecosystem is time. Time to kind of step back from the daily operations, work with others, not just between journalists, but also with engineers, with design thinkers, with uh, product person, with people to build the visions together. What we are offering through the fund is a kind of space to step back, build a vision, take risk, and test ideas. So we are funding specific projects. We are not exactly funding companies, we are funding companies through a project. And what we are doing actually is not just funding, it's stimulation. And this is not a single separated initiative. DNI is a broader initiative than just a fund. The digital news initiative is built upon three pillars. First one is product, how through technology with Google Engineer, we can try to come with product that would help uh, to solve problems and tackle big challenges. For example, accelerating mobile pages that would help to display uh, much more um, quickly the, um, the content on mobile. Second pillar is re about research and training. Um, it's training provided in newsroom by the news lab and the research component is a partnership with the Reuters Institute to make a report about what's going on in the uh, news ecosystem in Europe. And the third pillar is called innovation. And the answer today is through a fund because we know that money also help 
to stimulate, to think about projects. But what we value more, and that's why I say it's about stimulation and innovation, it's not about modernization, and we revalue the application process it itself. And that goes to the idea of take time and think with others, collaborate with others. So the application process in itself is really valuable. Um, funded or not, you have a project that you are proud of. You have the opportunity to challenge yourself, to think from a user perspective, to try to figure out um, what kind of answer you can provide to something that for you makes sense, but that has also to be seen in other shows, which are today uh, the reader's shows. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm very pleased that these four wonderful people have made it to this panel. And as you've already heard a little bit in the introductions, there are many hats and roles that are sitting here. So there's actually former editor-in-chief of a, of a newspaper, as well as editor-in-chief of a, not a startup, but a digital native platform on media, media platform. And then there's a former investigative journalist who's now heading an independent uh, journalism program. There's Maggie, who has worked at The Guardian for 25 years. In, and also worked a lot with philanthropy and is also working now in activism. And then there's Ludovic at the end, uh, former editor-in-chief, former intern, and now head of this Google Digital News Initiative. So there are many questions, and I'm sure um, you can imagine that there are many questions that I would like to ask, and I have a lot of them written down. But what's actually much more interesting is what are your questions? Because what I very strongly believe is that um, since journalism and media is... Uh, an essential uh, part of a healthy democratic society and they're struggling financially as much as they are from the digital disruption from all sorts of things um, we should probably convince more foundations to invest in media and journalism uh, and for that we need great examples of how it works because what I've noticed is that funders like knowing exactly what they'll get and therefore it's sometimes hard to fund media because you, you don't know what the impact will be. You don't know even sometimes what the impact is that's being aimed for. And for this, we need to have a conversation with each other. We need to better understand each other. Um, so if there are any questions in this room right now, I'd love to take them. I'm sure you came here for a reason and you're not outside in the sun, but you're here. So tell me, what would you like to know? Can, does somebody have a mic? <laughs> Mike is coming. All right. I think there was somebody over there. Yes? And could you introduce yourself? Okay. My name is Idris de Brenne and I'm working for Journalism Fund. EU. Uh, oh, stand up. My God. <laughs> and the question is what do you prefer to fund? Media or journalism? And what is the most difficult one? And is it for someone in particular or is it for everyone? Open Society Foundations. Okay. Um, I think our, our, our focus is on journalism more than media because journalism today not necessarily is a media outlet. Journalism can be a fund like Journalism Fund. It could be an, a, a network. It could be an initiative. It could be a project. It could be... A, it, it has many shapes and forms. It could be a program which has to do with learning by doing and training in a network, which is we've seen a lot today, and it's working especially in investigative journalism very well. So that we prefer to fund uh, journalism. Uh, now, the aspect of the media sometimes is important because it, it helps, even if it's a tiny little media, even if it doesn't have an office, even if it's just a media in the, in the virtual space, it, it it, it needs to develop other tools apart from the pure capacity to produce journalism. And because, especially in many other countries, in many countries where things are so difficult, if you don't have some degree of independence and some degree of knowledge of the digital atmosphere where you're moving, you're not going to get very far. So we see amazing journalism we would love to fund, and we actually do fund. And then we see it has, it's going to die because the, the journalists refuse to have anything to do with 
rolling their sleeves and getting together with the techie guys or getting together with the business guys and at least give it a thing, give it a thought. So the best journalism in many countries, it's completely divorced from anything that could actually last in any shape or form, whether it's called media outlet or whatever it is. Thank you. Anybody want to respond to that within the panel? I'm just trying to do a new thing where there's not just static. Yes, yeah. Rolf? Okay, no, no, yeah. No, no, please. No, yeah. No, no, I saw a question. Oh, you saw a question. Yeah, yeah. All right, yes. Uh, but, uh, yeah. and, and I'm sure there are, yes? No, j just one thing. Um, the, the way we are looking at innovation should be broad and open. So I think it's very hard to say, are we funding media, journalism, journalists themselves? I would say we should try to stimulate everyone because the new ideas, the new recipes, the new experiences will come w with, the, with this, uh, I would say, new way of thinking and trying to challenge each other. Uh, what is important is also to be able to share the learning at some point and to make sure it can be inspiring for others. The, the learning of the journalists or the learning of the funders? The, the learning of the projects of the project. we are funding. Okay, because at the end of the day, I think you can be a media, you can be a journalist, you are facing same similar kind of issues. So if we can learn from each other and be kind of open source in our project, uh, and I don't say this way that the project that are going through the, the iPhone should be open source, but it's a way to, see, to say open-minded and share what has worked, what has not, and try to learn from each other. I think it's very important. And for somebody who has worked in funding projects for the last two years, what's your best lesson to share? Uh, what's a do and a don't? doesn't have to be the best one. Maybe that's a lot of pressure, but what's a do and a don't? Uh, about sharing, you mean? No, about funding. And also, especially, m yeah. maybe because we're not, we don't have funders in the that many funders in the room, I wish it was for the funders, we should have this conversation with funders, yeah. but we're having it mostly with journalists, so I'm sure there's a lot of people here who, who apply for grants sometimes, and you see all these applications coming in, you once told me that you read pretty much all of them, right, yeah, yourself, absolutely. so what's a do and a don't that you, could, that you could give to the people in the room? Okay, so first, in our case, it's not about content. So don't put just the content, but uh, create project that would help to finance, sustain journalism, but that cannot be just the content. Then focus on specific idea, go in depth. An idea is not enough. Provide KPIs, explain why it has opportunities, why it's innovative, and Innovation is very complicated. How would you describe innovation? So we've decided not to define innovation and to look at it as a process. So explain the process. Uh, explain what is your starting point, what is innovative for you, but also what does it have in, an impact on the news ecosystem or for others? So that's kind Thank of you. tips I can share. Thank you. Uh, and just w one suggestion I would have is I think it's important now for journalists to make alliances so when when you go to a funder if you have an idea many people are working now more as freelance you know you go to channel four you go to the guardian you go and try and create a package that says this is a multimedia operation there 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 are alliances that can be brought in or the correspondent people got in touch with you know the guardian people and said Lee, let's pull this together let's make sure that when we have something like wikileaks that there's a massive you know attempt to to broaden it beyond this idea of one media organization so think alliances i would say and, th and think different media Thank you. Rob, what's your biggest headache? When, when, I know you, you're probably not the person that does apply for the funds them, yourself. Maybe you have someone for that. Yeah. But do you, can you sort of, from the correspondence point of view, say what's your biggest headache when it comes to applying for funding? How can people in the room that are applying maybe deal with that and what could funders do better? Um, maybe the biggest headache is that if you tr truly try something new, then it's very hard to prove what you think you can get out of it. So um, we, we, had a, we had a lot of ideas that 
uh, that if, when you apply for a grant for something, then um, immediately you're asked for like, what's the business case? And what are the KPIs and stuff like that? And for a lot of proven things or things that you've seen elsewhere, you can provide those kinds of criteria. Uh, you can say, you can point to other examples, like this has been tried in that country and it worked or it didn't work and we learned this and that. But if you, if you, Exper like experiment on a level that, that you want to try something that has never done before or you haven't seen any examples uh, elsewhere and you still have to go through this process of trying to provide like uh, assurance that this is going to work because the funder needs some proof of concept uh, or they need to uh, explain to their board or uh, somebody else that this is worth funding because uh, of the results they will expect. Uh, then, it's, then, then those really new stuff gets smothered because uh, um, you can you can't prove something that that doesn't exist yet. So I would, I would I, um, uh, our biggest headache for for and it's not I mean it's not a, a, um, it's not a daily thing or something. But um, sometimes uh, we would wish that um, some funders would act more like or think more like venture capitalists in the sense that. Um, they will fund it no matter what. Like, let's try this. If it's successful, great. If it's not, um, then we know, uh, we learn something. Uh, but trying to like extract all these kinds of uh, uh, expected results beforehand um, uh, pushes you into some kind of conservatism um, to go with, with ideas or to stick with ideas that already uh, uh, shown these kinds of results they expect. So sometimes having less information and, and expecting less information and just like uh, go like trust more on uh, the ability or the talent or the imagination of the people uh, asking for the grant uh, would, would definitely help. But we see this especially in like foundations that are um, government uh, driven. So, for example, we have we have done this with a, a few uh, European Union grants, and the like the questionnaires that you had to fill in was already like a day job for two people, um, which d didn't help, hmm. and it didn't get get off the ground uh, either. So, so dare to take more risks and dare to experiment a little bit more from the foundation side. Maria Teresa, yeah. you said that you, you do that at OSF, right? You do fund experiments and you do take risks. Can you yeah. say a little bit about how that works and, how, and why and how you do that? Well, we, we, do, we do it because we, 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 are, we are very privileged to sit in a place where we see what's happening in the whole world because we fund things except the U.S. all over the world. And so we can, we can see where there's a space where that thing doesn't exist. So let me give you an example. A bunch of journalists, very traditional, if you could say, with a very long not, not, uh, known experience, came together and said, we want to do a lab in Mexico. We want to do a lab that includes others and, and that, it's going to, that it's going to create a content with designers and with uh, cartoonists and what we call uh, in Latin America the creatives, no? With creative people, we, we are going to hire. We, we want to do something completely different that would really shake journalism in Mexico. And because of the caliber of the people who were proposing that idea, we, we jumped with them. I don't know if it's going to work. It's been born not long ago. But it was worth it. It was worth because in the learning, it, we have learned a lot along with them, and we can share those learnings with people in other places of the world. So another thing we're doing is putting different kinds of grantees. Some of them come with a very strong engineering kind of uh, savviness. I remember there is a project in Zimbabwe of a group that's amazing what they're doing through chat. But their journalism is not that strong. So it's really nice to put them together in this, I mean, to, to try and create this area where they can sit together, the ones with the great sort of ideas for distribution and engagement, and those which have really good ideas for journalism, 
but so that they can learn from each other and, and, and one could think about the other. So that's how we experiment a lot. Mm -hmm. And we try to, 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 to believe in the people we fund. Recently, somebody asked me, oh, well, ask us, but do you, they were asking for a project in investigative journalism, but, and, and they said, well, okay, we will fund you after many back and forth. And then he said, but why did you don't care to know what we are going to investigate? And we said, no, we don't want to skew your editorial agenda. We want to let you are the journalist. You are the one who's interpreting the world. We don't want to tell you the real important story in your country is gender uh, issues, because it might not be, and we can be completely wrong. So we let the, the, uh, the journalists take the lead on that. Thank you. Last one, and then I'll go back to the, to the room. Ludovic, because funding experiments is kind of at the core of the DNI. Right? How do you assess the results of what you fund? I know you've only been there for two, two years? Two years. But how do One you assess... One year of operation, so... Th th so very short. So yeah. do you have... Do you, have you thought about how to assess the results of what you fund? Yeah, Can you say a little bit about that? that that's a big question. Uh, today we have funded 250 projects in 27 con European countries and only 15 to 20 are completed. So it's very hard to, to measure um, the outcome. But we've, we're talking about the processes and uh, also about taking risk and not just focusing on KPIs. One of the answers is a specific track we are having called prototypes. And basically, those are cutting edge ideas with assumptions to be tested. Those ones, for some of them, are finished. And we can start learning from them um, and measure the impact at least in terms of new weights opening. So I give you one example, uh, very, very briefly. Um, uh, Italian startup called Sefriel is trying to use the blockchain. You know what is the blockchain? Yes. So it's the backbone technology of the Bitcoin. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer technology. They are trying to use this technology in order to certify uh, the footage of video and uh, to make sure you have the right, I would say, stamps, the when, the what, and the where. So these kind of things, even if it's purely a research and um, uh, open source technology that can be shared, not implemented in newsroom yet, then you can see the, really what it can bring. And another thing is that we are following the milestones. So the progress done and how people are going through their project. And you see that innovation is something that is very alive, is changing all along the way. And we try to have those conversations and to be flexible uh, in the way we are following the project that is always the project of the applicant. We don't or the IP or so on. Thank you. Questions from the room, I think. I think there was somebody in the back who had a question before. He went away. He went away. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, I took too long. All right. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, I'm just curious about how much funding goes towards business innovation and because there's no shortage of good journalists in the world, there's no shortage of content, but one of the struggles, the reason a lot of people are struggling in journalism is there isn't any money for journalism anymore. So, and I worry that just funding projects continues to paper over the fact that there isn't a systemic look at business models that are actually going to survive around the world to fund journalism on an ongoing basis. So how much money is going to business models? Well, yeah, or when foundations are thinking about helping journalism, are they really helping by just funding a project here or a project there, when what's actually happening is that the fund fundamental business model for journalism is screwed? Who would like to take that question? Well, I would like to say one thing about it, because w w you make a good point. Uh, um, I'm not a funder, so I, uh, we sometimes receive funds. But my general rule is always that uh, whatever it is that we're applying a fund, uh, grant uh, for, we should be able to keep doing it if the fund stops. So it might help us speed up, for example, or uh, might help us develop some preliminary things that we need in order to do something. But if we can't afford to keep doing it af after the funding is over, uh, then we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. 
Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> I just think that there is no way, I mean, that there has to be another solution. So there, obviously organisations like The Guardian are looking at o other issues uh, and one of the things they're looking at is membership. You know, they're looking, in, in a way you have to say, if people value this, then it needs to be paid for. And, and that is at the moment the strongest tactic that The Guardian is applying. Will it work three years down the line? Will five million people sign up to pay every week? That is our hope and that is our value. But the belief is, I, I personally believe that people will sign up only if there's a USP, only if the, the Guardian is offering something different than the traditional news agenda, which at the moment news is there, it's available, bog standard reporting is from so many outlets. So the thing that is unique about journalism now, we have to actually be looking to do things that are different than providing information. We have to dig deeper and create stronger stories and stronger issues. And in order to do that, that's where the, I think the philanthropy comes in, that these stories are important and that they will be followed in the interim. But long term, unless people value it and pay for it, then it's over. That's for me. If you want to. Yeah, why not? So, the, the, I mean, the way for sustainability is the point to reach, of course, but we all know that today it's very complicated. Uh, I really believe in what you've said, which is the USP, uh, having a clear proposal, a clear readership, and I don't think there are recipes you can copy-paste anymore, but we see a lot of interesting things going on when you meet a specific audience, you have the cause that goes with that, the value proposal in terms of content offer, and uh, then you can find people that are willing to pay. Or other models that are uh, today interesting, that are going through diversification and so on, but of course it's a long way, and that's why we are not just funding, but we are trying to come also with ideas, uh, solutions through products, and that start by conversation with publishers. One of, the, one of the things that I think we need to do much more, and today with the Google and the Facebook and all of these big platforms that are uh, uh, doing a lot of the advertising and capturing a lot of the money in the, in the, in the available in the information business, let's say, it's very important for very strategic uh, outlets in many countries, which I can say that some are like the, the outlet that it's actually producing the key information, that they also have some support to really understand how to make the most of the advertising, for example, for the Google Ads. There is something that they really don't know, and it's very difficult for a funder to connect those dots. And we try to do it as best as we can, but I do think that there has to be much more collabor collaboration between funders and platforms in that sense, because we need to help those outlets. Some of them have, because of as a particular expertise of one guy, we see them doing magic, really getting quite a bit of money from, let's say, Google Ads. And, and yet somebody else in a different market that we see them uh, getting a much larger audience, they make nothing because they don't know the technology. They don't know how to get into that. So that's one source of income that I think we would love to, to see these very strategic outlets increase. And the other, I think, is what you say, is to, to see the combination of, of fights when you see really small outlet in Guatemala that is actually covering all its costs, you want to learn from them and say, what is it that you do? This is a tiny market. This is a young kid who's probably 28. He's set up a new business, and he's already almost, almost very close to covering their costs because they're doing, uh, getting uh, members, subscribers. They do festivals. They do. They 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 have. They're selling a, a specific kind of video advertising that's very like native advertising, but very much targeted to values, not to selling a product. So they're actually doing a very interesting original thing. So 
When you see this combination, you get inspired from what people... Now, there are parts in the world where it's impossible. The government forbids you to do crowdsourcing. You cannot take advertising from anybody because you're too critical of the government and the, nobody wants to advertise with you because you're toxic. Uh, you cannot get money from funders because that's forbidden. So <laughs> those are the realities of many places. Thank you. Any questions from the room? If there are none, could some of you maybe tell us what funders could do better? Or oh, there is one. All right. I think the magical moment is that this festival happens when we talk about how journalism can innovate and go forward and uh, uh, experiment. So this is a question for Maggie and for Rob. Could you share a journalistic project that has been funded, that has been risky and has been bold and has been impactful? Because that's stimulating for thinking, both for journalists and for funders. Are you a journalist yourself also? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Danish journalist. Well, I suppose I'm biased because I'm about to be the Guardian <laughs> after 25 years to work on a project that I think um, uh, has made a huge difference, and that's the project on, on female genital mutilation. And uh, what happened there was we, we, we decided at The Guardian when we were talking about um, the email hacking and privacy and uh, emails that there was a discussion one day in conference, well, hacking off the genitalia of female children one every 15 seconds in somewhere in this world surely that needs to be one of the sort of top priorities of what we do and so we, we ran a campaign there to get the, the, the Minister of Education to write to all schools in Britain um, and that sort of took off and then a funder a really strange thing happened this man turned up in our office and said uh, he said, I, I, I'm from Ireland and I just would like to talk to you about uh, what you're doing. And we were so busy, we didn't really have a chance to check out who he was. So he came into the office and we said, well, we're doing this and we think that we could take this to Africa. And what we need to do is we need to train journalists in, in boot camps with activists and teach them how to use new technology teach them how to use WhatsApp, create communities where isolated activists and journalists can actually feel that they're part of a community. And we're going to call them campaign boot camps, uh, journalism boot camps. And so at the end of it, he basically came up with about three million for four years to just go into Africa, get the journalists together with the activists, create the WhatsApp groups, teach them how to use smartphones, get smartphones to the journalists that needed it, and set up a whole kind of movement of grassroots journalism. Um, so, and then what happened, Just it, it became a little bit uncomfortable in The Guardian because in a sense it became an activism journalism model. And then within, within The Guardian we're saying, is this core business? Is this core journalism? And I'm thinking... What is core business? What is core journalism anymore? This could be it, because this is the kind of thing that members want. They want something different than regular reporting. So that discussion went on for some time, and now I'm leaving The Guardian to do it. So, you know, there's, a, there's an example of, of where you can meld activism, journalism, with an inspired funder who just came to us. He just said, I see what you're doing, I'm going to support it, and took a complete punt. And he's still saying, where's the m &E? how do I know this is working, what are the metrics, and we're struggling with all that, but essentially he's doing what brave funders do, and they just sort of go with it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I was thinking of, I mean, there are many good examples, but the, the one that um, stands out for me is that we have a um, correspondent, Forgotten Wars, at the correspondent, and this is a, a, a young guy, he's, I think he's 20, five or something and he has together with his phot photographer um, uh, um, his his soul um, he, he when he when we first met him he pitched his his journalism as I want to um, 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 write about the people um, uh, that that die in vain because never nobody even heard that they were in a war um, and there, because there are, there are a lot of wars in the news that, um, uh, that you see every day, like Syria or, but there are many more going on, I think, dozens of, of small or a little bit larger conflicts, civil wars uh, between countries um, that you never hear about. 
and the, the and the, but this is a kind of journalism that is almost unsustainable, for, especially for like a small startup like our uh, like ours, uh, because of the costs involved, the travels, the risks, etc. Et uh, I mean, even trying to get insurance is even uh, almost impossible. But we there were funders who um, uh, helped him uh, make a few stories first, and now he he was able to. Uh, uh, sell these stories to so many different outlets all over the world uh, that it's susta an actual sustainable job now. Um, so, um, and that, that couldn't have never have happened if if some funders didn't just say, uh, we don't know what's coming out of this. We, we don't even know if you're coming back. <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, they did it anyway, and, and now he has a, a full-time job doing it. So, um, uh, yeah, that would be a great example, I think. Thank you. So, Maria Teresa, I know that at Open Society Foundation, not, not only at your program, uh, people think a lot about power dynamics and about agenda setting and the dangers of if you, as a funder, uh, burst into an NGO or a news outlet, or not burst in, but if you, if you, if you ha are in contact with a newsroom or journalist and you say, I find this topic really important, and then they report on it, or if it just happens naturally because you've set out a call for applications on, for example, healthcare, and then projects start coming in, um, then essentially, as a foundation, you're very involved in agenda setting and therefore have quite heavily a say in what's being reported on and what's, what's going on. Um, so I know you think about that a lot at OSF, and I'm sure um, that you also think about that at your journalism program. And could you perhaps say a little bit more about how to, as a funder, but also as a grantee, navigate that road of the power dynamics between journalists on the one hand and media outlets on the one hand and funders on the other hand? Is there a limit? Is there a line? How do you, how think, do you navigate this? Yeah, it's a very difficult question, but I think that, that, uh, I think that journalists, sh whatever they're doing, whatever project they're doing, they should first of all believe in themselves and, and, and not let and even if they have trouble with the money, <laughs> don't let a funder come and tell you what to do. That's my very deep belief. Uh, I do think there is, that's easy to say and it's difficult to put in practice when people are desperate for, for funds to, 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 to pay the, the rent and to pay for their, their team. They, they, they end up uh, completely off mission because the money is somewhere else. So it's very, that's like the extreme. But yeah, OSF has, is a very big thing. So one, a lot of programs in OSF fund journalism because they want to reduce crime or because they want to, to, uh, to uh, 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 promote, uh, I don't know, the safe use of, of uh, uh, how do you say that, in injections? No. Uh, for, uh, to protect needles. people, uh, needles, yeah, for, 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 yeah. for AIDS or, or the protection of women or... They, and, and that's, you know, that's fair. If it's, if it's open, openly, this is what I fund. I fund issues that have to do with women, and it's broad enough, then I think that's okay. And if you are sitting with a grantee, you have to be very careful not to, not to, not to be too expressive about what you like or you don't like, because immediately you, you leave a footprint, especially in places where this is very difficult. Now, um, as journalists, what, what we find is we, we, don't, we don't influence in the, in the editorial. We are, on the contrary, we do our best so that we, we don't even know, especially in investigative journalism, we don't want to know. We, we funded the, the, the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, for many, many years to build their platforms and all of that. And, and not only us, there's many other funders. And, and, and we, 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 of course, there was something cooking there and we knew, but we didn't want to know what was it. And we didn't want them to tell us because I think it is part of their independence to, to really know that they can be free and that there's not going to be a, a backlash because, oh, they're finding that, that could ha have uh, this or that effect, because then you enter into politics. So I think that that's very, it's a very difficult relationship. There is always a power dynamic. You cannot kid yourself and say, oh, no, no, there isn't. We're really good friends. We're the same. 
it's a very difficult thing. And, and it hit me because I always have my journalist hat. <laughs> it's very difficult to get rid of it. And so that's difficult. Yeah. Thank you. Question in the front? Okay, so I got the microphone first, so, but oh. I want to add a little, can I add well, a you already asked yeah, one, okay. but you can, but okay. Because yeah. if foundations have the problem to give money to, to journalists and uh, without uh, interference, maybe you can, we are there as journalism fund uh, to be a kind of a firewall between those who give the money. That's the reason why we exist. We get money from Open Society Foundation and Atesium Foundation so that the journalists can take the money without any string uh, of, the, of, the, of the foundation. That's why we exist, that's the reason why we exist. So there are ways, there are ways, I think there are others too, not only journalism front of the EU, but others who try to build that wall between those, between the journalists and the foundations. Thank you, Edith. I think I th there was a question here at the front. Rupert had a question, I know. It's just a question for Google, actually, because um, the predication that the rest of the panel has is that effectively the, the whole context of this is funding worthy and important journalism that furthers some kind of societal advance that, as Nika said, is sort of underpinning the democratic function. Um, Google is not interested in content with this DNI fund. It's interested in news innovation. Does that mean that you're effectively blind in the applications process to innovative applications uh, for ways of developing news that's geared towards easily monetizable, what someone called McDonald's or fast food news, and actually might not solve it, serve any great societal function at all? Or do you take steps to say, actually, we're going to fund tools that we think have a, that sort of democratic benefit? Thank you. Okay, so we are not funding content in the sense that we are not funding stories or we are not just for funding just an investigation effort or just reporting. But when you are funding a project, it doesn't mean it doesn't go with content. I give you an example. Um, we funded Euronews for a huge VR project, which is all about having scalability and being able to put VR production into their workflow. Part of it is content production, and part of the project is journalism. But the project is in, in itself is not just the pieces they are producing, and that's their editorial decision. We don't want to dig in that. But we want to give them uh, the opportunity to try to write or to find new way to storytell uh, things through VR, but the editorial decision are their decision, but some of uh, the eligible expenses can be for journalists. Um, so we are not funding purely content. It doesn't mean that the project doesn't in have an impact on the production of quality journalism. Thank you. Any other questions from the room? He probably, yes. I will follow up on what Edith De Bruyne said about having an intermediary. Uh, I'm with the Ger European Journalism Center in Maastricht. What, what Edith De Bruyne just said, having an intermediary between the donor and the journalist sometimes makes a lot of sense because uh, we can translate in both directions. And also what, what the law of unintended consequences is, is what we learned is the journalists are very much alone and singularized. I'm this little guy doing one little story in Italy with my little outlet or a big outlet at La Stampa, but I know nobody else nowhere else. So what we saw in, in, the, in, the, in, uh, in the journalism grants we're giving away is that people are starting to team up amongst themselves. So we bring them all the grantees into one room for two days to a boot camp and then they know they meet a German reporter who has a German outlet and then the next round we see these two guys teaming up with a Spanish outlet so we, we, we grow a, a coherence amongst the journalists because traditionally journalists have been very much individualized and it is a power play from, from 
the powers that be. Let them have this single little story idea and then they disappear again. And what, what we see as a law of unintended consequences is actually this teamwork amongst grantees that never met before. And this gives a very strong cohesion and it also gives them hope that they're doing something that is not just particular to that one little story. Just a comment. Thank you. Um, firewalls are also an option when foundations want to fund uh, content, I think, specifically in this case. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. Maggie, I know when we spoke before, because we're, we're rounding up, and I, I'm sure everybody would love to go outside and enjoy some of that sunshine, uh, but you had a couple of do's and don'ts. Could I nag you to sort of throw them out there just before we go? Well, I, I think... I th Hello? I think... Um, I think, in a way, um, the most important one is the one that's been said for journalists, is that it has to be, uh, it's too long a road and it's too painful a road unless you really care. So uh, if you're going to go for funding and look for that, it has to be something that you're totally driven by. Um, and very practically for the funders, in a way, I think it's coming around that the funders are looking around and saying, who are the people finding the right people within the organizations because I think organizations are too big. I think that media organizations are trying to find alternative ways of funding and I think sometimes now the core content is getting bogged down in processes where people are brought in to in a sense, monetize this relationship between the philanthropists and, and the journalism. So let's keep it clean. Let's keep the passion there and I think the long term the long-term advantage of that is that, in the end, great journalism will triumph and people will pay for it and will find a sustainable model. So I would just say keep it pure, both for funders and for journalists. Thank you. Uh, Ludovic, I know you already said that people should you know, read the criteria before they apply to you because you don't just fund journalism, but there, is there anything else that you would like people to leave with if they're thinking about applying to the DNI? Okay, so... Application window is open until April 20. So you go on the website, you look at the FAQ, we answer a lot of questions. You look at the projects we have funded, uh, a lot of them are listed on the website. Then you try to see what, um, to see with which track, the prototype, the medium and the large track fit the most with your project. You print the application form and you start working step by step through the questions. You can do that online, of course, but don't try to immediately answer all questions. Then take time to go to, to turn around your idea and not just to come with something hmm, that's super idea, that's super innovative. It's not enough. And innovation it doesn't always go with technology. So innovation can be many things. Explain why it's innovative, why does it have an impact? Thank you. I think if, if journalism does die before 2030, you could try education. That, that was a really good set of explanations, I think. Thank you so much for that. Maria, today, is there any takeaways from you? No, I think that I, I agree with what they've said. I think if you have a real passion, and as Maggie says, the people who care... <laughs> Uh, I think that donors are a lot, what I've seen, maybe I'm wrong, I'm very new in this field, is that they really, they, they're looking for that. They're looking for people with passion, with real passion, who really want to, to, to make a difference and to inform uh, somebody or a group of citizens that really need that information, that they feel that's very strong. So I think it's difficult to find really good projects and there's a lot of possibilities there. As a funder, I second that. There's nothing that funders like to see more than people that are truly passionate about what they do. We'd rather not fund institutions and organizations. We'd rather fund people that are passionate, and especially within journalism and media. Rup, I guess... Just one thing very quickly, because we are talking here a lot about project. Yes. Project is super important, but the execution is really important as well. So think about the execution too. Thank you. Last one for you. Anything you'd like to give to the room before we all walk into the sunshine? Well, um, the, the most important things were already said because, if you, I mean, caring about what you do is the, the start. Maybe I, I, could, I could add that um, uh, um, it doesn't have to threaten your independence 
if you work together closely with um, somebody who's paying for something that you want to do, uh, um, if you share uh, the things you care about. So if you sh share the values, you can be a very, you can have a very close relationship with a foundation or a funder or uh, the, the other way around with a journalist, if you're a funder, uh, and still be independent from each other. Uh, um, so don't like don't make the mistake of uh, uh, um, mis to, to mistake independence for distance. That you have to be like far from each other to be independent from each other. You can be very close to each other and still be independent. And how should you do that? How do you stay independent? Well, um, uh, by I mean, you can you can be close to to, to each other uh, because you share the same values and the same same goals, and um, still have very um, clear uh, um, uh, criteria of who gets to say what, uh, 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 what is your power over the other, uh, what are the results you're 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 aiming for, what are the results you expect, stuff like that. So you can be very uh, business like in 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 the in the, um, in the um, results you uh, expect from each other and still be very close to each other in the values that uh, got you in, the f in 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 touch in the first place so make sure you agree on the rules of engagement and then don't feel too worried about the rest of it exactly okay. yes thank yes you. yeah so thank you so much for everybody for being here with us on this very late slot on a saturday come find me if you have any questions I already gave all, out all my cards. Yeah, I ran out of cards. So just in case you yes. think of so something much. interesting. Yeah. I'll give you. I'll give you mine. I'm still the same number. Can I just say thank you so much? For this well really done. You did really good. Yeah. You did really well. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I was tired. I noticed it. No, no, you did really well. well. Oh, okay, fine. Well, I felt tired, but I was very happy that you were here. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Great. No, no, no. <laughs>